Section 1 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mammal, Tyler, Texas. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Mermaid Far out to sea, the water is as blue as the bluest cornflower, and as clear as the clearest crystal, but it is very deep, too deep for any cable to fathom, and if many steeples were piled on top of one another, they would not reach from the bed of the sea to the surface of the water. It is down there that the mermen live. Now don't imagine that there are only bare white sands at the bottom. Oh no, the most wonderful trees and plants grow there with such flexible stalks and leaves that at the slightest motion of the water they move just as if they were alive. All the fish, big and little, glide among the branches just as, up here, birds glide through the air. The palace of the Merman King lies at the very deepest part. Its walls are of coral, and the long pointed windows of the clearest amber, but the roof is made of mussel shells, which open and shut with the lapping of the water. This has a lovely effect, for there are gleaming pearls in every shell, any one of which would be the pride of a queen's crown. The Merman King had been for many years a widower, but his old mother kept house for him. She was a clever woman but so proud of her noble birth that she wore twelve oysters on her tail while the other grandees were only allowed six. Otherwise, she was worthy of all praise, especially because she was so fond of the little mermaid princesses, her grandchildren. They were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of all. Her skin was as soft and delicate as a rose leaf. Her eyes as blue as the deepest sea, but like all the others, she had no feet, and instead of legs, she had a fish's tail. All the live long day, they used to play in the palace, in the great halls where living flowers grew out of the walls. When the great amber windows were thrown open, the fish swam in, just as swallows fly into our room when we open the windows, but the fish swam right up to the little princesses ate out of their hands and allowed themselves to be patted. Outside the palace was a large garden with fiery red and deep blue trees, the fruit of which shone like gold, while the flowers glowed like fire on their ceaselessly waving stalks. The ground was of the finest sand, but it was a blue phosphorescent tint. Everything was bathed in a wondrous light down there. You might more readily have supposed yourself to be high up in the air with only the sky above and below you than that you were at the bottom of the ocean. In a dead calm, you could just catch a glimpse of the sun like a purple flower with a stream of light radiating from its calyx. Each little princess had her own little plot of garden where she could dig and plant just as she liked. One made her flower bed in the shape of a whale Another thought it nice to have hers like a little mermaid, but the youngest made hers quite round like the sun, and she would only have flowers of a rosy hue in its beams. She was a curious child, quiet and thoughtful, while the other sisters decked out their gardens with all kinds of extraordinary objects which they got from wrecks. She would have had nothing beside the rosy flowers like the sun up above except the statue of a beautiful boy. It was hewn out of the purest white marble and had gone to the bottom from some wreck. By the statue she planted a rosy, red, weeping willow, which grew splendidly, and the fresh, delicate branches hung round and over it till they almost touched the blue sand where the shadows showed violet, and were ever moving like the branches. It looked as if the leaves and the roots were playfully interchanging kisses. Nothing gave her greater pleasure than to hear about the world of human beings up above. She made her old grandmother tell her all that she knew about ships and towns, people and animals, 
but above all it seemed strangely beautiful to her that up on the earth the flowers were scented for they were not so at the bottom of the sea also that the woods were green and that the fish which were to be seen among the branches could sing so loudly and sweetly that it was a delight to listen to them you see the grandmother called little birds fish or the mermaids would not have understood her as they had never seen a bird when you are fifteen said the grandmother you will be allowed to rise up from the sea and sit on the rocks in the moonlight and look at the big ships sailing by and you will also see woods and towns one of the sisters would be fifteen in the following year but the others well they were each one year younger than the other so that the youngest had five whole years to wait before she would be allowed to come up from the bottom to see what the things were like on earth but each one promised the others to give a full account of all they had seen and found most wonderful on the first day their grandmother could never tell them enough for there were so many things about which they wanted information none of them was so full of longings as the youngest the very one who had the longest time to wait and who was so quiet and dreamy many a night she stood by the w open windows and looked up through the dark blue water which the fish were lashing with their tails and fins she could see the moon and the stars it is true their light was pale but they looked much bigger through the water than they do to our eyes when she saw a dark shadow glide between her and them she knew that it was either a whale swimming above her or else a ship laden with human beings i am certain they never dreamt that a lovely little mermaid was standing below stretching up her white hands toward the keel the eldest princess had now reached her fifteenth birthday and was to venture above the water when she came back she had hundreds of things to tell them but the most delightful of all she said was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank in the calm sea and to gaze at the large town close to the shore where the lights twinkled like hundreds of stars to listen to music and the noise and bustle of carriages and people to see the many church towers and spires and to hear the bells ringing and just because she could not go on shore she longed for that most of all oh how eagerly the youngest sister listened and when later in the evening she stood at the open window and looked up through the dark blue water she thought of the big town with all its noise and bustle and fancied she could even hear the church bells ringing the year after the second sister was allowed to mount up through the water and swim about wherever she liked the sun was just going down when she reached the surface the most beautiful sight she thought that she had ever seen the whole sky had looked like gold she said and as for the clouds well their beauty was beyond description they floated in red and violet splendor over her head and far faster than they went a flock of wild swans flew like a long white veil over the water towards the setting sun she swam towards it but it sank and all the rosy lights on clouds and water faded away. The year after that, the third sister went up, and being much the most venturesome of them all, swam up a broad river which ran into the sea. She saw beautiful green vine-clad hills, palaces, and country seats peeping through splendid woods. She heard the birds singing, and the sun was so hot that she was often obliged to dive to cool her burning face. In a tiny bay, she found a troop of little children running about naked and paddling in the water. She wanted to play with them, but they were frightened and ran away. Then a little black animal came up. It was a dog, but she had never seen one before. It barked so furiously at her that she was frightened and made for the green sea. She could never forget the beautiful woods, the green hills, and the lovely children who could swim through the water although they had no fish's tails. The fourth sister was not so brave. 
she stayed in the remotest part of the ocean, and according to her account, that was the most beautiful spot. You could see for miles and miles around you, and the sky above was like a great glass dome. She had seen ships, but only far away, so that they looked like seagulls. There were grotesque dolphins turning somersaults and gigantic whales squirting water through their nostrils like hundreds of fountains on every side. Now the fifth sister's turn came. Her birthday fell in winter so that she saw sights that the others had not seen on their first trips. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each one of which looked like a pearl, she said, but was much bigger than the church towers built by men. They took the most wonderful shapes and sparkled like diamonds. She had seated herself on one of the largest, and all the passing ships sheared off in alarm when they saw her sitting there with her long hair streaming loose in the wind. In the evening, the sky became overclassed with dark clouds. It thundered and lightened, and the huge icebergs glittering in the bright lightning were lifted high into the air by the black waves. All the ships shortened sail, and there was fear and trembling on every side. But she sat quietly on her floating iceberg, watching the blue lightning flash in zigzags down onto the shining sea. The first time any of the sisters rose above water, she was delighted by the novelties and beauties she saw, but once grown up and at liberty to go where she liked, she became indifferent and longed for her home. In the course of a month or so, they all said that, after all, their own home in the deep was best. It was so cozy there. Many an evening, the five sisters, interlacing their arms, would rise above the water together. They had lovely voices, much clearer than any mortal, and when a storm was rising and they expected the ships to be wrecked, they would sing in the most seductive strains of the wonders of the deep, bidding the seafarers have no fear of them. But the sailors could not understand the words. They thought it was the voice of the storm. Nor could it be theirs to see this Elysium of the deep, for when the ship sank, they were drowned, and only reached the merman's palace in death. When the elder sisters rose up in this manner, arm in arm, in the evening, the youngest remained quite alone behind, looking after them as if she must weep. But mermaids have no tears, and so they must suffer all the more. Oh, if I were only fifteen, she said, I know how fond I would be of the world above and of the mortals who dwell there. At last her fifteenth birthday came. Now we shall have you off our hands, said her grandmother, the old queen dowager. Come now, let me adorn you like your other sisters. And she put a wreath of white lilies round her hair. But every petal of the flowers was half a pearl. Then the old queen had eight oysters fixed on the princess's tail to show her high rank. But it hurts so, said the little mermaid. You must endure the pain for the sake of finery, said her grandmother. But oh, how gladly she would she have shaken off all this splendor and laid aside the heavy wreath. Her red flowers in her garden suited her much better, but she did not dare to make any alteration. Goodbye, she said, and mounted as lightly and airily as a bubble through the water. The sun had just set when her head rose above the water, but the clouds were still lighted up with a rosy and golden splendor, and the evening star sparkled in the soft pink sky. The air was mild and fresh, and the sea as calm as a mill pond. A big three-masted ship lay close by, with only a single sail set, for there was not a breath of wind, and the sailors were sitting about the rigging on the cross trees and at the mastheads. There was music and singing on board, and as the evening closed in, hundreds of gaily colored lanterns were lighted. They looked like flags of all nations waving in the air. The little mermaid swam right up to the cabin windows, and every time she was lifted by the swell, she could see, through the transparent panes, crowds of gaily dressed people. The handsomest of them all was the young prince with large dark eyes. 
he could not be much more than 16, and all these festivities were in honor of his birthday. The sailors danced on deck, and when the prince appeared among them, hundreds of rockets were let off, making it as light as day, and frightening the little mermaid so much that she had to dive under the water. She soon ventured up again, and it was just as if all the stars of heaven were falling in showers around her. She had never seen such magic fires. Great suns whirled around, gorgeous firefish hung in the blue air, and all was reflected in the calm and glassy sea. It was so light on board the ship that every little rope could be seen, and the people still better. Oh, how handsome the prince was! How he laughed and smiled as he greeted his guests while the music rang out in the quiet night. It got quite late, but the little mermaid could not take her eyes off the ship and the beautiful prince. The colored lanterns were put out, no more rockets were sent up, and the cannon had ceased its thunder, but deep down in the sea there was a dull murmuring and moaning sound. Meanwhile she was rocked up and down on the waves so that she could look into the cabin, but the ship got more and more way on, sail after sail was filled by the wind. The waves grew stronger, great clouds gathered, and it lightened in the distance. Oh, there was going to be a fearful storm, and soon the sailors had to shorten sail. The great ship rocked and rolled as she dashed over the angry seas. The black waves rose like mountains, high enough to overwhelm her, but she dived like a swan through them and rose again and again on their towering crests. The little mermaid thought it a most amusing race, but not so the sailors. The ship creaked and groaned. The mighty timbers bulged and bent under the heavy blows, and water broke over the deck, snapping the main mast like a reed. She heeled over on her side, and the water rushed into the hold. Now the little mermaid saw that they were in danger, and she had, for her own sake, to beware of the floating beams and wreckage. One moment it was so pitch dark that she could not see at all but when the lightning flashed it became so light that she could see all on board every man was looking out for his own safety as best he could but she more particularly followed the young prince with her eyes and when the ship went down she saw him sink in the deep sea at first she was quite delighted for now she, he was coming to be with her but then she remembered that human beings could not live under water and that only if he were dead could he go to her father's palace no, he must not die. So she swam towards him, all among the drifting beams and planks, quite forgetting that they might crush her. She dived deep under the water, and came up again through the waves, and at last reached the young prince, just as he was becoming unable to swim any further in the stormy sea. His limbs were numb, his bright eyes were closing and he must have died if the little mermaid had not come to the rescue. She held his head above the water and let the waves drive them whithersoever they would. By daybreak, all the storm was over. Of the ship not a trace was to be seen. The sun rose from the water in radiant brilliance, and his rosy beams seemed to cast a glow of life into the prince's cheeks. But his eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his hair and lofty brow, and stroked back the dripping hair. It seemed to her that he was like the marble statue in her little garden. She kissed him again, and longed that he might live. At last she saw dry land before her, high blue mountains, on whose summits the white snow glistened as if a flock of swans had settled there. Down by the shore were beautiful green woods, and in the foreground a church or a temple, she did not quite know which. But it was a building of some sort. Lemon and orange trees grew in the garden, and lofty palms stood by the gate. At this point the sea formed a little bay where water was quite, quite calm, but very deep, right up to the cliffs. At their foot was a strip of fine white sand to which she, she swam, with the beautiful prince, and laid him down on it, taking great care that his head should rest high up in the warm sunshine. The bells now began to ring in the great white building, and a number of young maidens came into the garden. 
Then the little mermaid swam further off behind some high rocks and covered her hair and breast with foam so that no one should see her little face, and then she watched to see who would discover the poor prince. It was not long before one of the maidens came up to him. At first she seemed quite frightened, but only for a moment. Then she fetched several others, and the mermaid saw that the prince was coming to life and that he smiled at all those around him but he never smiled at her. You see, he did not know that she had saved him. She felt so sad that when he was led away into the great building, she dived sorrowfully into the water and made her way home to her father's palace. Always quiet and thoughtful, she became more so now than ever. Her sisters often asked her what she had seen on her first visit to the surface, but she never would tell them anything. Many an evening, and many a morning she would rise to the place where she had left the prince. She saw the fruit in the garden ripen and then gathered. She saw the snow melt on the mountain's tops, but she never saw the prince. So she always went home still sadder than before. At home, her only consolation was to sit in her little garden with her arms twined round the handsome marble statue which reminded her of the prince. It was all in gloomy shade now as she had ceased to tend her flowers, and the garden had become a neglected wilderness of long stalks and leaves entangled with the branches of the tree. At last she could not bear it any longer, she, so she told one of her sisters, and from her it soon spread to the others, but to no one else except to one or two other mermaids who only told their dearest friends. One of these knew all about the prince. She had also seen the festivities on the ship. She knew where he had come from, and where his kingdom was situated. Come, little sister, said the other princesses, and throwing their arms round each other's shoulders, they rose from the water in a long line just in front of the prince's palace. It was built of light yellow glistening stone with great marble staircases, one of which led into the garden. Magnificent gilded cupolas rose above the roof, and the spaces between the columns which encircled the buildings were filled with lifelike marble statues. Through the clear glass of the lofty windows you could see gorgeous halls adorned with costly silken hangings, and the pictures on the walls were a sight worth seeing. In the midst of the central hall a large fountain played, throwing its jets of spray upwards to a glass dome in the roof through which the sunbeams lighted up the water and the beautiful plants which grew in the great basin. She knew now where he lived, and often used to go there in the evenings and by night over the water. She swam much nearer the land than any of the others dared. She even ventured right up the narrow channel under the splendid marble terrace which threw a long shadow over the water. She used to sit here, looking at the young prince, who thought he was quite alone in the clear moonlight. She saw him many an evening sailing about in his beautiful boat with flags waving and music playing. She used to peep through the green rushes, and if the wind happened to catch her long silvery veil and anyone saw it, they only thought it was a swan flapping its wings. Many a night she heard the fishermen who were fishing by torchlight talking over the good deeds of the young prince. She was happy to think that she had saved his life when he was drifting about on the waves, half dead, and she could not forget how closely his head had pressed her breast and how passionately she had kissed him. But he knew nothing of all this, and never saw her even in his dreams. She became fonder and fonder of mankind and longed more and more to be able to live among them. Their world seemed so infinitely bigger than hers. With their ships they could scour the ocean. They could ascend them hot mountains high above the clouds, and their wooded, grass-grown lands extended further than her eye could reach. There was so much that she wanted to know, but her sisters could not give an answer to all her questions, so she asked her old grandmother, who knew the upper world well, and rightly called it the country above the sea. If 
Men are not drowned, asked the little mermaid. Do they live forever? Do they not die as we do down here in the sea? Yes, said the old lady. They have to die too, and their lifetime is even shorter than ours. We may live here for three hundred years, but when we cease to exist, we become mere foam on the water, and do not have so much as a grave among our dear ones. We have no immortal souls. We have no future life. We are just like this green seaweed, which, once cut down, can never revive again. Men, on the other hand, have a soul which lives for ever, lives after the body has become dust. It rises through the clear air up to the shining stars. Just as we rise, from the water to see the land of mortals, so they rise up to unknown, beautiful regions which we shall never see. Why have we no immortal souls? asked the little princess sadly. I would give all my three hundred years to be a human being for one day and afterwards to have a share in the heavenly kingdom. You must not be thinking about that, said the grandmother. We are much better off and happier than human beings. Then I shall have to die and float as foam on the water and never hear the music of the waves or see the beautiful flowers or the red sun. Is there nothing I can do to gain an immortal soul? No, said the grandmother. Only if a human being so loved you that you were more to him than mother or father, if all his thoughts and all his love were so centered in you that he would let the priest join your hands and would vow to be faithful to you here and to all eternity, then your body would be infused with his soul. Thus and only thus could you gain a share in the felicity of mankind. He would give you a soul while yet keeping his own, but that can never happen. That which is your greatest beauty in the sea, your fish's tail, is thought hideous upon earth. So little do they understand about it. To be pretty there, you must have two clumsy supports, which they call legs. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sadly at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the grandmother. We will hop and skip during our three hundred years of life. It is surely a long enough time. And after it's over, we shall rest all the better in our graves. There is to be a court ball tonight. This was a much more splendid affair than we ever see on earth. The walls and ceiling of the great ballroom were of thick but transparent glass. Several hundreds of colossal mussel shells, rose red and grass green, were ranged in order round the sides holding blue lights which illuminated the whole room and shone through the walls so that the sea outside was quite lit up. You could see countless fish, great and small, swimming toward the glass walls, some with shining scales of crimson hue, while others were golden and silvery. In the middle of the room was a broad stream of running water, and on this the mermaids and mermen danced to their own beautiful singing. No earthly beings have such voices. The little mermaids sang more sweetly than any of them, and they all applauded her. For a moment she felt glad at heart, for she knew that she had the finest voice either in the sea or on land. But soon she began to think again of, about the upper world. She could not forget the handsome prince and her sorrow in not possessing like him an immortal soul. Therefore she stole out of her father's 
palace, and while all within was joy and merriment, she sat sadly in her little garden. Suddenly she heard the sound of a horn through the water, and thought, now he is out sailing up there. He whom I love more than father or mother, he to whom my thoughts cling and to whose hands I am ready to commit happiness of my life. I will dare anything to win him and gain an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been very much afraid. She will perhaps be able to advise and help me. Thereupon the little, the little mermaid left the garden and went towards the roaring whirlpools at the back of which the witch lived. She had never been that way before. No flowers grew there, no seaweed. Only the bare gray sands stretched toward the whirlpools, which, like rushing mill wheels, swirled around, dragging everything that came within reach down to the depths. She had to pass between these boiling eddies to reach the witch's domain, and for a long way the only path led over warm, bubbling mud, which the witch called her peat bog. Her house stood behind this in the midst of a weird forest. All the trees and bushes were polyps, half animal and half plant. They looked like hundred-headed snakes growing out of the sand. The branches were long, slimy arms with tentacles like wriggling worms, every joint of which, from the root to the outermost tip, was in constant motion. They wound themselves tightly round whatever they could lay hold of and never let it escape. The little mermaid standing outside was quite frightened. Her heart beat fast with terror, and she nearly turned back, but then she remembered the prince and the immortal soul of mankind and took courage. She bound her long flowing hair tightly round her head, so that the polyps should not seize her by it, folded her hands over her breast, and darted like a fish through the water in between the hideous polyps which stretched out their sensitive arms and tentacles towards her. She could see that every one of them had something or other which they had grasped with their hundred arms, and which they held as if in iron bands, the bleached bones of men who had perished at sea and sunk below peeped forth from the arms of some, while others clutched rudders and sea chests or the skeleton of some land animal. And most horrible of all, a little mermaid whom they had caught and suffocated. Then she came to a large opening in the wood where the ground was all slimy and where some huge fat water snakes were gambling about. In the middle of this opening was a house built of the bones of the wrecked. There sat the witch, letting a toad eat out of her mouth, just as mortals let a little canary eat sugar. She called the hideous water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl about on her unsightly bosom. Yeah, I know very well what you come here for, said the witch. It is very foolish of you. All the same, you shall have your way, because it will lead you into misfortune, my fine princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail, and instead to have two stumps to walk about on like human beings, so that the young prince may fall in love with you, and that you may win him and an immortal soul. Saying this, she gave such a loud, hideous laugh that the toad and snakes fell to the ground and wriggled about there. You are just in the nick of time, said the witch. Yeah, after sunrise tomorrow, I should not be able to help you until another year had run its course. I will make you a pool potion, and before sunrise you must swim ashore with it, seat yourself on the beach and drink it. Then your tail will divide and shrivel up to what men call beautiful legs. 
but it hurts. It is as if a sharp sword were running through you. All who see you will say that you're the most beautiful child of man they have ever seen. You will keep your gliding gait. No dancer will rival you, but every step you take will be as if you were treading upon sharp knives, so sharp as to draw blood. If you are willing to suffer all this, I'm ready to help you. Yes said the princess, with a trembling voice, think, thinking of the prince and of winning an undying soul. But remember, said the witch, when once you have received a human form, you can never be a mermaid again. You will never again be able to dive through the water to your, your sisters and to your father's palace. And if you do not succeed in winning the prince's love so that for your sake he will forget father and mother, cleave to you with his whole heart, let the priest join your hands and make you man and wife, you will gain no immortal soul. The first morning after his marriage with another, your heart will break and you will turn in the foam of the sea. I will do it, said the little mermaid, pale as death. But you will have to pay me, too. And it is no trifle that I demand. You have the most beautiful voice of any at the bottom of the sea, and I dare say that you think you will fascinate him with it, but... You must give me that voice. I will have the best you possess in return for my precious potion. I have to mingle my own blood with it, so as to make it as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take my voice, said the little mermaid, what have I left? You beautiful form said the witch, your gliding gait and your speaking eyes. With these you ought surely to be able to bewitch a human heart. Well, have you lost courage? Put out your little tongue and I will cut it off for the powerful draft. Let it be done, said the little mermaid, and the witch put on her cauldron to brew the magic potion. There is nothing like cleanliness, said she, as she scoured the pot with a bundle of snakes. Then she punctured her breast and let the black blood drip into the cauldron, and the steam took the most weird shapes, enough to frighten anyone. Every moment the witch threw new ingredients into the pot, and when it boiled, the bubbling was like the sound of crocodiles weeping. At last the potion was ready, and it looked like the clearest water. There it is, said the witch, and thereupon she cut off the tongue of the little mermaid, who was dumb now and could neither sing nor speak. If the polyp should seize you when you go back through my wood, said the witch, just drop a single drop of this liquid on them and their arms and fingers, will burst into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no need to do this, for at the mere sight of the bright liquid which sparkled in her hand like a shining star, they drew back in terror. So soon she got past the wood, the bog, and the eddying whirlpools. She saw her father's palace. The lights were all out in the great ballroom, and no doubt all the household was asleep, but she did not dare to go in now that she was dumb and about to leave her home forever. She felt as if her heart would break with grief. She stole into the garden and plucked a flower from each of her sister's plots and wafted her hand countless kisses towards the palace and then rose up through the dark blue water. The sun had not risen when she came inside of the prince's palace and landed at the beautiful marble steps, 
the moon was shining bright and clear the little mermaid drank the burning stinging draught and it was like a sharp two-edged sword running through her tender frame she fainted away and lay as if she were dead when the sun rose on the sea she woke up and became conscious of a sharp pang but just in front of her stood the handsome young prince fixing his coal black eyes on her she cast hers down and saw that her fish's tail was gone and that she had the prettiest little white legs any maiden could desire but she was quite naked so she wrapped her long thick hair around her the prince asked who she was and how she came there she looked at him tenderly and with a sad expression in her dark blue eyes but could not speak then he took her by the hand and led her into the palace every step she took was as the witch had forewarned her beforehand as if she were treading on sharp knives and spikes but she bore it gladly led by the prince she moved as lightly as a bubble and he and every one else marveled at her gliding graceful gait clothed in the, the costliest silks and muslins she was the greatest beauty in the palace but she was dumb and could neither sing nor speak beautiful slaves clad in silk and gold came forward and sang to the prince and his royal parents one of them sang better than all the others the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her that made the little mermaid very sad for she knew that she used to sing far better herself she thought oh if he only knew that for the sake of being with him i had given up my voice forever now the slaves began to dance graceful undulating dances to enchanting music thereupon the little mermaid lifting her beautiful white arms and raising herself on tiptoe glided to the floor with a grace which none of the other dancers had yet attained with every motion her grace and beauty became more apparent and her eyes appealed more deeply to the heart than the songs of the slaves everyone was delighted with it especially the prince who called her his little foundling and she danced on and on notwithstanding that every time her foot touched the ground it was like treading on sharp knives the prince said that she should always be near him and he was she was allowed to sleep outside his door on a velvet cushion he had a man's dress made for her so that she could ride about with him they used to ride through scented woods where the green branches brushed her shoulder and little birds sang among the fresh leaves she climbed up the highest mountains with the prince, and although her, del her delicate feet bled so that others saw it, she only laughed and followed him until they saw the clouds sailing below them, like a flock of birds taking flight to the distant lands. At home in the prince's palace, when at night the others were asleep, she used to go out onto the marble steps. It cooled her burning feet to stand in the cold sea water and at such times she used to think of those she had left in the deep. One night her sisters came arm in arm. They sang so sorrowfully as they swam on the water that she beckoned to them, and they recognized her and told her how she had grieved them all. After that they visited her every night, and one night she saw a long way out her old grandmother, who for many years had not been above the water, and the mermaid king with his crown on his head, they stretched out their hands towards her, but did not venture so close to land as her sisters. Day by day, she became dearer to the prince. He loved her as one loves a good, sweet child, but it never entered his head to make her his queen. Yet unless she became his wife, she would never win an everlasting soul, but on his wedding morning would turn to sea foam. Am I not dearer to you than any of them the little mermaid's eyes seemed to say when he took her in his arms and kissed her beautiful brow yes you are the dearest one to me said the prince for you have the best heart of them all and you are the fondest of me you are also like a young girl i once saw but whom i never expect to see again
I was on board a ship which was wrecked. I was driven on shore by the waves close to a holy temple where several young girls were ministering at a service. The youngest of them found me on the beach and saved my life. I saw her but twice. She was the only person I could love in this world. But you were like her. You almost drive her image out of my heart. She belongs to the holy temple and therefore by good fortune you have been sent to me and we will never part. Alas, he does not know that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I bore him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat behind the foam and watched to see if anyone would come. I saw the pretty girl he loves better than me. And the mermaid heaved a bitter sigh, for she could not weep. The girl belongs to the holy temple, he has said. She will never return to the world. They will never meet again. I am here with him. I see him every day. Yes, I will tend him, love him, and give up my life to him. But now the rumor ran that the prince was to be married to the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king, and for that reason was fitted out a beautiful ship. It was given out that the prince was going on a voyage to see the adjoining countries, but it was without doubt to see the king's daughter. He was to have a great suite with him, but the little mermaid shook her head and laughed. She knew the prince's intentions much better than any of the others. I must take this voyage, he had said to her. I must go and see the beautiful princess. My parents demand that. But they will never force me to bring her home as my bride. I can never love her. She will not be like the lovely girl in the temple whom you resemble. If ever I had to choose a bride, it would sooner be you, with your speaking eyes, my sweet dumb foundling. And he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long hair, and laid his head upon her heart which already dreamt of human joys and an immortal soul. You are not frightened of the sea, I suppose, my dumb child, he said, as they stood on the proud ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighboring king. And he told her about storms and calms and curious fish in the deep and the marvels seen by divers. She smiled at his tales, for she knew all about the bottom of the sea much better than anyone else. At night, in the moonlight, when all were asleep except the steersman who stood at the helm, she sat at the side of the ship trying to pierce the clear water with her eyes and fancied she saw her father's palace, and above it her old grandmother with her silver crown on her head, looking up through the cross currents toward the keel of the ship. Then her sisters rose above the water, they gazed sadly at her, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them, smiled, and was about to tell them that all was going well and happily with her when the cabin boy approached and the sisters dived down. But he supposed that the white objects he had seen were nothing but flakes of foam. The next morning the ship entered the harbor of the neighboring king's magnificent city. The church bells rang and trumpets were sounded from every lofty tower while the soldiers paraded with flags flying and glittering bayonets. There was a fete every day. There was a succession of balls, and receptions followed one after the other. But the princess was not yet present. She was being brought up a long way off. In a holy temple, they said, and was learning all the royal virtues. At last she came, the little mermaid, stood eager to see her beauty, and she was obliged to confess that a lovelier creature she had never beheld. Her complexion was exquisitely pure and delicate, and her trustful eyes of the deepest blue shone through their dark lashes. It is you, said the prince. 
you who saved me when I lay almost lifeless on the beach. And he clasped his blushing bride to his heart. Oh, I am too happy, he exclaimed to the little mermaid. A greater joy than I had dared to hope for has come to pass. You will rejoice at my joy, for you love me better than anyone. Then the little mermaid kissed his hand and felt as if her heart were broken already. His wedding morn would bring death to her and change her to foam. All the church bells pealed and heralds rode through the town, proclaiming the nuptials. Upon every altar throughout the land, fragrant oil was burnt in costly silver lamps. Amid the swinging of censers by the priests, the bride and bridegroom joined hands and received the bishop's blessing. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, stood holding the bride's trains, but her ears were deaf to the festal strains. Her eyes saw nothing of the sacred ceremony. She was thinking of her coming death and of all that she had lost in the world. The same evening the bride and bridegroom embarked amidst the roar of cannon and the waving of banners. A royal tent of purple and gold softly cushioned was raised amidships where the bridal pair were to repose during the calm, cool night. The sails swelled in the wind, and the ship skimmed lightly and almost without motion over the transparent sea. At dusk, lanterns of many colors were lighted, and the sailors danced merrily on deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of the first time she came up from the sea and saw the splendor and gaiety. She now threw herself among the dancers, whirling as a swallow skims through the air when pursued. Her onlookers cheered in amazement. Never had she danced so divinely. Her delicate feet pained her as if they were cut with knives, but she did not feel it, for the pain at her heart was much sharper. She knew that it was the last night that she would draw breath the same air as he, and would look upon the mighty deep and the blue starry heavens. An endless night without thought and without dreams awaited her, who neither had a soul nor could win one. The joy and revelry on board lasted until long past midnight. She went on laughing and dancing, with the thought of death all the time in her heart, the prince caressed his lovely bride, and she played with his raven locks, and with their arms entwined they retired to the gorgeous tent. All became hushed and still on board the ship. Only the steersman stood at the helm. The little mermaid laid her white arms on the gunwale and looked eastwards for the pink-tinted dawn. The first sunbeam she knew would be her death. Then she saw her sisters rise from the water. They were as pale as she was. Their beautiful long hair no longer floated on the breeze, for it had been cut off. We have given it to the witch to obtain her help so that you may not die tonight. She has given us a knife. Here it is. Look how sharp it is. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the prince's heart, and when his warm blood sprinkles your feet, they will join together and grow into a tail, and you will once more be a mermaid. You will be able to come down into the water to us and live out your three hundred years before you are turned into dead salt sea foam. Make haste. You or he must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother is so full of grief that her white hair has fallen off as ours fell under the witch's scissors. Slay the prince and come back to us. Quick, quick. Do you not see the rosy streak in the sky? In a few moments the sun will rise, and then you must die. Saying this, they heaved a wondrous sigh and sank among the waves. The little mermaid drew aside the purple curtain from the tent and looked at the beautiful bride asleep with her head on the prince's breast. She bent over him and kissed his fair brow, looked at the sky where the dawn was spreading fast, looked at the sharp knife, and again fixed her eyes on the prince who in his dream called his bride by name. Yes, she alone was in his thoughts. 
For a moment, the knife quivered in her grasp, then she threw it out, far among the waves, now rosy in the morning light, and where it fell, the water bubbled up like drops of blood. Once more she looked at the prince, with her eyes already dimmed by death, then dashed overboard and fell, her body dissolving into foam. Now the sun rose from the sea, and its kindly beams warmed the deadly cold foam, so that the little mermaid did not feel the chill of death. She saw the bright sun, and above her floated hundreds of beauteous ethereal beings through which she could see the white ship and the rosy heavens. Their voices were melodious, but so spirit-like that no human ear could hear them any more than an earthly eye could see their forms. Light as bubbles they floated through the air without the aid of wings. The little mermaid perceived that she had a form like theirs. It gradually took shape out of the foam. To whom am I coming? said she, her, and her voice sounded like that of the other being, so unearthly in its beauty that no music of ours could reproduce it. To the daughters of the air answered the others. A mermaid has no undying soul and can never gain one without winning the love of a human being. Her eternal life must depend upon an unknown power. Nor have the daughters of the air an everlasting soul. But by their own good deeds, they may create one for themselves. We fly to the tropics, where mankind is the victim of hot and pestilent winds. There we bring cooling breezes. We diffuse the scent of flowers all around, and bring refreshment and healing in our train. When for three hundred years we have labored to do all the good in our power, we gain an undying soul and take a part in the everlasting joys of mankind, you, poor little mermaid, have with your whole heart struggled for the same thing as we have struggled for. You have suffered and endured, raised yourself to the spirit world of the air, and now by your own good deeds you may in the course of three hundred years work out for yourself an undying soul. Then the little mermaid lifted her transparent arms towards God's son, and for the first time shed tears. On board ship all was again life and bustle. She saw the prince with his lovely bride searching for her. They looked sadly at the bubbling foam as if they knew that she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen, she kissed the bride upon her brow smiled at the prince, and rose aloft with the other spirits of the air to the rosy clouds which floated above. In three hundred years we shall thus float into paradise. We might reach it sooner, whispered one. Unseen, we flit into those homes of men where there are children, and for every day that we find a good child who gives pleasure to its parents and deserves their love, God shortens our time of probation. The child does not know when we fly through the room, and when we smile with pleasure at it, one year of our three hundred is taken away. But if we see a naughty or badly disposed child, we cannot help shedding tears of sorrow and every tear adds a day to the time of our probation. End of section one. Recording by Mammal, Tyler, Texas. Section two of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas 
Hans Clodhopper. There once was an old mansion in the country, in which an old squire lived with his two sons, and these two sons were too clever by half. They had made up their minds to propose to the king's daughter, and they ventured to do so, because she had made it known that she would take any man for her husband who had most to say for himself. These two took a week over their preparations. It was all the time they had for it, but it was quite enough with all their accomplishments, which were most useful. One of them knew the Latin dictionary by heart, and the town newspapers, for three years either forwards or backwards. The second one had made himself acquainted with all the statutes of the corporations, and what every alderman had to know. So he thought he was competent to talk about affairs of state, and he also knew how to embroider harness, for he was clever with his fingers. I shall win the king's daughter, they both said, and their father gave each of them a beautiful horse. The one who could repeat the dictionary and the newspapers had a coal-black one, while the one who was learned to guilds and embroideries had a milk-white one. Then they smeared the corners of their mouths with oil to make them more flexible. All the servants were assembled in the courtyards to see them mount. But just then the third brother came up, for there were three, only nobody made any account of this one, Hans Clodhopper, as he had no accomplishments like his brothers. Where are you going with all your fine clothes on? he asked. To court, to talk ourselves into favor with the princess. Haven't you heard the news, which is being drummed all over the country? And then they told him the news. Preserve us, then I must go too, said Hans Clodhopper, but his brothers laughed and rode away. Father, give me a horse. I want to get married too. If she takes me, she takes me, and if she doesn't take me, I shall take her all the same. Stuff and nonsense, said his father. I will give no horse to you. Why, you have nothing to say for yourself. Now your brothers are fine fellows. If I may not have a horse, said Hans Clodhopper, I'll take the billy goat. He is my own, and he can carry me very well. And he seated himself astride the billy goat, dug his heels into its sides, and galloped off down the high road. Whew! What a pace they went at! Here I come! shouted Hans Clodhopper, and he sang till the air rang with it. The brothers rode on in silence. They did not say a word to each other, for they had to store up every good idea which they wanted to produce later on, and their speeches had to be very carefully thought out. Hallo! shouted Hans Clodhopper. Here I come. See what I found on the road. And he showed them a dead crow. What on earth will you do with that, Clodhopper? said they. I will give it to the king's daughter. Yes, I would do that, said they. And they rode on laughing. Hallo! Here I come. See what I have found. One doesn't find such a thing as this every day on the road. The brothers turned round to see what it was. Clodhopper, said they, it's nothing but an old wooden shoe with the upper part broken off. Is the princess to have that too? Yes, indeed she is, said Hans, and the brothers again rode on laughing. Hallo, hallo, here I am, shouted Hans Clodhopper. Now this is famous. What have you found this time? asked the brothers. Won't the princess be delighted? Why, said the brothers. It's only sand picked up out of the ditch. Yes, that it is, said Hans Clodhopper, and the finest kind of sand, too. You can hardly hold it, and he filled his pockets with it. The brothers rode on as fast as they could, and arrived at the town gates a whole hour before him. At the gate the suitors received tickets, in the order of their arrival, and they were arranged in rows, six in each file and so close together that they could not move their arms, which was a very good thing, or they would have torn each other garments off, merely because one stood in front of the other. All the other inhabitants of the town stood round the castle, peeping in at the windows, to see the king's daughter receive the suitors, and, as each one came into the room, he lost the power of speech. No good, said the princess, away with him. Now came the brother, who could repeat the lexicon, but he had entirely forgotten it while standing in the ranks. The floor creaked, 
and the ceiling was made of looking-glass, so that he saw himself standing on his head, and at every window sat three clerks and an alderman, who wrote down all that was said, so that it might be sent to the papers at once, and sold for a halfpenny at the street corners. It was terrible, and the stoves had been heated to such a degree that they got red hot at the top. It is terribly hot in here, said the suitor. That is because my father is roasting cockerels today, said the princess. Bah! There he stood like a fool. He had not expected a conversation of this kind, and he could not think of a word to say, just when he wanted to be specially witty. No good, said the king's daughter. Away with him. And he had to go. Then came the second brother. There is a fearful heat here, said he. Yes, we are roasting cockerels today, said the king's daughter. What did, what, said he, and all the reporters duly wrote, what did, what? No good, said the king's daughter, away with him. Then came Hans Clodhopper. He rode the billy goat right into the room. What a burning heat you have here, said he. That is because I am roasting cockerels, said the king's daughter. That is very convenient, said Hans Clodhopper. Then I suppose I can get a crow roasted too. Yes, very well, said the king's daughter. But have you anything to roast it in? For I have neither pot nor pan. But I have, said Hans Clodhopper. Here is a cooking pot. And he brought out the wooden shoe and put the crow into it. Why, you have enough for a whole meal, said the king's daughter. But where shall we get any dripping to baste it with? Oh, I have some in my pocket, said Hans Clodhopper. I have enough, and to spare. And he poured a little of the sand out of his pocket. Now I like that, said the princess. You have an answer for everything, and you have something to say for yourself. I will have you for a husband. But do you know that every word we have said will be in the paper tomorrow, for at every window sit three clerks and an alderman, and the alderman is the worst, for he doesn't understand. She said this to frighten him. All the clerks sniggered and made blots of ink on the floor. Oh, those are the gentry, said Hans Clodhopper. Then I must give the alderman the best thing I have. And he turned out his pockets and threw the sand in his face. That was cleverly done, said the princess. I couldn't have done it, but I will try to learn. So Hans Clodhopper became king, gained a wife and a crown, and sat upon the throne. We have the straight out of the alderman's newspaper, but it is not to be depended upon. End of section 2「Section three of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Flying Trunk. There was once a merchant who was so rich that he might have paved the whole street and a little alley besides with silver money, but he didn't do it. He knew better how to use his money than that. If he laid out a penny, he got half a crown in return. Such a clever man of business was he, and then he died. His son got all the money, and he led a merry life. He used to go to masquerades every night made kites of banknotes, and played ducks and drakes with gold coins instead of stones. In this way the money soon went. At last he had only a penny left, and no clothes except an old dressing gown and a pair of slippers. His friends cared for him no longer. They couldn't walk about the streets with him. But one of them, who was kind, sent him an old trunk and said, Pack up! Now this was all very well, but he had nothing to pack, so he got into the trunk himself. It was a most peculiar trunk. If you pressed the lock, the trunk could fly. And this is what happened. With a whiz, it flew up the chimney, high above the clouds, further and further away. The bottom of it cracked ominously, and he was dreadfully afraid it would go to pieces, and a nice fall he would have had. Heaven preserve us! 
At last he arrived in the country of the Turks. He hid the trunk in a wood under the dead leaves and walked into the town. He could easily do that, as all the Turks wear dressing gowns and slippers, you know, just like his. He met a nurse with a baby. I say, you Turkish nurse, said he, what is that big palace close to the town where all the windows are so high up? That's where the king's daughter lives, said she. It has been prophesied that she will be made very unhappy by a lover, so no one is allowed to visit her except when the king and the queen go with them. Thank you, said the merchant's son, and then he went back to the wood and got into his trunk again and flew on to the roof of the palace from whence he crept in at the princess's window. She was lying on a sofa, fast asleep. She was so very beautiful that the merchant's son was driven to kiss her. She woke up and was dreadfully frightened, but he said that he was the prophet of the Turks and he had flown down through the air to see her, and this pleased her very much. They sat side by side, and he told her stories about her eyes. He said they were like the most beautiful, deep, dark lakes in which her thoughts floated like mermaids. And then he told her about her forehead, that it was like a snow mountain adorned with a series of pictures. And he told her all about the storks, which bring beautiful little children up out of the rivers. No end of beautiful stories he told her. And then he asked her to marry him, and she at once said, Yes, but you must come here on Saturday, she said, when the king and the queen drink tea with me. They will be very proud when they hear I am to marry a prophet. But mind you have a splendid story to tell them, for my parents are very fond of stories. My mother likes them to be grand and very proper, but my father likes them to be merry, so that he can laugh at them. Well, a story will be my only wedding gift, he said, and then they separated. But the princess gave him a sword encrusted with gold. It was the kind of present he needed badly. He flew away and bought himself a new dressing gown and sat down in the wood to make up a new story. It had to be ready by Saturday, and it is not always so easy to make up a story. However, he had it ready in time, and Saturday came. The king, the queen, and the whole court were waiting for him round the princess's tea table. He had a charming reception. Now will you tell us a story, said the queen, one which is both thoughtful and instructive, but one that we can laugh at, too, said the king. All right, said he, and then he began. We must listen to his story attentively. There was once a bundle of matches, and they were frightfully proud because of their high origin. Their family tree, that is to say the great pine tree of which they were each a little splinter, had been the giant of the forest. The matches now lay on a shelf between a tinder box and an old iron pot, and they told the whole story of their youth to these two. Ah, when we were a living tree, said they, we were indeed a green branch. Every morning and every evening we had diamond tea. That was the dewdrops. In the day we had the sunshine and all the little birds to tell us stories. We could see, too, that we were very rich, for most of the other trees were only clad in summer, but our family could afford to have green clothes both summer and winter. But then the woodcutters came, and there was a great revolution, and our family was sundered. The head of the tribe got a place as mainmast on a splendid ship, which could sail round the world if it chose. The other branches were scattered in different directions, and it is now our task to give light to the common herd. That is how such aristocratic people as ourselves have got into this kitchen. Now my lot has been different, said the iron pot, beside which the matches lay. Ever since I came into the world, I have passed the time in being scoured and boiled over and over again. Everything solid comes to me, and in fact, I am the most important person in the house. My pleasure is, when the dinner is over, to lie clean and bright on the shelf, and to have a sensible chat with my companions. But with the exception of the water bucket, which sometimes goes down into the yard, we lead an indoor life. Our only newsmonger is the market basket, and it talks very wildly about the government and the people. Why, the other day, an old pot was so alarmed by the conversation that it fell down and broke itself to pieces. It was a liberal, you see. You are talking too much, said the tinderbox, and the steel struck sparks on the flint. Let us have a merry evening. Yes, pray let us settle which is the most aristocratic among us, said the matches. 
No, I don't like talking about myself, said the earthen pipkin. Let us have an evening entertainment. I will begin. I will tell you the kind of things we have all experienced. They are quite easy to understand, and that is what we all like. By the eastern sea and Danish beaches. That's a nice beginning to make, said all the plates. I am sure that will be a story I shall like. Well, I passed my youth there, in a very quiet family. The furniture was beeswaxed, the floors washed, and clean curtains were put up once a fortnight. "'What a good storyteller you are,' said the broom. "'One can tell directly that it's a woman telling a story. "'A vein of cleanliness runs through it.' "'Yes, one feels that,' said the water-pail, "'and for very joy it gave a little hop which clashed on the floor. "'The pipkin went on with its story, "'and the end was much the same as the beginning. "'All the plates clattered with joy, "'and the broom crowned the pipkin with a wreath of parsley "'because it knew it would annoy the others, "'and it thought, if I crown her today, "'she will crown me tomorrow. "'Now I will dance,' said the tongs, "'and began to dance, heaven help us. "'What a way into the air she could get her leg. "'The old chair cover in the corner burst when she saw it. "'Mayn't I be crowned too?' said the tongs, so they crowned her. They're only a rabble after all, said the matches. The tea urn was called upon to sing now, but it had a cold, it said. It couldn't sing except when it was boiling, but that was all because it was stuck up. It wouldn't sing except when it was on the drawing-room table. There was an old quill pen along on the window sill, which the servant used to write with. There was nothing extraordinary about it, except that it had been dipped too far into the ink pot, but it was rather proud of that. If the tea urn won't sing, it can leave it alone, it said. There is a nightingale hanging outside in a cage. It can sing. It certainly hasn't learnt anything special, but we needn't mind that tonight. I think it is most unsuitable, said the kettle which was the kitchen songster and half-sister of the urn, that a strange bird like that should be listened to. Is it patriotic? I will let the market-basket judge. I am very much annoyed, said the market-basket. I am more annoyed than any one can tell. Is this a suitable way to spend an evening? Wouldn't it be better to put the house to rights? Then everything would find its proper place, and I would manage the whole party. Then we should get on differently. Yes, let us make a row, they all said together. At that moment the door opened. It was the servant, and they all stood still. Nobody uttered a sound. But not a pot among them which didn't know its capabilities or how distinguished it was. If I had chosen, we might have had a merry evening, and no mistake, they all thought. The servant took the matches and struck a light. Preserve us! How they spluttered and blazed up! Now everyone can see, they thought, that we are the first. How brilliantly we shine! What a light we shed around! And then they were burnt out. That was a splendid story, said the queen. I quite felt that I was in the kitchen with the matches. Yes, indeed, you shall marry our daughter. Certainly, said the king. Thou shalt marry her on Monday. They said do, thou, to him now, as they were to be related. So the wedding was decided upon, and the evening before the town was illuminated. Buns and cakes were scattered broadcast. The street boys stood on tiptoe and shouted hurrah, and whistled through their fingers. Everything was most gorgeous. I suppose I shall have to do something too, said the merchant's son. So he bought a lot of rockets, squibs, and all sorts of fireworks, put them in his trunk, and flew up into the air with them. All the Turks jumped at the sight, so that their slippers flew up into the air. They had never seen a flight of meteors like that before. They saw now without doubt that it was the prophet himself who was about to marry the princess. As soon as the merchant's son got down again into the wood with his trunk, he thought, I will just go into the town to hear what was thought of the display, and it was quite reasonable that he should do so. Oh, how everyone talked! Every single man he spoke to had his own opinion about it, but that it had been splendid was the universal opinion. I saw the prophet myself, said one. His eyes were like shining stars, and his beard like foaming water. He was wrapped in a mantle of fire, said another. The most beautiful angel's heads peeped out among the folds. He heard nothing but pleasant things, and the next day was to be his wedding day. He went back to the wood to get into his trunk, but where was it? The trunk was burnt up. A spark from the fireworks had set fire to it, and the trunk was burnt to ashes. He could not fly any more, or reach his bride. She stood all day on the roof waiting for him. 
She is waiting for him still, but he wanders round the world telling stories, only they are no longer so merry as the one he told about the matches. End of section three. Section four of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Sounds, Boston. Sarah Sounds Communications. Dot com. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Rose Elf In the middle of a garden grew a rose tree. It was full of roses, and in the loveliest of them all lived an elf. He was so tiny that no human eye could see him. He had a snug little room behind every petal of the rose. He was as well made and as perfect as any human child, and he had wings reaching from his shoulders to his feet. Oh, what a delicious scent there was in his room, and how lovely and transparent the walls were, for they were the palest pink rose petals. All day he reveled in the sunshine, flew from flower to flower, and danced on the wings of fluttering butterflies. Then he would measure how many steps he would have to take to run along all the high roads and paths on a linden leaf. These paths were what we call veins, but they were endless roads to him. Before he came to the end of them, the sun went down, for he had begun rather late. It became very cold. The dew fell, and the wind blew. It was high time for him to get home. He hurried as much as ever he could, but the rose had shut itself up, and he could not get in. Not a single rose was open. The poor little rose elf was dreadfully frightened. He had never been out in the night before. He had always slept so safely behind his cozy rose leaves. Oh, it would surely be his death. At the other end of the garden, he knew there was an arbor covered with delicious honeysuckle. The flowers looked like beautiful painted horns. He would get into one of those and sleep till morning. He flew along to it. Hush! There were already two people in the arbor, a young, handsome man and a lovely maiden. They sat side by side and wished they might never more be parted. So tenderly did they love each other. They loved each other more dearly than the best child can even love its father and mother. Still, we must part, said the young man. Your brother is not friendly to us, therefore he sends me on such a distant errand far away, over mountains and oceans. Goodbye, my sweetest bride, for you are that to me you know. Then they kissed each other, and the young girl wept and gave him a rose, but before she gave it to him, she pressed a kiss upon it, a kiss so tender and impassioned that the rose spread its petals. Then the little elf flew in and leant his head against the delicate, fragrant walls. But he could hear them saying, Farewell, farewell! And he felt that the rose was placed upon the young man's heart. Ah, how it beat! The little elf could not go to sleep because of its beating. The rose did not remain long undisturbed on that beating heart. The young man took it out, as he walked alone through the dark wood and kissed it passionately many, many times. The little elf thought he would be crushed to death. He could feel the young man's burning lips through the leaves, and the rose opened as it might have done under the midday sun. Then another man came up behind, dark and angry. 
He was the pretty girl's wicked brother. He took out a long, sharp knife, and while the other was kissing the rose, the bad man stabbed him. He cut off his head and buried it with the body in the soft earth under the linden tree. Now he is dead and done with, thought the wicked brother. He will never come back any more. He had a long journey to take over mountains and oceans where one's life may easily be lost, and he has lost his. He will never come back, and my sister will never dare to ask me about him. Then he raked up the dead leaves with his foot over the earth where it had been disturbed and went home again in the darkness of the night. But he was not alone, as he thought. The little elf went with him. He was hidden in a withered linden leaf which had fallen from the tree onto the bad man's head while he was digging the grave. It was covered by his hat now, and it was so dark inside where the little elf sat trembling with fear and anger at the wicked deed. The bad man got home in the early morning. He took off his hat and went into his sister's bedroom. There lay the pretty, blooming girl, dreaming about her beloved, whom she thought was so far away, beyond mountains and woods. The wicked brother leant over her with an evil laugh, such as a fiend might laugh. The withered leaf fell out of his hair upon the counterpane, but he never noticed it, and went away to get a little sleep himself. But the elf crept out of the dead leaf and into the ear of the sleeping girl and told her, as in a dream, the tale of the terrible murder. He described the place where her brother had committed the murder and where he had laid the body. He told her about the flowering linden tree and said, So that you may not think all I have told you is a mere dream, you will find a withered leaf upon your bed. This she found, as he had said when she woke. Oh, what bitter, bitter tears she shed. To no one did she dare betray her grief. Her window stood open all day, and the little elf could easily have got into the garden to the roses and all the other flowers, but he could not bear to leave the sorrowing girl. A monthly rose bush stood in the window, and he took up his place in one of the flowers, whence he could watch the poor girl. Her brother often came into the room. He was merry with an evil mirth, but she dared not say a word about the grief at her heart. When night came, she stole out of the house and into the wood to the place where the linden tree stood. She tore away the leaves from the ground and dug down into the earth and at once found him who had been murdered. Oh, how she wept and prayed to God that she too might soon die. Gladly would she have taken the body home with her could she have done so. But she took the pale head with the closed eyes, kissed the cold lips, and shook the earth out of his beautiful hair. This shall be mine, she said, when she had covered up the body with earth and leaves. Then she took the head home with her, and a little spray of the jasmine tree which flowered in the wood where he was killed. As soon as she reached her room, she fetched the biggest flower pot she could find, and laid the head of the dead man in it, covered it with earth, and planted the sprig of jasmine in the pot. Farewell, farewell, whispered the little elf. He could no longer bear to look at such grief, so he flew away into the garden to his rose, but it was withered, and only a few faded leaves hung round the green calyx. Alas, how quickly the good and the beautiful pass away, sighed the elf. At last, He found another rose and made it his home. He could dwell in safety behind its fragrant petals. Every morning he flew to the poor girl's window, and she was always there, weeping by the flower pot.
Her salt tears fell upon the jasmine, and for every day that she grew paler and paler, the sprig gained in strength and vigor. One shoot appeared after another, and then little white flower buds showed themselves, and she kissed them. But her wicked brother scolded her and asked if she was crazy. He did not like to see and could not imagine why she was always hanging, weeping over the flower pot. He did not know what eyes lay hidden there, closed forever, nor what red lips had returned to dust within its depths. She leaned her head against the flower pot, and the little elf found her there, fallen into a gentle slumber. He crept into her ear and whispered to her of that evening in the arbor about the scented roses and the love of the elves. She dreamt these sweet dreams, and while she dreamt, her life passed away. She was dead. She had died a peaceful death and had passed to heaven to her beloved. The jasmine opened its big white blossoms, and they gave out their sweetest scent. They had no other way of weeping over the dead. The wicked brother saw the beautiful flowering plant, and he took it for himself as an inheritance. He put it into his own bedroom, close by his bedside, because it was so beautiful to look at and smelt so sweet and fresh. The little rose elf accompanied it and flew from blossom to blossom. In each lived a little elf, and to each one he told the story of the murdered man whose head now rested under the earth. He told them about the wicked brother and his poor sister. We know it, said each little creature. We know it. Did we not spring from those murdered eyes and lips? We know it. We know it. And then they nodded their heads so oddly. The rose elf could not understand how they could be so quiet about it, and he flew to the bees who were gathering honey. He told them the story about the wicked brother, and the bees told it to their queen, who commanded them all to kill the murderer next morning. But in the night, the first night after his sister's death, when the brother was asleep in his bed, close to the fragrant jasmine tree, every blossom opened wide its petals, and out of every flower stepped invisibly but armed each with a tiny poisoned spear, the little spirits from the flower. First, they took their places by his ear and told him evil dreams. Then they flew over his mouth and pierced his tongue with their poisoned darts. Now we have revenged the dead, said they, and crept back again into the white bells of the jasmine. When morning came, the window all at once flew open, and in flew the rose elf and all the swarm of bees with their queen to kill him. But he was already dead. People stood round the bed and said, The scent of the jasmine has killed him. Then the rose elf understood the vengeance of the flowers and told it to the queen bee, and she, with all her swarm, buzzed round the flower pot. The bees would not be driven away. Then a man took up the flower pot, and one of the bees stung his hand, and he let the flower pot fall, and it was broken to bits. Then they saw the whitened skull, and they knew that the dead man lying on the bed was a murderer. The queen bee hummed in the air and sang about the vengeance of the flowers to the rose elf, and that behind each smallest leaf lurks a being who can discover and revenge every evil deed. End of Section 4 Recording by Sarah Sounds Boston SarahSoundsCommunications.com Section 5 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna Teresa. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Wild Swans. Far away, where the swallows take refuge in winter, lived a king who had eleven sons and one daughter, Elise. The eleven brothers, they were all princes, used to go to school with stars on their breasts and swords at their sides. They wrote upon golden slates with diamond pencils, and they could read just as well without a book as with one so there was no mistake about their being real princes. Their sister, Elise, sat upon a little footstool of looking-glass, and she had a picture book, which had cost the half of a kingdom. Oh, these children were very happy, but it was not to last thus forever. Their father, who was king over all the land, married a wicked queen, who was not at all kind to the poor children. They found that out on the first day. All was festive at the castle, but when the children wanted to play at having company, instead of giving them cakes and baked apples as ever they wanted, she only let them have some sand in a teacup, and said they must make believe. In the following week, she sent little Elise into the country to board with some peasants, and it did not take her long to make the king believe so many bad things about the boys that he cared no more about them. "'Fly out into the world and look after yourselves,' said the wicked queen. "'You shall fly about like birds without voices.' <laughs> but she could not make things as bad for them as she would have liked. They turned into eleven beautiful swans. They flew out of the palace window with a weird scream, right across the park and the woods. It was very early in the morning when they came to the place where their sister was sleeping in the peasant's house. They hovered over the roof of the house, turning and twisting their long necks and flapping their wings but no one either heard or saw them. They had to fly away again, and they soared up towards the clouds, far out into the wide world, and they settled in a big, dark wood which stretched down to the shore. Poor little Elise stood in the peasant's room, playing with a green leaf, for she had no other toys. She made a little hole in it, which she looked through at the sun, and it seemed to her as if she saw her brother's bright eyes every time the warm sunbeams shone upon her cheek. It reminded her of their kisses. One day passed just like another. When the wind whistled through the rose hedges outside the house, it whispered to the roses, Who can be prettier than you are? But the roses shook their heads and answered, Elise. And when the old woman sat in the doorway reading her psalms, the wind turned over the leaves and said to the book, Who can be more pious than you? Elise, answered the book. Both the roses and the book of psalms only spoke the truth. She was to go home when she was fifteen. But when the queen saw how pretty she was, she got very angry, and her heart was filled with hatred. She would willingly have turned her into a wild swan, too, like her brothers. But she did not dare to do it at once, for the king wanted to see his daughter. The queen always went to the bath in the early morning. It was built of marble and adorned with soft cushions and beautiful carpets. She took three toads, kissed them, and said to the first, Sit upon Elise's head when she comes to the bath, so that she may become sluggish like yourself. 
sit upon her forehead, she said to the second, that she may become ugly like you, and then her father won't know her. <laughs> Rest upon her heart, she whispered to the third. Let an evil spirit come over her, which may be a burden to her. Then she put the toads into the clean water, and a green tinge immediately came over it. She called Elise, undressed her, and made her go into the bath. When she ducked under the water, one of the toads got among her hair, the other got onto her forehead, and the third onto her bosom. But when she stood up, three scarlet poppies floated on the water. Had not the creatures been poisonous and kissed by the sorceress, they would have been changed into crimson roses. But yet, they became flowers from merely having rested a moment on her head and her heart. She was far too good and innocent for the sorcery to have any power over her. When the wicked queen saw this, she rubbed her over with walnut juice and smeared her face with some evil-smelling salve. She also matted up her beautiful hair. It would have been impossible to recognize pretty Elise. When her father saw her, he was quite horrified and said that she could not be his daughter. Nobody would have anything to say to her except the yard dogs and the swallows, and they were only poor dumb animals whose opinion went for nothing. Poor Elise wept, and thought of her eleven brothers who were all lost. She crept sadly out of the palace, and wandered about all day, over meadows and marshes, and into a big forest. She did not know in the least where she wanted to go, but she felt very sad and longed for her brothers, who, no doubt, like herself, had been driven out of the palace. She made up her mind to go and look for them, but she had only been in the wood a short while when night fell. She had quite lost her way, so she lay down upon the soft mass, said her evening prayer, and rested her head on a little hillock. It was very still, and the air was mild. Hundreds of glowworms shone around her on the grass, and in the marsh like green fire. When she gently moved one of the branches over her head, the little shining insects fell over her like a shower of stars. She dreamt about her brothers all night long. Again, they were children, playing together. They rode upon their golden slates with their diamond pencils, and she looked at the picture book which had cost half a kingdom. But they no longer wrote strokes and knots upon their slates, as they used to do. No, they wrote down all their boldest exploits and everything they had seen and experienced. Everything in the picture book was alive. The birds sang, and the people walked out of the books and spoke to Elise and her brothers. When she turned over a page, they skipped back into their places again so that there would be no confusion among the pictures. When she woke, the sun was already high. It is true, she did not see it very well through the thick branches of the lofty forest trees but the sunbeams cast a golden shimmer around beyond the forest. There was a fresh, delicious scent of grass and herbs in the air, and the birds were almost ready to perch on her shoulders. She could hear the splashing of water, for there were many springs around, which all flowed into a pond with a lovely sandy bottom. It was surrounded with thick bushes, but there was one place which the stags had trampled down, and Elise passed through the opening to the waterside. It was so transparent that had not the branches been moved by the breeze, she must have thought they were painted on the bottom so plainly was every leaf reflected, both those on which the sun played and those which were in the shade. When she saw her own face, she was quite frightened. It was so brown and ugly. 
but when she wet her little hand and rubbed her eyes and forehead, her white skin shone through again. Then she took off all her clothes and went into the fresh water. A more beautiful royal child than she could not be found in all the world. When she put on her clothes again and plaited her long hair, she went to the sparkling spring and drank some of the water out of the hollow of her hand. When she wandered further into the wood, though where she was going she had not the least idea, she thought of her brothers, and she thought of a merciful God who would not forsake her. He let the wild crab apples grow to feed the hungry. He showed her a tree, the branches of which were bending beneath the weight of fruit. Here, she made her midday meal, and having put props under the branches, she walked on into the thickest part of the forest. It was so quiet that she heard her own footsteps. She heard every little withered leaf which bent under her feet. Not a bird was to be seen, not a ray of sunlight pierced the leafy branches, and the tall trunks were so close together that when she looked before her, it seemed as if a thick fence of heavy beams hemmed her in on every side. The solitude was such as she had never known before. It was a very dark night. Not a single glowworm sparkled in the marsh. Sadly, she lay down to sleep, and it seemed to her as if the branches above her parted asunder, and the Savior looked down upon her with his loving eyes, and little angels' heads peeped out above his head and under his arms. When she woke in the morning, she was not sure if she had dreamt this or whether it was really true. She walked a little further when she met an old woman with a basket full of berries, of which she gave her some. Elise asked if she had seen eleven princes ride through the wood. No, said the old woman, but yesterday I saw eleven swans with golden crowns upon their head swimming in the stream close by there. She led Elise a little further to a slope, at the foot of which the stream meandered. The trees on either bank stretched out their rich, leafy branches toward each other, and where from their natural growth they could not reach each other. They had torn their roots out of the ground and leant over the water so as to interlace their branches. Elise said goodbye to the old woman, and walked along the river till it flowed out into a great open sea. The beautiful open sea lay before the maiden, but not a sail was to be seen on it, not a single boat. How was she ever to get any further? She looked at the numberless little pebbles on the beach. They were all worn quite round by the water. Glass, iron, stone, whatever was washed up, had taken their shapes from the water which yet was much softer than her little hand. With all its rolling, it is untiring, and everything hard is smoothed down. I will be just as untiring. Thank you for your lesson, you clear rolling waves. Sometime, so my heart tells me, you will bear me, my beloved brothers. Eleven white swan's feathers were lying on the seaweed, she picked them up and made a bunch of them. There were still drops of water on them. Whether these were dew or tears, no one could tell. It was very lonely there by the shore, but she did not feel it, for the sea was ever-changing. There were more changes on it in the course of a few hours than could be seen on an inland freshwater lake in a year. If a big black cloud arose, it was as if the sea wanted to say, I can look black, too. And then the wind blew up and the waves showed their white crests. But if the clouds were red and the wind dropped, the sea looked like a rose leaf, now white, now green. But however still it was, there was always a little gentle motion just by the shore. The water rose and fell softly like the bosom of a sleeping child. When the sun was just about to go down, 
Elise saw eleven wild swans with golden crowns upon their heads flying toward the shore. They flew in a swaying line, one behind the other, like a white ribbon streamer. Elise climbed up onto the bank and hid behind a bush. The swans settled close by her and flapped their great white wings. As soon as the sun had sunk beneath the water, the swans shed their feathers and became eleven handsome princes. <gasps> they were Elise's brothers. Although they had altered a good deal, she knew them at once. She felt that they must be her brothers, and she sprang into their arms, calling them by name. They were delighted when they recognized their little sister who had grown so big and beautiful. They laughed and cried and told each other how wickedly their stepmother had treated them all. We brothers, said the eldest, have to fly about in the guise of swans as long as the sun is above the horizon. When it goes down, we regain our human shapes. So we always have to look out for a resting place near sunset, for should we happen to be flying up among the clouds when the sun goes down, we should be hurtled to the depths below. We do not live here. There is another land, just as beautiful as this, beyond the sea. But the way to it is very long, and we have to cross the mighty ocean to get to it. There is not a single island on the way where we can spend the night. Only one solitary little rock juts up above the waterway. It is only just big enough for us to stand upon close together. And if there is a heavy sea, the water splashes over us, yet we thank our God for it. We stay there overnight in our human forms, and without it we could never revisit our beloved fatherland. For our flights take two of the longest days in the year. We are permitted to visit the homeland of our fathers once a year, and we dare only stay for eleven days. We hover over this big forest from whence we catch a glimpse of the palace where we were born and where our father lives. Beyond it, we can see the high church towers where our mother is buried. We fancy that the trees and bushes here are related to us, and the wild horses gallop over the moors as we used to see them in our childhood. The charcoal burners still sing the old songs we used to dance to when we were children. This is our fatherland. We are drawn towards it, and here we have found you again, dear little sister. We may stay here two days longer, but then we must fly away again, across the ocean, to a lovely country indeed. But it is not our own dear fatherland. How shall we ever take you with us? We have neither ship nor boat. How can I deliver you? said their sister, and they went on talking to each other nearly all night. They only dozed for a few hours. Elise was awakened in the morning by a rustling of swan's wings above her. Her brothers were again transformed and were wheeling round in great circles till she lost sight of them in the distance. One of them, the youngest, stayed behind and laid his head against her bosom, and she caressed it with her fingers. They remained together all day. Towards evening the others came back, and as soon as the sun went down, they took their natural forms. Tomorrow we must fly away, and we dare not come back for a whole year. But we can't leave you like this. Have you the courage to go with us? My arm is strong enough to carry you over the forest, so surely our united strength ought to be sufficient to bear you across the ocean. Oh, yes, take me with you, said Elise. They spent the whole night in weaving a kind of net of elastic bark of the willow bound together with tough rushes. They made it both large and strong. Elise lay down upon it, and when the sun rose and the brothers became swans again, they took up the net in their bills and flew high up among the clouds with their precious sister, who was fast asleep. The sunbeams fell straight onto her face. So one of the swans flew over her head, 
so that its broad wings should shade her. They were far from the land when Elise awoke. She thought she must still be dreaming. It seemed so strange to be carried through the air so high up above the sea. By her side lay a branch of beautiful ripe berries and a bundle of savory roots, which her youngest brother had collected for her and for which she gave him a grateful smile. She knew it was he who flew above her head, shading her from the sun. They were so high up that the first ship they saw looked like a gull floating on the water. A great cloud came up behind them like a mountain, and Elise saw the shadows of herself on it and those of the eleven swans looking like giants. It was a more beautiful picture than any she had ever seen before. But as the sun rose higher, the cloud fell behind, and the shadow picture disappeared. They flew on and on all day like an arrow whizzing through the air. But they went slower than usual, for now they had their sister to carry. A storm came up. The night was drawing on. Elise saw the sun sinking with terror in her heart, for the solitary rock was nowhere to be seen. The swan seemed to be taking stronger strokes than ever. Alas, she was the cause of their not being able to get on faster. As soon as the sun went down, they would become men, and they would all be hurled into the sea and drowned. She prayed to God from the bottom of her heart, but still no rock was to be seen. Black clouds gathered, and strong gusts of wind announced a storm. The cloud looked like a great, threatening, leaden wave, and the flashes of lightning followed each other rapidly. The sun was now at the edge of the sea. Elisa's heart quaked, when suddenly the swans shot downward so suddenly that she thought they were falling. Then they hovered again. Half of the sun was below the horizon, and there, for the first time, she saw the little rock below, which did not look bigger than the head of a seal above the water. The sun sank very quickly. It was no bigger than a star. But her foot touched solid earth. The sun went out like the last sparks of a bit of burning paper. She saw her brothers stand arm in arm around her, but there was only just room enough for them. The waves beat upon the rock and washed over them like drenching rain. The heavens shone with continuous fire, and the thunder rolled, peal after peal. But the sister and brothers held each other's hands and sang a psalm which gave them comfort and courage. The air was pure and still at dawn. As soon as the sun rose, the swans flew off with Elise away from the islet. The sea still ran high. It looked down where they were, as if the white foam on the dark green water were millions of swans floating on the waves. When the sun rose higher, Elise saw before her, half floating in the air, great masses of ice, with shining glaciers on the heights, a palace perched midway a mile in length, with one bold colonnade built above another. Beneath them, swayed palm trees and gorgeous blossoms as big as mill wheels. She asked if this was the land to which she was going, but the swans shook their head, because what she saw was a mirage. The beautiful and ever-changing palace of Fata Morgana. No mortal dared enter it. Elise gazed at it, but as she gazed, the palace gardens, and mountains melted away, and in their place stood fifty proud churches with high towers and pointed windows. She seemed to hear the notes of the organ, but it was the sea she heard. When she got close to the seeming churches, they changed to a great navy sailing beneath her, but it was only the sea mist floating over the waters. Yes, she saw constant changes passing before her eyes. And now she saw the real land she was bound to. Beautiful blue mountains rose before her with their cedar woods and palaces. 
Long before the sun went down, she sat among the hills in front of a big cave covered with delicate green creepers. It looked like a piece of embroidery. Now we shall see what you will dream here tonight, said the youngest brother, as she showed her where she was to sleep. If only I might dream how I could deliver you, she said, and this thought filled her mind entirely. She prayed earnestly to God for his help, and even in her sleep she continued her prayer. It seemed to her that she was flying up to Fata Morgana and her castle in the air. The fairy came towards her. She was charming and brilliant, and yet she was very like the old woman who gave her the berries in the wood and told her about the swans with the golden crowns. "'Your brothers can be delivered,' she said. "'But have you the courage and endurance enough for it? "'The sea is indeed softer than your hands, "'and it molds the hardest stones. "'But it does not feel the pain your fingers will feel. "'It has no heart and does not suffer the pain and anguish you must feel. Do you see the stinging nettle I hold in my hand? Many of this kind grow around the cave where you sleep. Only these and the ones which grow in the churchyards may be used. Mark that. Those you may pluck, although they will burn and blister your hands. Crush the nettles with your feet, and you will have flax. And of this, you must weave eleven coats of mail with long sleeves. Throw these over the eleven wild swans, and the charm is broken. But remember that from the moment you begin this work, till it is finished, even if it takes years, you must not utter a word. The first word you say will fall like a murderer's dagger into the hearts of your brothers. Their lives hang on your tongue. Mock this well. She touched her hand at the same moment. It was like burning fire and woke Elise. It was bright daylight, and close to where she slept lay a nettle like those in her dream. She fell upon her knees with thanks to God and left the cave to begin her work. She seized the horrid nettles with her delicate hands and they burnt like fire. Great blisters rose on her hands and arms, but she suffered it willingly, if only it would deliver her beloved brothers. She crushed every nettle with her bare feet and twisted it into green flax. When the sun went down, and the brothers came back, they were alarmed at finding her mute. They thought it was some new witchcraft exercised by their wicked stepmother. But when they saw her hands, they understood that it was for their sakes. The youngest brother wept, and wherever his tears fell, she felt no more pain, and the blisters disappeared. She spent the whole night at her work, for she could not rest until she had delivered her dear brothers. All the following day, while her brothers were away, she sat in solitary, but never had the time flown so fast. One coat of mail was finished, and she began the next, when a hunting horn sounded among the mountains. She was frightened. The sound came nearer, and she heard dogs barking. In terror, she rushed into the cave and tied the nettles she had collected and woven into a bundle upon which she sat. At this moment, a big dog bounded forward from the thicket, and another, and another. They barked loudly and ran backwards and forwards. In a few minutes, all the huntsmen were standing outside the cave, and the handsomest of them was the king of the country. He stepped up to Elise. Never had he seen so lovely a girl. How came you here, beautiful child? he said. Elise shook her head. She dare not speak. The salvation and the lives of her brother depended upon her silence. She hid her hands under her apron so that the king should not see what she suffered. Come with me, he said. You cannot stay here. 
if you are as good as you are beautiful, I will dress you in silks and velvets, put a golden crown upon your head, and you shall live with me and have your home in my richest palace. Then he lifted her upon his horse. She wept and wrung her hands, but the king said, I only think of your happiness. You will thank me one day for what I am doing. Then he darted across the mountains, holding her before him on his horse, and the huntsman followed. When the sun went down, the royal city with churches and cupolas lay before them, and the king led her into the palace, where great fountains played in the marble halls, and where walls and ceilings were adorned with paintings, but she had no eyes for them. She only wept and sorrowed. Passively, she allowed the women to dress her in royal robes, to twist pearls into her hair, and to draw gloves onto her blistered hands. She was dazzlingly lovely as she stood there, in all her magnificence. The courtiers bent low before her, and the king wooed her as his bride, although the archbishop shook his head and whispered that he feared the beautiful wood maiden was a witch, who had dazzled their eyes and infatuated the king. The king refused to listen to him. He ordered the music to play, the richest foods to be brought, and the loveliest girls to dance before her. She was led through scented gardens into gorgeous apartments, but nothing brought a smile to her lips or into her eyes. Sorrow sat there like a heritage and a possession for all time. Last of all, the king opened the door of a little chamber close by the room where she was to sleep. It was adorned with costly green carpets and was made to exactly resemble the cave where he found her. On the floor lay a bundle of flax she had spun from the nettles, and from the ceiling hung a shirt of mail which was already finished. One of the huntsmen had brought all of these things away as curiosities. Here you may dream that you are back in your former home, said the king. Here is the work upon which you were engaged. In the midst of your splendor, it may amuse you to think of those times. When Elise saw all these things so dear to her heart, a smile for the first time played upon her lips, and the blood rushed back into her cheeks. She thought of the deliverance of her brothers, and she kissed the king's hand. He pressed her to his heart and ordered all the church bells to ring marriage peals. The lovely dumb girl from the woods was to be queen of the country. The archbishop whispered evil words into the ear of the king, but they did not reach his heart. The wedding was to take place, and the archbishop himself had to put the crown upon her head. In his anger, he pressed the golden circlet so tightly upon her head as to give her pain. But a heavier circlet pressed upon her heart, her grief for her brothers. So she thought nothing of the bodily pain. Her lips were sealed. A single word from her mouth would cost her brothers their lives. But her eyes were full of love for the good and handsome king, who did everything he could to please her. Every day she grew more and more attached to him, and longed to confide in him, to tell him her sufferings. But dumb she must remain, and in silence must bring her labor to completion. Therefore, at night, she stole away from his side into her secret chamber, which was decorated like a cave, and here she knitted one shirt after another. When she came to the seventh, all her flax was worked up. She knew that these nettles, which she was to use, grew in the churchyard but she had to pluck them herself. How was she to get there? Oh, what is the pain in my fingers compared with the anguish of my heart, she thought. I must venture out. The good God will not desert me. With as much terror in her heart as if she was doing some evil deed, she stole down one night into the moonlit garden. 
and through the long alleys out into the silent streets, to the churchyard. There she saw, sitting on a gravestone, a group of hideous ghouls who took off their tattered garments as if they were about to bathe, and then they dug down into the freshly made graves with their skinny fingers and tore the flesh from the bodies and devoured it. Elise had to pass close by them, and they fixed their evil eyes upon her. But she said a prayer as she passed, picked the stinging nettles, and hurried back to the palace with them. Only one person saw her, but that was the archbishop, who watched while others slept. Surely now all his bad opinions of the queen were justified. All was not as it should be with her. She must be a witch, and therefore she had bewitched the king and all the people. He told the king in the confessional what he had seen and what he feared. When those bad words passed his lips, the pictures of the saints shook their heads as if to say, It is not so. Elise is innocent. The archbishop, however, took it differently, and thought that they were bearing witness against her and shaking their heads at her sin. Two big tears rolled down the king's cheeks, and he went home with doubt in his heart. He pretended to sleep at night, but no quiet sleep came to his eyes. He perceived how Elise got up and went to her private closet. Day by day, his face grew darker. Elise saw it, but could not imagine what was the cause of it. It alarmed her. And what was she not already suffering in her heart because of her brother's? Her salt tears ran down upon the royal purple velvet, and they lay upon it like sparkling diamonds, and all who saw their splendor wished to be queen. She had, however, almost reached the end of her labors. Only one shirt of mail was wanting, but again she had no more flax and not a single nettle was left. Once more, for the last time, she must go to the churchyard to pluck a few handfuls. She thought with dread of the solitary walk and the horrible ghouls. But her will was as strong as her trust in God. Elise went, but the king and the archbishop followed her. They saw her disappear within the grated gateway of the churchyard. When they followed, they saw the ghouls sitting on the gravestone, as Elise had seen them before. And the king turned away his head, because he thought she was among them, she whose head this very evening had rested on his breast. The people must judge her, he groaned, and the people judged. Let her be consumed in the glowing flames! She was led away from her beautiful royal apartments to the dark, damp dungeon where the wind whistled through the grated window. Instead of velvet and silk, they gave her the bundle of nettles she had gathered to lay her head upon. The hard, burning shirts of mail were to be her covering, but they could have given her nothing more precious. She set to work again, with many prayers to God. Outside her prison, the street boys sang derisive songs about her, and not a soul comfort her with a kind word. Towards evening, she heard the rustle of swan's wings close to her window. It was her youngest brother. At last he had found her. He sobbed aloud with joy, although he knew that the coming night might be her last. But then her work was almost done, and her brothers were there. The archbishop came to spend her last hours with her, as he had promised the king. She shook her head at him, and by looks and gestures begged him to leave her. She had only this night in which to finish her work, or else all would be wasted, all, her pain, tears, and sleepless nights. The archbishop went away with bitter words against her. But poor Elise knew that she was innocent. 
and went on with her work. The little mice ran about the floor, bringing nettles to her feet, so as to give what help they could. And a thrush sat on the grating of the window, where he sang all night as merrily as he could to keep up her courage. It was still only dawn, and the sun would not rise for an hour when the eleven brothers stood at the gate of the palace, begging to be taken to the king. This could not be done, was the answer, for it was still night. The king was asleep, and no one dared to wake him. All their entreaties and threats were useless. The watch turned out, and even the king himself came to see what was the matter. But just then, the sun rose, and no more brothers were to be seen. Only eleven wild swans hovering over the palace. The whole populace streamed out of the town gates. They were all anxious to see the witch burnt. A miserable horse drew the cart in which Elise was seated. They had put upon her a smock of green sacking, and all her beautiful long hair hung loose from the lovely head. Her cheeks were deathly pale, and her lips moved softly, while her fingers unceasingly twisted the green yarn. Even on the way to her death, she could not abandon her unfinished work. Ten shirts lay completed at her feet. She labored away at the eleventh, amid the scoffing insults of the populace. Look at that witch, how she mutters! She has never a book of psalms in her hands, no. There she sits with her loathsome sorcery. Tear it away from her into a thousand bits. The crowd pressed around her to destroy her work, but just then eleven white swans flew down and perched upon the cart, flapping their wings. The crowd gave way before them in terror. It is a sign from heaven. She is innocent, they whispered, but they dared not say it aloud. The executioner seized her by the hand, but she hastily threw the eleven shirts over the swans, who were immediately transformed into eleven handsome princes. But the youngest had a swan's wing in place of an arm, for one sleeve was wanting to his shirt of mail. She had not been able to finish it. Now I may speak. I am innocent. The populace who saw what had happened bowed down before her as if she had been a saint. But she sank lifeless into her brother's arms. So great had been the strain, the terror, and the suffering she had endured. Yes, innocent she is indeed, said the eldest brother and he told him all that had happened. Whilst he spoke, a wonderful fragrance spread around, as of millions of roses. Every faggot in the pile had taken root and shot out branches, and a great high hedge of red roses had arisen. At the very top was one pure white blossom. It shone like a star and the king broke it off and laid it on Elise's bosom, and she woke with joy and peace in her heart. All the church bells began to ring on their own accord, and the singing birds flocked around them. Surely such a bridal procession went back to the palace as no king had ever seen before. End of section 5《Section 6 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Ann Scott, Ontario, Canada Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Elf Hill Some lizards, 
were nimbly running in and out of the clefts in an old tree. They understood each other very well, for they all spoke lizard language. What a rumbling and grumbling is going on inside the old elf hill, said one of the lizards. I have not closed my eyes for the last two nights for the noise. I might just as well be having toothache for all the sleep I get. There is something up inside, said the other lizard. They propped up the top of the hill on four red posts till cockcrow this morning to air it out thoroughly and the elf maidens had been learning some new dancing steps, which they are always practicing. There certainly must be something going on. Yes, I was talking to an earthworm of my acquaintance about it, said the third lizard. He came straight up out of the hill where he had been boring into the earth for days and nights. He had heard a good deal, for the miserable creature can't see, but it can feel its way and plays the part of eavesdropper to perfection. They are expecting visitors in the Elf Hill. Grand visitors. But who they are, the earthworm refused to say. Or perhaps he did not know. All the will-o'-the-wisps are ordered for a procession of torches, as it is called, and the silver and gold plate, of which there is any amount in the hill, is all being polished up and put out in the moonlight. Ever can the strangers be, said all the lizards together. What on earth is happening? Hark! What a humming and buzzing! At this moment, the elf hill opened, and an elderly elf maiden tripped out. She was hollow behind, but otherwise quite attractively dressed. She was the old elf king's housekeeper, and a distant relative. She wore an amber heart upon her forehead. She moved her legs at a great pace. Trip, trip. Good heavens! How fast she tripped over the ground. She went right down to the night jar in the swamp. You are invited to the elf hill for tonight, said she to him. But will you be so kind as to charge yourself with the other invitations? You must make yourself useful in other ways, as you don't keep house yourselves. We are going to have some very distinguished visitors, goblins, who always have something to say, and so the old elf king means to show what he can do. Who is to be invited? asked the night jar. Well, everybody may come to the big ball, even human beings if they can only talk in their sleep, or do something else after our fashion. But the choice is to be strictly limited for the grand feast. We will only have the most distinguished people. I have had a battle with the Elf King about it, because I hold that we mustn't even include ghosts. The merman and his daughters must be invited first, I don't suppose they care much about coming on dry land, but I shall see that they each have a whetstone to sit on, or something better, so I expect they won't decline this time. All the old demons of the first class, with tails, the river god, and the wood sprites, and then I don't think we can pass over the grave pig, the hell horse, and the church grim, although they belong to the clergy who are not of our people, but that is merely on account of their office, and they are closely connected with us, and visit us very frequently. Croak, said the night jar, and he flew off to issue the invitations. The elf maidens had already begun to dance, and they danced a scarf dance, with scarves woven of mist and moonshine. These have a lovely effect to those who care for that kind of thing. The great hall in the middle of the elf hill had been thoroughly polished up for the occasion. The floor was washed with moonshine, and the walls were rubbed over with witch's fat, and this made them shine with many colors, like a tulip petal. The kitchen was full of frogs on spits, 
stuffed snakeskins and salads of toadstool spawn, mouse snouts, and hemlock. Then there was beer brewed by the marsh witch and sparkling saltpeter wine from the vaults. Everything of the best, and rusty nails and church window panes among the kickshaws. The old elf king had his golden crown polished with pounded slate pencil. Aye, and it was a head boy's slate pencil, too, and they are not so easy to get. They hung up fresh curtains in the bedroom and fixed them with the slime of snails. Yes, indeed, there was a humming and a buzzing. Now we will fumigate with horse hair and pig's bristles, and then I can do no more, said the old elf servant. Dear father, said the youngest of the daughters, are you not going to tell me who these grand strangers are? Well, well, he said, I suppose I must tell you now. Two of my daughters must prepare themselves to be married. Two will certainly make marriages. The old troll chieftain from Norway, that lives on the Dover field among his many rock castles and fastnesses and gold works, which are better than you would expect, is coming down here with his two sons. They are coming to look for wives. The old troll is a regular honest Norwegian veteran, straightforward and married. I used to know him in the olden days, when we drank to our good fellowship. He came here to fetch a wife, but she is dead now. She was a daughter of the king of the chalk cliffs at Mone. As the saying is, he took his wife on the chalk, biz, bought her on tick. I am quite anxious to see the old fellow. The sons, they say, are a pair of overgrown, ill-mannered cubs. But perhaps they are not so bad. I dare say they will improve as they grow older. See if you can't lick them into shape a bit. And when do they come? asked one of the daughters. That depends upon wind and weather, said the elf king. They travel economically, and they will take their chance of a ship. I wanted them to come round by Sweden. But the old fellow can't bring himself to that yet. He doesn't march with the times, but I don't hold with that. At this moment, two will-of-the-wisp came hopping along, one faster than the other, so of course one arrived before the other. They are coming! They are coming! they cried. Give me my crown, and let me stand in the moonlight, said the elf king. The daughters raised their scarves and curtsied to the ground. There stood the troll chieftain from the Dover field. He wore a crown of hardened icicles and polished fur cones, and besides this he had on a bearskin coat and snowshoes. His sons, on the other hand, had bare necks and wore no braces, because they were strong men. "'Is that a hill?' asked the youngest of the brothers, pointing to the elf hill. We should call it a hole in Norway. Lads, cried the old man, holes go inwards, hills go upwards. Haven't you got eyes in your heads? The only thing that astonished them, they said, was that they understood the language without any trouble. Don't make fools of yourselves, said the old man. One might think you were only half-baked. Then they went into the elf hill where the company was of the grandest, although they had been got together in such a hurry. You might almost say they had been blown together. It was all charming, and arranged to suit everyone's taste. The merman and his daughters sat at table in great tubs of water, and said it was just like being at home. Everybody had excellent table manners, except the two young Norwegian trolls. They put their feet up on the table, but then they thought anything they did was right. Take your feet out of the way of the dishes, said the old troll, and they obeyed him, but not at once. They tickled the ladies they took into dinner with fur cones out of their pockets. 
Then they pulled off their boots so as to be quite comfortable, and handed the boots to the ladies to hold. Their father, the old troll chieftain, was very different. He told no end of splendid stories about the proud Norwegian mountains and the waterfalls dashing down in white foam with a roar like thunder. He told them about the salmon leaping up against the rushing water when the Nixies played their golden harps. Then he went on to tell them about the sparkling winter nights when the sledge bells rang and the lads flew over the ice with blazing lights, the ice which was so transparent that you could see the startled fish darting away under your feet. Yes, indeed, he could tell stories. You could see and hear the things he described, the sawmills going, the men and maids singing their songs and dancing the merry hauling dance. Hussa! All at once the old troll gave the elf housekeeper a smacking kiss. Such a kiss it was. And yet they were not a bit related. Then the elf maidens had to dance. First plain dancing, and then step dancing, and it was most becoming to them. Then came a fancy dance. Preserve us! How nimble they were on their legs! You couldn't tell where they began or where they ended. You couldn't tell which were arms and which were legs. They were all mixed up together like shavings in a saw pit. They twirled round and round so often that it made the hill horse feel quite giddy and unwell, and he had to leave the table said the old troll there is some life in those legs but what else can they do besides dancing and pointing their toes in all those really gigs we will soon show you said the elf king and he called out his youngest daughter she was thin and transparent as moonshine and was the most ethereal of all the daughters she put a little white stick in her mouth and vanished instantly this was her accomplishment. But the troll said he did not like that accomplishment in a wife, nor did he think his boys would appreciate it. The second one could walk by her own side as if she had a shadow, and no elves have shadows. The third was quite different. She had studied in the Marsh Witch's Brewery and understood larding alder stumps with low worms. She will be a good housewife, said the troll, and then he saluted her with his eyes instead of drinking her health, for he did not want to drink too much. Now came the turn of the fourth. She had a big golden harp to play, and when she touched the first string, everybody lifted up their left legs, for all the elfin folk are left legged. But when she touched the second string, Everybody had to do what she wished. She is a dangerous woman, said the troll. But both his sons left the hill, for they were tired of it all. And what can the next daughter do? asked the old troll. I have learnt to like the Norwegians, she said, and I shall never marry unless I can go to Norway. But the smallest of the sisters whispered to the troll. That is only because she once heard a song which said that when the world came to an end, the rocks of Norway would still stand, and that is why she wants to go there. She was so afraid of being exterminated. Ha <laughs> ha, said the troll, so that slipped out. But what can the seventh do? Well, the sixth comes before the seventh, said the elf king, for he could reckon, but she would not come forward. I can only tell people the truth, she said. Nobody cares for me, and I have enough to do in making my winding sheet. Now came the seventh and last. What could she do? Well, she could tell stories as many as ever she liked. Here are my five fingers, said the old troll. Tell me a story for each one. The elf maiden took hold of his wrist and he chuckled and laughed till he nearly choked. When she came to the fourth finger, which had a gold ring on it, 
as if it knew there was to be a betrothal. The troll said, Hold fast what you have got. The hand is yours. I will have you for a wife myself. The elf maiden said that the stories about Guldbrand, the fourth finger, and little Peter Playman, the fifth, had not yet been told. Never mind. Keep those till winter. Then you shall tell us about the fir, and the birch, and the fairy gifts, and the tingling frost. You shall have every opportunity of telling us stories. Nobody up there does it yet. We will sit in the stone hall where the pine logs blaze, and drink mead out of the golden horns of the old Norwegian kings. The river god gave me a couple. When we sit there, the mountain sprite comes to pay us a visit, and he will sing you the songs of the satyr girls. The salmon will leap in the waterfalls and beat against the stone wall, but it won't get in. Ah, uh, you may believe me when I say that we lead a merry life there in good old Norway. But where are the lads? Yes, where were the lads? They were running about the fields, blowing out the will of the wisps, who came so willingly for the torchlight procession. Why do you gad about out there? said the troll. I have taken a mother for you. Now you can come and take one of the ants. But the lads said they would rather make a speech, and drink toast. They had no wish to marry. Then they made their speeches, and drank toast, and tipped their glasses up to show that they had emptied them. After that, they pulled off their coats and went to sleep on the table, to show that they were quite at home. But the old troll danced round and round the room with his young bride, and exchanged boots with her which was grander than exchanging rings. "'There is the cock crowing,' said the old housekeeper. "'Now we must shut the shutters, so that the sun may not burn us up.' Then the hill closed up, but the lizards went on running up and down the clefts of the tree, and they said to each other, "'Ah, how much I like the old troll!' "'I like the boys better,' said the earthworm. But then it couldn't see, poor, miserable creature that it was. End of Section 6 Recording by Barbara Ann Scott, Ontario, Canada Section 7 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Grebe. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas, The Real Princess. There was once a prince, and he wanted a princess, but then she must be a real princess. He travelled right round the world to find one, but there was always something wrong. There were plenty of princesses, but whether they were real princesses he had great difficulty in discovering. There was always something which was not quite right about them. So at last he had to come home again, and he was very sad, because he wanted a real princess so badly. One evening there was a terrible storm. It thundered and lightened, and the rain poured down in torrents. Indeed, it was a fearful night. In the middle of the storm somebody knocked at the town gate, and the old king himself went to open it. It was a princess who stood outside, but she was in a terrible state from the rain and the storm. The water streamed out of her hair and her clothes, it ran in at the top of her shoes and out at the heel, but she said that she was a real princess. "'Well, we shall soon see if that is true,' thought the old queen, but she said nothing. She went into the bedroom, took all the bedclothes off, and laid a pea on the bedstead. Then she took twenty mattresses and piled them on the top of the pea and then twenty feather-beds on the top of the mattresses. 
This was where the princess was to sleep that night. In the morning they asked her how she had slept. "'Oh, terribly badly,' said the princess. "'I have hardly closed my eyes the whole night. Heaven knows what was in the bed. I seem to be lying upon some hard thing, and my whole body is black and blue this morning. It is terrible!' They saw at once that she must be a real princess, when she had felt the pea through twenty mattresses and twenty feather beds. Nobody but a real princess could have such a delicate skin. So the prince took her to be his wife, for now he was sure that he had found a real princess, and the pea was put into the museum, where it may still be seen if no one has stolen it. Now this is a true story. End of section 7. Recording by Michelle Grebe. Section 8 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cal Taylor. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. A Picture from the Ramparts It is autumn, and we are standing on the ramparts around the citadel, looking at the ship sailing on the sound, and at the opposite coast of Sweden, which stands out clearly in the evening sunlight. Behind us the ramparts fall away steeply. Around are stately trees from which the golden leaves are falling fast. Down below us, we see some dark and gloomy buildings surrounded with wooden palisades, and inside these, where the sentries are walking up and down, it is darker still, yet not so gloomy as it is behind yon iron grating. That is where the worst convicts are confined. A ray from the setting sun falls into the bare room. The sun shines upon good and bad alike. The gloomy, savage prisoner looks bitterly at the chilly sunbeam. A little bird flutters against the grating. The bird sings to good and bad alike. It twitters softly for a little while, and remains perched, flutters its wings, picks a feather from its breast, and puffs its plumage up. The bad man in chain looks at it. A milder expression steals over his hideous face. A thought which is not quite clear to himself steals into his heart. It is related to the sunshine coming through the grating related to the scent of violets which in spring grow so thickly outside the window now is heard the music of a huntsman's horn clear and lively the bird flies away from the grating the sunbeam disappears and all is dark again in a narrow cell dark in the heart of the bad man yet the sun has shone into it and the bird has sung its song continue ye merry notes the evening is mild the sea is calm and bright as any mirror. End of section 8。section 9 of fairy tales from Hans Christian Andersen。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by Jessica Allen。fairy tales from Hans Christian Andersen。Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Red Shoes There was once a little girl. She was a tiny, delicate little thing, but she always had to go about barefoot in summer, because she was very poor. In winter she had only a pair of heavy wooden shoes, and her ankles were terribly chafed. An old mother shoemaker lived in the middle of the village, and she made a pair of little shoes out of some strips of red cloth. They were very clumsy, but they were made with the best intention, for the little girl was to have them. Her name, Karen. These shoes were given to her, and she wore them for the first time on the day her mother was buried. They were certainly not mourning, but she had no others, and so she walked bare-legged in them behind the poor deal coffin. Just then a big old carriage drove by, and a big old lady was seated in it. She looked at the little girl and felt very, very sorry for her, and said to the parson, "'Give the little girl to me, and I will look after her and be kind to her.' Karen thought it was all because of the red shoes, 
but the old lady said they were hideous and they were burnt. Karen was well and neatly dressed and had to learn reading and sewing. People said she was pretty, but her mirror said, You are more than pretty, you are lovely. At this time the Queen was taking a journey through the country, and she had her little daughter, the Princess, with her. The people, and among them Karen, crowded round the palace where they were staying to see them. The little princess stood at a window to show herself. She wore neither a train nor a golden crown, but she was dressed all in white with a beautiful pair of red Morocco shoes. They were indeed a contrast to those the poor old mother shoemaker had made for Karen. Nothing in the world could be compared to these red shoes. The time came when Karen was old enough to be confirmed. She had new clothes and she was also to have a pair of new shoes. The rich shoemaker in the town was to take the measure of her little foot. His shop was full of glass cases of the most charming shoes and shiny leather boots. They looked beautiful, but the old lady could not see very well, so it gave her no pleasure to look at them. Among all the other shoes there was one pair of red shoes like those worn by the princess. Oh, how pretty they were! The shoemaker told them that they had been made for an earl's daughter, but they had not fitted. "'I suppose they are patent leather,' said the old lady. "'They are so shiny.' "'Yes, they do shine,' said Karen, who tried them on. They fitted and were bought. But the old lady had not the least idea that they were red, or she would never have allowed Karen to wear them for her confirmation. This she did, however. Everybody looked at her feet, and when she walked up the church to the chancel, she thought that even the old pictures, those portraits of dead and gone priests and their wives— with stiff collars and long black clothes, fixed their eyes upon her shoes. She thought of nothing else when the priest laid his hand upon her head and spoke to her of holy baptism, the covenant of God, and that from henceforth she was to be a responsible Christian person. The solemn notes of the organ resounded, the children sang with their sweet voices, the old precentor sang, but Karen only thought about her red shoes. By the afternoon, the old lady had been told on all sides that the shoes were red, and she said it was very naughty and most improper. For the future, whenever Karen went to the church, she was to wear black shoes, even if they were old. Next Sunday, there was Holy Communion, and Karen was to receive it for the first time. She looked at the black shoes and then at the red ones. Then she looked again at the red, and at last put them on. It was beautiful, sunny weather, Karen and the old lady went by the path through the cornfield, and it was rather dusty. By the church door stood an old soldier with a crutch. He had a curious long beard. It was more red than white. In fact, it was almost quite red. He bent down to the ground and asked the old lady if he might dust her shoes. Karen put out her little foot too. "'See, what beautiful dancing shoes,' said the soldier. "'Mind you stick fast when you dance.' and as he spoke, he struck the soles with his hand. The old lady gave the soldier a copper and went into the church with Karen. All the people in the church looked at Karen's red shoes, and all the portraits looked too. When Karen knelt at the altar rails and the chalice was put to her lips, she only thought of the red shoes. She seemed to see them floating before her eyes. She forgot to join in the hymn of praise, and she forgot to say the Lord's Prayer. Now everybody left the church, and the old lady got into her carriage. Karen lifted her foot to get in after her, but just then the old soldier who was still standing there said, See, what pretty dancing shoes! Karen couldn't help it. She took a few dancing steps, and when she began her feet continued to dance. It was just as if the shoes had power over them. She danced right around the church. She couldn't stop. The coachman had to run after her and take hold of her and lift her into the carriage, but her feet continued to dance, so that she kicked the poor lady horribly. At last they got the shoes off, and her feet had a little rest. When they got home, the shoes were put away in a cupboard, but Karen could not help going to look at them. The old lady became very ill. They said she could not live. She had to be carefully nursed and tended, and no one was nearer than Karen to do this. But there was to be a grand ball in the town, and Karen was invited. She looked at the old lady, who after all could not live. She looked at the red shoes. She thought there was no harm in doing so. She put on the red shoes, even that she might do. But then she went to the ball and began to dance. The shoes would not let her do what she liked. 
When she wanted to go to the right, they danced to the left. When she wanted to dance up the room, the shoes danced down the room, then down the stairs, through the streets, and out of the town gate. Away she danced, and away she had to dance, right away into the dark forest. Something shone up above the trees, and she thought it was the moon, for it was a face, but it was the old soldier with the red beard, and he nodded and said, See, what pretty dancing shoes. This frightened her terribly, and she wanted to throw off the red shoes, but they stuck fast. She tore off her stockings, but the shoes had grown fast to her feet, and off she danced, and off she had to dance, over fields and meadows, in rain and sunshine, by day and by night. But at night it was fearful. She danced into the open churchyard, but the dead did not join her dance. They had something much better to do. She wanted to sit down on a pauper's grave where the bitter wormwood grew, but there was no rest nor repose for her. When she danced towards the open church door, she saw an angel standing there in long white robes and wings which reached from his shoulders to the ground. His face was grave and stern, and in his hand he held a broad and shining sword. "'Dance you shall,' said he. "'You shall dance in your red shoes till you are pale and cold, till your skin shrivels up and you are a skeleton. You shall dance from door to door, and wherever you find proud, vain children, you must knock at the door so that they may see you and fear you. Yea, you shall dance. Mercy! shrieked Karen, but she did not hear the angel's answer, for the shoes bore her through the gate into the fields over roadways and paths. Ever and ever she was forced to dance. One morning she danced past a door she knew well. She heard the sound of a hymn from within, and a coffin covered with flowers was being carried out. Then she knew that the old lady was dead, and it seemed to her that she was forsaken by all the world and cursed by the holy angels of God. On and ever on she danced, danced she must even through the dark nights. The shoes bore her away over briars and stubble till her feet were torn and bleeding. She danced away over the heath till she came to a little lonely house. She knew the executioner lived here, and she tapped with her fingers on the window pane and said, Come out, come out! I can't come in, for I am dancing. The executioner said, You can't know who I am. I chop the bad people's heads off, and I see that my axe is quivering. Don't chop my head off, said Karen, for then I can never repent of my sins. But pray, pray, chop my feet off with the red shoes. Then she confessed all her sins, and the executioner chopped off her feet with the red shoes, but the shoes danced right away with the little feet into the depths of the forest. Then he made her a pair of wooden legs and crutches, and he taught her a psalm, the one penitents always sing. And she kissed the hand which had wielded the axe, and went away over the heath. "'I have suffered enough for those red shoes,' said she. "'I will go to church now so that they may see me.' And she went as fast as she could to the church door. When she got there, the red shoes danced up in front of her, and she was frightened and went home again. She was very sad all the week and shed many bitter tears, but when Sunday came she said, Now then, I have suffered and struggled long enough. I should think I am quite as good as many who sit holding their heads so high in church. She went along quite boldly, but she did not get further than the gate before she saw the red shoes dancing in front of her. She was more frightened than ever and turned back, this time with real repentance in her heart. Then she went to the parson's house and begged to be taken into service. She would be very industrious and work as hard as she could. She didn't care what wages they gave her, if only she might have a roof over her head and live among kind people. The parson's wife was sorry for her and took her into her service. She proved to be very industrious and thoughtful. She sat very still and listened most attentively in the evening when the parson read the Bible. All the little ones were very fond of her, but when they chatted about finery and dress, and about being as beautiful as a queen, she would shake her head. Next Sunday they all went to church, and they asked her if she would go with them, but she looked sadly with tears in her eyes at her crutches, and they went without her to hear the word of God, and she sat in her little room alone. It was only big enough for a bed and a chair. She sat there with her prayer book in her hand, and as she read it with a humble mind... She heard the notes of the organ, borne from the church by the wind. She raised her tear-stained face and said, Oh, God, help me. 
Then the sun shone brightly round her, and the angel in the white robes whom she had seen on yonder night at the church door stood before her. He no longer held the sharp sword in his hand, but a beautiful green branch covered with roses. He touched the ceiling with it, and it rose to a great height, and wherever he touched it a golden star appeared. Then he touched the walls, and they spread themselves out, and she saw and heard the organ. She saw the pictures of the old parsons and their wives. The congregation were all sitting in their seats, singing aloud, for the church itself had come home to the poor girl in her narrow little chamber, or else she had been taken to it. She found herself on the bench with the other people from the parsonage, and when the hymn had come to an end they looked up and nodded to her and said, "'It was a good thing you came after all, little Karen.' It was through God's mercy, she said. The organ sounded, and the children's voices echoed so sweetly through the choir. The warm sunshine streamed brightly in through the window, right up to the bench where Karen sat. Her heart was so overfilled with the sunshine, with peace and with joy, that it broke. Her soul flew with the sunshine to heaven, and no one there asked about the red shoes. End of section 9「Section 10 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Sounds. Boston. Sarah Sounds Communications.com. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Thumbelisa There was once a woman who had the greatest longing for a little tiny child, but she had no idea where to get one. So she went to an old witch and said to her, I do so long to have a little child. Will you tell me where I can get one? Oh, we shall be able to manage that, said the witch. Here is a barley corn for you. It is not at all the same kind as that which grows in the peasant's field or with which chickens are fed. Plant it in a flower pot and you will see what will appear. Thank you, oh, thank you, said the woman. And she gave the witch twelve pennies then went home and planted the barley corn, and a large, handsome flower sprang up at once. It looked exactly like a tulip, but the petals were tightly shut up, just as if they were still in bud. That is a lovely flower, said the woman, and she kissed the pretty red and yellow petals. As she kissed it, the flower burst open with a loud snap. It was a real tulip. You can see that, but right in the middle of the flower, on the green stool, sat a little tiny girl, most lovely and delicate. She was not more than an inch in height, so she was called Thumbelisa. Her cradle was a smartly varnished walnut shell, with the blue petals of violets for a mattress and a rose leaf to cover her. She slept in it at night, but during the day, she played about on the table where the woman had placed a plate surrounded by a wreath of flowers on the outer edge with their stalks in water. A large tulip petal floated on the water, and on this little Thumbelisa sat and sailed about from one side of the plate to the other. She had two white horsehairs for oars. It was a pretty sight. She could sing, too, with such delicacy and charm as was never heard before. One night, as she lay in her pretty bed, a great ugly toad hopped in at the window, for there was a broken pane. Ugh, how hideous that great wet toad was! It hopped right down on the table where Thumbelisa lay fast asleep under the red rose leaf. Here! is a lovely wife for my son, said the toad, and then she took up the walnut shell where Thumbelisa slept and hopped away with it through the window down into the garden. 
A great broad stream ran through it, but just at the edge it was swampy and muddy, and it was here that the toad lived with her son. Ugh! How ugly and hideous he was, too, exactly like his mother. Quax! Quax! Brick-tick-tick-tick! That was all he had to say when he saw the lovely little girl in the walnut shell. Do not talk so loud, or you will wake her, said the old toad. She might escape us yet, for she is as light as thistledown. We will put her on one of the broad water lily leaves out in the stream. It will be just like an island to her. She is so small and light. She won't be able to run away from there while we get the state room ready down under the mud, which you are to inhabit. A great many water lilies grew in the stream. Their broad green leaves looked as if they were floating on the surface of the water. The leaf, which was furthest from the shore, was also the biggest. And to this one, the old toad swam out with the walnut shell in which little Thumbelisa lay. The poor tiny creature woke up quite early in the morning, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry most bitterly, for there was water on every side of the big green leaf, and she could not reach the land at any point. The old toad sat in the mud, decking out her abode with grasses and the buds of the yellow water lilies, so as to have it very nice for her new daughter-in-law. And then she swam out with her ugly son, to the leaf where Thumbelisa stood. They wanted to fetch her pretty bed to place it in the bridal chamber before they took her there. The old toad made a deep curtsy in the water before her and said, Here is my son, who is to be your husband, and you are to live together most comfortably down in the mud. Coax, coax, brick was all the son could say. Then, they took the pretty little bed and swam away with it. But Thumbelisa sat quite alone on the green leaf and cried because she did not want to live with the ugly toad or have her horrid son for a husband. The little fish, which swam about in the water, had no doubt seen the toad and heard what she said. So they stuck their heads up, wishing, I suppose, to see the little girl. As soon as they saw her, they were delighted with her and were quite grieved to think that she was to go down to live with the ugly toad. No, that should never happen. They flocked together down in the water, round about the green stem which held the leaf she stood upon, and gnawed at it with their teeth, till it floated away down the stream, carrying Thumbelisa away where the toad could not follow her. Thumbelisa sailed past place after place, and the little birds in the bushes saw her and sang, What a lovely little maid! The leaf, with her on it, floated further and further away, and in this manner reached foreign lands. A pretty little white butterfly fluttered round and round her for some time, and at last settled on the leaf, for it had taken quite a fancy to Thumbelisa. She was so happy now, because the toad could not reach her and she was sailing through such lovely scenes. The sun shone on the water and it looked like liquid gold. Then she took her sash and tied one end round the butterfly and the other she made fast to the leaf which went gliding on quicker and quicker and she with it, for she was standing on the leaf. At this moment, a big cockchafer came flying along he caught sight of her, and in an instant, he fixed his claw round her slender waist and flew off with her up into a tree. But the green leaf floated down the stream, and the butterfly with it, for he was tied to it and could not get loose. Heavens, how frightened poor little Thumbelisa was when the cockchafer carried her up into the tree, but she was most of all grieved about the pretty white butterfly which she had fastened to the leaf. If he could not succeed in getting loose, he would be starved to death. But the cockchafer cared nothing for that. He settled with her on the largest leaf on the tree and fed her with honey from the flowers. And he said 
that she was lovely, although she was not a bit like a chafer. Presently, all the other chafers which lived in the tree came to visit them. They looked at Thumbelisa, and the young lady chafers twitched their feelers and said, She has also got two legs. What a good effect it has. She has no feelers, said another. She is so slender in the waist. Fie, she looks like a human being. How ugly she is, said all the mother chafers, and yet little Thumbelisa was so pretty. That was certainly also the opinion of the cockchafer who had captured her. But when all the others said she was ugly, he at last began to believe it too, and would not have anything more to do with her. She might go wherever she liked. They flew down from the tree with her and placed her on a daisy, where she cried because she was so ugly that the chafers would have nothing to do with her. And after all, she was more beautiful than anything you could imagine, as delicate and transparent as the finest rose leaf. Poor little Thumbelisa lived all the summer quite alone in the wood. She plaited a bed of grass for herself and hung it up under a big dock leaf which sheltered her from the rain. She sucked the honey from the flowers for her food, and her drink was the dew which lay on the leaves in the morning. In this way, the summer and autumn passed, but then came the winter. All the birds which used to swing so sweetly to her flew away. The great dock leaf under which she had lived shriveled up, leaving nothing but a dead yellow stalk, and she shivered with the cold, for her clothes were worn out. She was such a tiny creature. Poor little Thumbelisa. She certainly must be frozen to death. It began to snow, and every snowflake which fell upon her was like a whole shovelful upon one of us. For we are big, and she was only one inch in height. Then she wrapped herself up in a withered leaf, but that did not warm her much. She trembled with the cold. Close to the wood in which she had been living lay a large cornfield, but the corn had long ago been carried away and nothing remained but the bare, dry stubble which stood up out of the frozen ground. The stubble was quite a forest for her to walk about in. Oh, how she shook with the cold! Then she came to the door of a field mouse's home. It was a little hole down under the stubble, the field mouse lived so cozily and warm there. Her whole room was full of corn, and she had a beautiful kitchen and larder besides. Poor Thumbelisa stood just inside the door like any other poor beggar child and begged for a little piece of barley corn, for she had had nothing to eat for two whole days. You poor little thing, said the field mouse, for she was, at bottom, a good old field mouse. Come into my warm room and dine with me. Then, as she took a fancy to Thumbelisa, she said, You may, with pleasure, stay with me for the winter, but you must keep my room clean and tidy and tell me stories, for I am very fond of them. And Thumbelisa did what the good old field mouse desired, and was on the whole very comfortable. Now we shall soon have a visitor said the field mouse. My neighbor generally comes to see me every weekday. He is even better housed than I am. His rooms are very large, and he wears a most beautiful black velvet coat. If only you could get him for a husband, you would indeed be well settled. But he can't see. You must tell him all the most beautiful stories you know. But Thumbelisa did not like this and she would have nothing to say to the neighbor, for he was a mole. He came and paid a visit in his black velvet coat. He was very rich and wise, said the field mouse, and his home was twenty times as large as hers, and he had much learning, but he did not like the sun or the beautiful flowers. In fact, he spoke slightingly of them, for he had never seen them. Thumbelisa had to sing to him, and she sang both Fly away, cockchafer, and a monk he wandered through the meadow. And then the mole fell in love with her because of her sweet voice. But he did not say anything, for he was of a discreet turn of mind. 
He had just made a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs, and he gave the field mouse and Thumbelisa leave to walk in it whenever they liked. He told them not to be afraid of the dead bird which was lying in the passage. It was a whole bird with feathers and beak which had probably died quite recently at the beginning of the winter, and was now entombed just where he had made his tunnel. The mole took a piece of tinder wood in his mouth, for that shines like fire in the dark, and walked in front of them to light them in the long dark passage. When they came to the place where the dead bird lay, the mole thrust his broad nose up to the roof and pushed the earth up so as to make a big hole through which the daylight shone. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, with its pretty wings closely pressed to its sides, and the legs and head drawn in under the feathers. No doubt the poor bird had died of cold. Thumbelisa was so sorry for it. She loved all the little birds, for they had twittered and sung so sweetly to her during the whole summer. But the mole kicked it with his short legs and said, Now it will pipe no more. It must be a miserable fate to be born a little bird. Thank heaven no child of mine can be a bird. A bird like that has nothing but its twitter and dies of hunger in the winter. Yes, a sensible man, you may well say that, said the field mouse. What has a bird for all its twittering when the cold weather comes? It has to hunger and freeze, but then it must cut a dash. Thumbelisa did not say anything, but when the others turned their backs to the bird, she stooped down and stroked aside the feathers which lay over its head and kissed its closed eyes. Perhaps... It was this very bird which sang so sweetly to me in the summer, she thought. What pleasure it gave me, the dear, pretty bird. The mole now closed up the hole which led in the daylight and conducted the ladies to their home. Thumbelisa could not sleep at all in the night, so she had got up out of her bed and plaited a large, handsome mat of hay, and then... She carried it down and spread it all over the dead bird, and laid some soft cotton wool, which she had found in the field mouse's room close round its sides, so that it might have a warm bed on the cold ground. Goodbye, you sweet little bird, said she. Goodbye, and thank you for your sweet song through the summer when all the trees were green and the sun shone warmly upon us. Then she laid her head close up to the bird's breast, but was quite startled at a sound, as if something was thumping inside it. It was the bird's heart. It was not dead, but lay in a swoon, and now that it had been warmed, it began to revive. In the autumn, all the swallows fly away to warm countries, but if one happens to be belated, feels the cold so much that it falls down like a dead thing, and remains lying where it falls till the snow covers it up, Thumbelisa quite shook with fright, for the bird was very, very big beside her, who was only one inch high. But she gathered up her courage, packed the wool closer round the poor bird, and fetched a leaf of mint, which she had herself for a coverlet, and laid it over the bird's head. The next night she stole down again to it and found it alive, but so feeble that it could only just open its eyes for a moment to look at Thumbelisa, who stood with a bit of tinderwood in her hand, for she had no other lantern. "'Many, many thanks, you sweet child,' said the sick swallow to her. "'You have warmed me beautifully.' I shall soon have strength to fly out into the warm sun again. Oh, said she, it is so cold outside. It snows and freezes. Stay in your warm bed. I will tend you. Then she brought water to the swallow in a leaf, and when it had drunk some, it told her how it had torn its wing on a blackthorn bush, and therefore could not fly as fast as the other swallows which were taking flight then for the distant warm lands. At last it fell down on the ground, but after that it remembered nothing, 
and did not in the least know how it had got into the tunnel. It stayed there all the winter, and Thumbelisa was good to it and grew very fond of it. She did not tell either the mole or the field mouse anything about it, for they did not like the poor unfortunate swallow. As soon as the spring came and the warmth of the sun penetrated the ground, the swallow said goodbye to Thumbelisa, who opened the hole which the mole had made above. The sun streamed in deliciously upon them, and the swallow asked if she would not go with him. She could sit upon his back, and they would fly far away into the green wood. But Thumbelisa knew that it would grieve the old field mouse if she left her like that. No, I can't, said Thumbelisa. Goodbye, goodbye then, you kind, pretty girl, said the swallow, and flew out into the sunshine. Thumbelisa looked after him, and her eyes filled with tears, for she was very fond of the poor swallow. Tweet, tweet, sang the bird, and flew into the green wood. Thumbelisa was very sad. She was not allowed to go into the warm sunshine at all. The corn, which was sown in the field near the field mouse's house, grew quite long. It was a thick forest for the poor little girl, who was only an inch high. "'You must work at your trousseau this summer,' said the mouse to her, for their neighbor, the tiresome mole in his black velvet coat, had asked her to marry him. "'You shall have both woolen and linen. You shall have wherewith to clothe and cover yourself when you become the mole's wife.' Thumbelisa had to turn to the distaff, and the field mouse hired four spiders to spin and weave day and night. The mole paid a visit every evening, and he was always saying that when the summer came to an end, the sun would not shine nearly so warmly. Now it burnt the ground as hard as a stone. Yes, when the summer was over, he would celebrate his marriage. But Thumbelisa was not at all pleased for she did not care a bit for the tiresome mole. Every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, she used to steal out to the door, and when the wind blew aside the tops of the cornstalks so that she could see the blue sky, she thought how bright and lovely it was out there and wished so much to see the dear swallow again. But it never came back. No doubt it was a long way off, flying about in the beautiful green woods. When the autumn came, all Thumbelisa's outfit was ready. In four weeks you must be married, said the field mouse to her. But Thumbelisa cried and said she would not have the tiresome mole for a husband. Fiddle-dee-dee, said the field mouse. Don't be obstinate or I shall bite you with my white tooth. You are going to have a splendid husband. The queen herself hasn't the equal of his black velvet coat. Both his kitchen and cellar are full. You should thank heaven for such a husband. So they were to be married. The mole had come to fetch Thumbelisa. She was to live deep down under the ground with him and never to go out into the warm sunshine, for he could not bear it. The poor child was very sad at the thought of bidding goodbye to the beautiful sun. While she had been with the field mouse, she had at least been allowed to look at it from the door. Goodbye, you bright sun, she said, as she stretched out her arms towards it and went a little way outside the field mouse's house, for now the harvest was over, and only the stubble remained. Goodbye, goodbye, she said and threw her tiny arms round a little red flower growing there. Give my love to the dear swallow if you happen to see him. Tweet, tweet, she heard at this moment above her head. She looked up. It was the swallow just passing. As soon as it saw Thumbelisa, it was delighted. She told it how unwilling she was to have the ugly mole for a husband, and that she was to live deep down underground, where the sun never shone. She could not help crying about it. The cold winter is coming, said the swallow, and I am going to fly away to warm countries. Will you go with me? You can sit upon my back. 
Tie yourself on with your sash. Then we will fly away from the ugly mole and his dark cavern. Far away over the mountains to those warm countries where the sun shines with greater splendor than here. Where it is always summer and there are heaps of flowers. Do fly with me. You sweet little Thumbelisa, who saved my life when I lay frozen in the dark, earthy passage. Yes, I will go with you, said Thumbelisa, seating herself on the bird's back with her feet on its outspread wing. She tied her band tightly to one of the strongest feathers, and then the swallow flew away. High up in the air above forests and lakes, high up above the biggest mountains where the snow never melts. And Thumbelisa shivered in the cold air, but then she crept under the bird's warm feathers and only stuck out her little head to look at the beautiful sights beneath her. Then at last they reached the warm countries. The sun shone with a warmer glow than here. The sky was twice as high, and the most beautiful green and blue grapes grew in clusters on the banks and hedgerows. Oranges and lemons hung in the woods, which were fragrant with myrtles and sweet herbs, and the beautiful children ran about the roads, playing with the large, gorgeously colored butterflies. But the swallow flew on and on, and the country grew more and more beautiful. Under magnificent green trees on the shores of the Blue Sea stood a dazzling white marble palace of ancient date. Vines wreathed themselves round the stately pillars. At the head of these there were countless nests, and the swallow who carried Thumbelisa lived in one of them. "'Here is my house,' said the swallow. But if you will choose one of the gorgeous flowers growing down there, I will place you in it, and you will live as happily as you can wish. That would be delightful, she said, and clapped her little hands. A great white marble column had fallen to the ground and lay there broken in three pieces, but between these the most lovely white flowers grew. The swallow flew down with Thumbelisa and put her upon one of the broad leaves. What was her astonishment to find a little man in the middle of the flower, as bright and transparent as if he had been made of glass? He had a lovely golden crown upon his head and the most beautiful bright wings upon his shoulders. He was no bigger than Thumbelisa. He was the angel of the flowers. There was a similar little man or woman in every flower, but he was the king of them all. Heavens, how beautiful he is, whispered Thumbelisa to the swallow. The little prince was quite frightened by the swallow, for it was a perfect giant of a bird to him, he who was so small and delicate. But when he saw Thumbelisa, he was delighted. She was the very prettiest girl he had ever seen. He therefore took the golden crown off his own head and placed it on hers and asked her name and if she would be his wife, and then she would be queen of the flowers. Yes, he was certainly a very different kind of husband from the toad's son or the mole with his black velvet coat. So she accepted the beautiful prince, and out of every flower stepped a little lady or a gentleman so lovely that it was a pleasure to look at them. Each one brought a gift to Thumbelisa, but the best of all was a pair of pretty wings from a large white fly. They were fastened onto her back, and then she too could fly from flower to flower. All was then delight and happiness, but the swallow sat alone in his nest and sang to them as well as he could, for his heart was heavy. He was so fond of Thumbelisa himself and would have wished never to part from her. You shall not be called Thumbelisa, said the angel of the flower to her. That is such an ugly name and you are so pretty. 
we will call you May. Goodbye, goodbye, said the swallow, and flew away again from the warm countries, far away back to Denmark. There he had a little nest above the window, where the man lived who wrote this story, and he sang his tweet-tweet to the man, and so we have the whole story. End of section 10. Recording by Sarah Sounds, Boston. SarahSoundsCommunications.com Section 11 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Goblin and the Huckster. There was once a real student who lived in an attic and possessed nothing at all. There was also a real huckster who lived on the ground floor and owned the whole house. The goblin made friends with him, for every Christmas he was given a plateful of porridge and a lump of butter in it. The huckster could very well afford this, so the goblin stayed in the shop, which was a very instructive place. One evening the student came in by the back door to buy himself some candles and cheese. He had no one to send, so he went himself. He got what he asked for and paid for it, and the huckster nodded to him and said good evening to him, and his wife did the same. She was a woman who could do more than nod. She had the gift of gab. The student returned the nod and then remained standing, buried in something he found printed on the paper in which the cheese was wrapped. It was a page torn out of an old book, which ought never to have been torn up at all. It was an old book of poetry. "'There's more of it lying there,' said the huckster. "'I gave a few coffee beans to an old woman for it. If you'll give me two pence, you may have the rest of it.' "'Thank you,' said the student. "'Let me have it instead of the cheese. I can eat plain bread and butter just as well. It'd be a sin if the whole of that book were to be torn to bits. You are a capital fellow and a practical man, but you know no more about poetry than that tub.' Now, this was a very rude speech, especially to the tub. But the huckster laughed. Of course it was said as a kind of joke. But the goblin was much annoyed that anyone dared to say such a thing to a huckster who was a landlord and who sold the best butter. At night, when the shop was shut and everybody in bed except the student, the goblin went in and stole the good wife's long tongue, which she had no use for when she was asleep. On whatever object in the room he laid this article, it conferred the power of speech. And whatever the object, it became able to express its thoughts and feelings as glibly as the good wife herself. But only one could have it at a time, and this was a very good thing, or they would all have been talking at once. The goblin laid the tongue down upon the tub which contained the old newspapers. Is it really true? asked he, that you do not know what poetry is. Of course I know, said the tub. It is the kind of stuff which is printed at the foot of the newspaper columns and is sometimes cut out. I imagine that I have more of it within me than the student has, and after all, I am only a poor tub compared to the huckster. Then the goblin put the tongue upon the coffee mill, and what a pace it went at! He also put it on the butter cask and the cash box. They were all of the same opinions as the tub, and what the majority agree upon must be respected. "'Now the student shall have it,' said the goblin, and he stole silently up the back stairs to the attic where the student lived. There was a light burning, and the goblin peeped through the keyhole and saw that the student was reading the tattered book from downstairs. But how bright the room was! A clear ray of light shot forth from the book, which widened out to a stem, and then to a mighty tree, which rose and spread its branches right over the student. The leaves were delightfully fresh, and every flower was like a lovely girl's face. 
some with dark and sparkling eyes, while others were wonderfully blue and clear. Every fruit was a shining star, and the air was filled with music. No, the little goblin had never imagined, much less seen or taken part in such splendors. So then he stood on tiptoe, peeping and peeping, till the light was put out. The student blew out his lamp and went to bed, but the little goblin remained by the door, for the sweet songs still echoed through the air, making a charming lullaby for the student who was taking his rest. "'This is splendid,' said the goblin. "'I hadn't expected anything of the kind. I think I'll stay with the student.' And he thought, and thought again. And then he sighed. But the student has no porridge. Then he went away. Yes, he went back to the huckster, and it was a good thing he went, for the tub had almost used up the good wife's volubility. He had given a description of all he contained from one side, and now he was just about to turn himself over to repeat the same from the other side, when the goblin came and took away the lady's tongue to return to her. But the whole shop, from the cash drawer to the firewood, took their opinions from the tub from that time, and they respected it so highly and confided in it to such a degree that when the huckster afterwards read the art and theatrical announcements in his times, the evening one, they all thought that they came from the tub. But the little goblin no longer sat quietly listening to all the wisdom and learning downstairs. No, as soon as a light appeared in the attic, it had the same effect upon him as if the rays of light had been stout anchor hawsers, for they drew him upwards and forced him to go and peep through the keyhole. A mighty power surged around him, such as we feel when the Almighty moves over the face of the rolling waters in a storm, and he burst into tears. He did not himself know wherefore, but there was something soothing in these tears. How splendid it must be to sit with the student under that tree, the tree of knowledge. But that might not be. He was glad even to stand at the keyhole. He still came to peep through the keyhole when the autumn winds blew down upon it from the trap door. It was cold, very cold, but the little creature did not feel it till the light went out in the attic and the sounds died away on the wind. Then how he shivered. He crept down again to his cozy corner. It was warm and comfortable there. And when the Christmas porridge appeared with a lump of butter in it, why then the huckster was master. But in the middle of the night, the goblin was roused up by a frightful uproar and banging on the window shutters. The people outside were thundering on them. The watchman was blowing his whistle. There was a great fire. The whole street was lighted up. Was it in this house or the next? Where? It was terrible. The huckster's wife was so upset that she took the gold earrings out of her ears and put them into her pocket so as at least to save something. The huckster ran to look for his bonds and the maidservant for the silk mantle she had just managed to afford herself. Everybody wanted to save the most precious thing he had, and the goblin wanted to do the same. So with a hop and a skip, he was up the stairs and into the student's room. The student stood calmly at the window looking at the fire which was in the opposite house. The little goblin seized the marvelous book which was lying on the table, stuffed it into his cap, and held it with both his hands. The greatest treasure in the house was saved. Then he rushed away, right out onto the roof, to the very top of the chimney, and there he sat lighted up by the blaze opposite. He still held his red cap, tightly grasped with both hands, in which the treasure was hidden. Now he knew the leaning of his heart, and to whom he really belonged. But when the fire was out, and he thought the matter over, why then? I will divide myself between them, he said. I can't give up the hugster because of the porridge. In this he was quite human. We others go to the huckster, too, for the porridge. 
End of section 11. Section number 12 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lewis. The Bottleneck Down in a narrow, crooked street among other poverty-stricken houses stood a very high and narrow one, built of lath and plaster. It was in a very bad state and bulged out in every direction. It was entirely inhabited by poor people, but the attic looked the poorest of all. Outside the window in the sunshine hung a battered bird cage, which had not even got a proper drinking glass, but only the neck of a bottle turned upside down with a cork at the bottom to serve this purpose. An old maid stood at the window. She had just been hanging chickweed all over the cage in which a little linnet hopped about from perch to perch, singing as gaily as possible. Ah, you may well sing, said the bottleneck. But of course it did not say it as we should say it, for a bottleneck cannot talk, but it thought it within itself, much as when we inwardly talk to ourselves. Yes, you may well sing, you who have all your limbs whole. You should try what it is like to have lost the lower part of your body like me, and only to have a neck and a mouth, and that with a cork in it, such as I have, and you wouldn't sing much. I have nothing to make me sing, nor could I if I would. But it is a good thing that somebody is pleased. I could have sung when I was a whole bottle and anyone rubbed me with a cork. I used to be called the real lark then, the big lark. And then I went to the picnic in the wood with a furrier and his family, and his daughter was engaged. Yes, I remember it as well as if it had been yesterday. I have no end of experiences when I begin to look back upon them. I have been through fire and water and down into the black earth and higher up than most people, and now I hang in the sunshine outside a birdcage. It might be worthwhile to listen to my story, but I don't speak very loud about it, or I can't. Then it related within itself, or thought out its story inwardly. It was a curious enough story. The little bird twittered away happily enough, and down in the street people walked and drove as usual, all bent upon their own concerns, thinking about them or about nothing at all, but not so the bottleneck. It recalled the glowing, smelting furnace in the factory where it had been blown into life. It still remembered feeling quite warm and gazing longingly into the roaring furnace, its birthplace, and its great desire to leap back again into it. But little by little, as it cooled, it began to feel quite comfortable where it was. It was standing in a row with a whole regiment of brothers and sisters, all from the same furnace, but some were blown into champagne bottles and others into beer bottles, which makes all the difference in their afterlife. Later, when out in the world, a beer bottle may certainly contain the costliest lacrime Christi, and a champagne bottle may be filled with blacking, but what one is born to may be seen in the structure. Nobility is nobility, even if it has black blood in its veins. All the bottles were soon packed up and our bottle with them. It never dreamt then of ending its days as a bottleneck serving as a drinking glass for a bird, but after all, that is an honorable position, so one is something after all. It first saw the light again when with its other companions it was unpacked in the wine merchant's cellar. Its first rinsing was a peculiar experience. Then it lay empty and corkless and felt curiously flat. It missed something, but did not know exactly what it was. Next, it was filled with some good strong wine, was corked and sealed, and last of all, it was labeled outside first quality. This was just as if it had passed first class in an examination, but of course the wine was really good, and so was the bottle. While one is young, one is a poet. 
something within it sang and rejoiced, something which it really knew nothing at all about. Green sunlit slopes where the vine grew, merry girls and jovial youths singing and kissing each other. Ah, life is a heavenly thing. All this stirred and worked within the bottle, just as it does in young poets, who very often know no more about it than the bottle. At last, one morning the bottle was bought by the furrier's apprentice. He was sent for a bottle of the best wine. It was packed up in a luncheon basket together with the ham, the cheese, and the sausage. The basket also contained butter of the best and various fancy breads. The furrier's daughter packed it herself. She was quite young and very pretty. She had laughing brown eyes and a smile on her lips. Her hands were soft and delicate and very white, yet not so white as her neck and bosom. It was easy to see that she was one of the town beauties, and yet she was not engaged. She held the provision basket on her lap during the drive to the wood. The neck of the bottle peeped out beyond the folds of the tablecloth. There was red sealing wax on the cork, and it looked straight up into the maiden's face. And it also looked at the young sailor who sat beside her. He was a friend of her childhood, the son of a portrait painter. He had just passed his examination for a promotion with honor and was to sail the next day as mate on a long trip to foreign parts. There had been a good deal of talk about this journey during the packing, and while it was going on the expression in the eyes and on the mouth of the pretty girl had been anything but cheerful. The two young people walked together in the wood and talked to each other. What did they talk about? Well, the bottle did not hear their conversation, for it was in the luncheon basket. It was a very long time before it was taken out, but when this did occur, it was evident that something pleasant had taken place. Everybody's eyes were beaming, and the furrier's daughter was laughing, but she talked less than the others, and her cheeks glowed like two red roses. Father took up the bottle and the corkscrew. It was a curious sensation for the cork to be drawn from the bottle for the first time. The bottleneck never afterwards forgot the solemn moment when the cork flew out with a cloop, and it gurgled when the wine flowed out of it into the glasses. The health of the betrothed, said father, and every glass was drained while the young sailor kissed his lovely bride. Health and happiness, said both the old people. The young man filled the glasses again and drank to the homecoming and the wedding this day year. When the glasses were emptied, he took the bottle and held it up above his head. You have shared my happiness today and you shall serve nobody else, saying which he threw it up into the air. The furrier's daughter little thought she was ever to see it again. However, this was to come to pass. It fell among the rushes by a little woodland lake. The bottleneck remembered distinctly how it lay there thinking over these events. I gave them wine and they gave me swamp water in return, but they meant it well. It could no longer see the betrothed pair or the joyous old people, but it could hear them for a long time, gaily talking and singing. After a time, two little peasant boys came along peering among the reeds, where they saw the bottle and took it away with them, so it was provided for. At home in the forester's cottage where they lived, their eldest brother, who was a sailor, had been yesterday to take leave of them, as he was starting on a long voyage. Mother was now packing up a bundle of his things, which father was to take to the town in the evening, when he went to see his son once more, and to take his mother's last greeting. A little bottle had already been filled with spiced brandy, and was just being put into the bundle, when the two boys came in with the other, larger bottle they had found. This one would hold so much more than the little one, and this was all the better, for it was a splendid cure for a chill. It was no longer red wine like the last which was put into the bottle, but bitter drops. However, these were good too, for the stomach. The large new bottle was to go, and not the little one, so once more the bottle started on a new journey. It was taken on board the ship to Peter Jensen, 
and it was the very same ship in which the young mate was to sail. But the mate did not see the bottle, and even if he had, he would not have known it, nor would he have ever thought that this was the one out of which they had drunk to his homecoming. Certainly it no longer contained wine, but there was something just as good in it. Whenever Peter Jensen brought it out, his shipmates dubbed it the apothecary. It contained good physic and cured all their complaints as long as there was a drop left in it. It was a very pleasant time, and the bottle used to sing whenever it was stroked with a cork, so they christened it Peter Jensen's Lark. A long time passed, and it stood in a corner empty, when something happened. Whether it was on the outward or the homeward journey, the bottle did not know, for it had not been ashore. A storm rose. Great waves, dark and heavy, poured over the vessel and tossed it up and down. The masts were broken, and one heavy sea sprang a leak. The pumps refused to work, and it was a pitch-dark night. The ship sank, but at the last moment the young mate wrote upon a scrap of paper, In the name of Jesus, we are going down. He wrote the name of his bride, his own and that of the ship, put the paper into an empty bottle he saw, hammered in the cork, and threw it out into the boiling, seething waters. He did not know that it was the very bottle from which he had poured the draught of joy and hope for her and for himself. Now it swayed up and down upon the waves with farewells and a message of death. The ship sank and the crew with it, but the bottle floated like a bird, for it had a heart in it, you know, a lover's letter. The sun rose and the sun set, and looked to the bottle just like the glowing furnace in its earliest days, when it had a longing to leap back again. It went through calms and storms, it never struck against any rock, nor was it ever followed by sharks. It drifted about for more than a year and then day, first towards north and then towards south, just as the current drove it. It was otherwise entirely its own master, but one may get tired even of that. The written paper, the last farewell from the bridegroom to the bride, could only bring grief, if it ever came into the right hands. But where were those hands, the ones which had shone so white when they spread the cloth upon the fresh grass in the green woods on the day of the betrothal? Where was the furrier's daughter? Nay, where was land, and which land lay nearest? All this the bottle knew not. It drifted and drifted, till at last it was sick of drifting about. It had never been its own intention, but all the same it had to drift till at last it reached land, a strange land. It did not understand a word that was said. It was not the language it was accustomed to hear, and one loses much if one does not understand the language. The bottle was picked up and looked at. The bit of paper inside was inspected, turned and twisted, but they did not understand what was written on it. They saw that the bottle had been thrown overboard and that something about it was written on the paper, but what it was, this was the remarkable part. So it was put into the bottle again, and this was put into a large cupboard in a large room in a large house. Every time a stranger came, the slip of paper was taken out, turned and twisted, so that the writing which was only in pencil became more and more illegible. At last, it was impossible even to make out the letters. The bottle stood in the cupboard for another year, then it was put into the lumber room, where it was soon hidden with dust and spider's webs. Then it used to think of the better days when it poured forth red wine in the wood, and when it danced on the waves and carried a secret, a letter, a farewell sigh within it. Now it stood in the attic for twenty years, and it might have stood there longer if the house had not been rebuilt. The roof was torn off, the bottle was seen and remarked upon, but it did not understand the language. One does not learn that by standing in a lumber room, even for twenty years. Had I remained downstairs, it thought indeed, I should have learnt it fast enough. Now it was washed and thoroughly rinsed out, a process which it sorely needed. It became quite clear and transparent, and felt youthful again in its old age. 
The slip of paper it had contained within it so long had vanished in the rinsing. The bottle was filled with seed corn, a sort of thing it knew nothing at all about. Then it was well corked and wrapped up tightly, so that it could neither see the light of lantern or candle, far less the sun or the moon, and one really ought to see something when one goes on a journey, thought the bottle. However, it saw nothing, but it did the most important thing required of it. That was to arrive at its destination, and there it was unpacked. What trouble these foreigners have taken with it, was said, but I dare say it is cracked all the same. However, it was not cracked. The bottle understood every single word that was said. It was all spoken in the language it had heard at the smelting furnace, at the wine merchants, in the wood, and on board ship. The one and only good old language which it thoroughly understood. It had come home again into its own country, where it had a hearty welcome in the language. It nearly sprang out of the people's hands from very joy. It hardly noticed the cork being drawn. Then it was well shaken to empty it and put away in the cellar to be kept and also forgotten. There is no place like home, even if it be a cellar. It never occurred to the bottle to think how long it lay there, but it lay there comfortably for many years. Then one day, some people came down and took away all the bottles and it among them. In the garden outside, everything was very festive. There were festoons of lamps and transparent paper lanterns like tulips. It was a clear and lovely evening. The stars shone brightly and the slim crescent of the new moon was just up. In fact, the whole moon, like a pale gray globe, was visible with a golden rim to the half of it. It was a beautiful sight for good eyes. There were also some illuminations in the side paths, enough, at any rate, to see one's way about. Bottles were placed at intervals in the hedges, each with a lighted candle in it, and among them stood our bottle too, the one we know which was to end its days as a bottleneck for a bird's drinking fountain. Everything here appeared lovely to the bottle, for it was once again in the green wood and taking part once more in merrymaking and gaiety. It heard music and singing once again, and the hum and buzz of many people, especially from that corner of the garden where the lanterns shone and the paper lamps gave their colored light. The bottle was only placed in one of the sidewalks, but even there it had food for reflection. There it stood, bearing its light aloft. It was being of some use as well as giving pleasure, and that was the right thing. In such an hour, one forgets all about the twenty years passed in an attic, and sometimes it is good to forget. A couple of persons passed close by it, arm in arm, like the betrothed pair in the woods, the sailor and the furrier's daughter. The bottle felt as if it were living its life over again. The guests walked about in the garden, and other people too, who had come to look at them and the illuminations. Among them there was an old maid who was without kith or kin, but not friendless. She was thinking of the very same thing as the bottle, of the green wood, and of a young pair very dear to her, as she herself was one of them. It had been her happiest hour, and that one never forgets, however old a spinster one may be. But she did not know the bottle, and it did not know her again. Thus people pass one another in the world, till one meets again like these two who were now in the same town. The bottle was taken from the garden to the wine merchant's, where it was again filled with wine and sold to an aeronaut who next Sunday was to make an ascent in a balloon. A crowd of people came to look on. There was a regimental band and many preparations. The bottle saw everything from a basket, where it lay in company with a living rabbit, which was much depressed, for it knew it was being taken up to be sent down in a parachute. The bottle knew nothing at all about it, it only saw that the balloon was being distended to a great size, and when it could not get any bigger, it began to rise higher and higher and to become very restive. The ropes which held it were then cut, 
and it ascended with the aeronaut, basket, bottle, and rabbit. There was a grand clashing of music, and people shouted, Hurrah! It is a curious sensation to go up into the air like this, thought the bottle. It's a new kind of sailing, and there can't be any danger of a collision up here. Several thousands of persons watched the balloon, and among them the old maid. She stood by her open window, where the cage hung with the little linnet, which at the time had no drinking fountain, but had to content itself with a cup. A myrtle stood in a pot in the window, and it was moved a little to one side so as not to be knocked over when the old maid leant out to look at the balloon. She could see the aeronaut quite plainly when he let down the rabbit in the parachute. Then he drank the health of the people, after which he threw the bottle high up into the air. Little did she think that she had seen the same bottle fly into the air above her and her lover on that happy day in the woods in her youth. The bottle had no time to think. It was so taken by surprise at finding itself suddenly thus at the zenith of its career. The church steeples and housetops lay far, far below, and the people looked quite tiny. The bottle sunk with far greater rapidity than the rabbit, and on the way it turned several somersaults in the air. It felt so youthful, so exhilarated, it was half drunk with the wine, but not for long did it feel so. What a journey it had! The sun shone upon the bottle, and all the people watched its flight. The balloon was already far away, and the bottle was soon lost to sight too. It fell upon a roof, where it was smashed to pieces, but there was such an impetus on the bits that they could not lie where they fell. They jumped and rolled till they reached the yard where they lay in smaller bits. Only the neck was whole, and that might have been cut off with a diamond. That would do very well for a bird's drinking fountain, said the man who lived in the basement, but he had neither bird nor cage, and it would have been too much to procure these merely because he had found a bottleneck which might do for a drinking fountain. The old maid in the attic might find a use for it, so the bottleneck found its way up there. It had a cork put into it, and what had been the top became the bottom, and the way changes often take place. Fresh water was put into it, and it was hung outside the cage of the little bird which sang so merrily. Yes, you may well sing, was what the bottleneck said, and it was looked upon as a very remarkable one, for it had been up in a balloon. Nothing more was known of its history. There it hung now as a drinking fountain, where it could hear the roll and the rumble in the streets below, and it could also hear the old maid talking in the room. She had an old friend with her, and they were talking, not about the bottleneck, but about the myrtle in the window. You must certainly not spend five shillings on a bridal bouquet for your daughter, said the old maid. I will give you a beauty covered with blossom. Do you see how beautifully my myrtle is blooming? Why, it is a cutting from the plant you gave me on the day after my betrothal, the one I was to have had for my bouquet when the year was out, the day which never came. Before then the eyes which would have gladdened and cherished me in this life were closed. He sleeps sweetly in the depths of the ocean, my beloved. The tree grew old, but I grew older, and when it drooped, I took the last fresh branch and planted it in the earth where it has grown to such a big plant. So it will take part in a wedding, after all, and furnish a bouquet for your daughter. There were tears in the old maid's eyes as she spoke of her betrothal in the wood and of the beloved of her youth. She thought about the toasts which had been drunk and about the first kiss, but of these she did not speak. Was she not an old maid? Of all the thoughts that came into her mind, this one never came, that just outside her window was a relic of those days, the neck of the bottle out of which the cork came with a pop when it was drawn on the betrothal day. The neck did not recognize her either. In fact, it was not listening to her conversation, partly, if not entirely, 
because it was only thinking about itself. End of section 12. Section 13 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Steadfast Tin Soldier. There were once five and twenty tin soldiers, all brothers for they were the offspring of the same old tin spoon each man shouldered his gun kept his eyes well to the front and wore the smartest red and blue uniform imaginable the first thing they heard in their new world when the lid was taken off the box was a little boy clapping his hands and crying soldiers soldiers it was his birthday and they had just been given to him so he lost no time in setting them up on the table all the soldiers were exactly alike with one exception and he differed from the rest in having only one leg for he was made last and there was not quite enough tin left to finish him however he stood just as well on his one leg as the others on two in fact he is the very one who is to become famous on the table where they were being set up were many other toys but the chief thing which caught the eye was a delightful paper castle you could see through the tiny windows right into the rooms outside there were some little trees surrounding a small mirror representing a lake whose surface reflected the waxen swans which were swimming about on it it was altogether charming but the prettiest thing of all was a little maiden standing at the open door of the castle she too was cut out of paper but she wore a dress of the lightest gauze with a dainty little blue ribbon over her shoulders by way of a scarf set off by a brilliant spangle as big as her whole face the little maid was stretching out both arms for she was a dancer and in the dance one of her legs was raised so high into the air that the tin soldier could see absolutely nothing of it and suppose that she like himself had but one leg that would be the very wife for me he thought but she is much too grand she lives in a palace while i only have a box and then there are five and twenty of us to share it no that would be no place for her but i must try to make her acquaintance then he lay down full length behind a snuff-box which stood on the table from that point he could have a good look at the little lady who continued to stand on one leg without losing her balance late in the evening the other soldiers were put into their box and the people of the house went to bed now was the time for the toys to play they amused themselves with paying visits fighting battles and giving balls the tin soldiers rustled about in their box for they wanted to join the games but they could not get the lid off the nutcrackers turned somersaults and the pencil scribbled nonsense on the slate there was such a noise that the canary woke up and joined in but his remarks were in verse the only two who did not move were the tin soldier and the little dancer she stood as stiff as ever on tiptoe with her arms spread out he was equally firm on his one leg and he did not take his eyes off her for a moment then the clock struck twelve when pop up flew the lid of the snuff-box but there was no snuff in it no there was a little black goblin a sort of jack-in-the-box tin soldier said the goblin have the goodness to keep your eyes to yourself but the tin soldier feigned not to hear ah you just wait till tomorrow," said the goblin in the morning when the children got up they put the tin soldier on the window frame and whether it was caused by the goblin or by a puff of wind i do not know but all at once the window burst open and the soldier fell head foremost from the third story it was a terrible descent and he landed at last with his leg in the air and rested on his cap with his bayonet fixed between two paving stones the maid-servant and the little boy ran down at once to look for him but although they almost trod on him they could not see him had the soldier only called out here i am they would easily have found him but he did not think it proper to shout when he was in uniform presently it began to rain 
and the drops fell faster and faster till there was a regular torrent when it was over two street boys came along look out said one there is a tin soldier he shall go for a sail so they made a boat out of a newspaper and put the soldier into the middle of it and he sailed away down the gutter both boys ran alongside clapping their hands good heavens what waves there were in the gutter and what a current but then it certainly had rained cats and dogs the paper boat danced up and down and now and then whirled round and round a shudder ran through the tin soldier but he remained undaunted and did not move a muscle only looked straight before him with his gun shouldered all at once the boat drifted under a long wooden tunnel and it became as dark as it was in his box where on earth am i going to now thought he well well it is all the fault of that goblin oh if only the little maiden were with me in the boat it might be twice as dark for all i should care at this moment a big water rat who lived in the tunnel came up have you a pass asked the rat hand up your pass the tin soldier did not speak but clung still tighter to his gun the boat rushed on the rat close behind Phew! how he gnashed his teeth and shouted to the bits of stick and straw stop him stop him he hasn't paid his toll he hasn't shown his pass but the current grew stronger and stronger the tin soldier could already see daylight before him at the end of the tunnel but he also heard a roaring sound fit to strike terror to the bravest heart just imagine where the tunnel ended the stream rushed straight into the big canal that would be just as dangerous for him as it would be for us to shoot a great rapid he was so near the end now that it was impossible to stop the boat dashed out the poor tin soldier held himself as stiff as he could no one should say of him that he even winced the boat swirled round three or four times and filled with water to the edge it must sink the tin soldier stood up to his neck in water and the boat sank deeper and deeper the paper became limper and limper and at last the water went over his head then he thought of the pretty little dancer whom he was never to see again and this refrain rang in his ears onward onward soldier for death thou canst not shun at last the paper gave way entirely and the soldier fell through but at the same moment he was swallowed by a big fish oh how dark it was inside the fish it was worse than being in the tunnel even and then it was so narrow but the tin soldier was as dauntless as ever and lay full length shouldering his gun the fish rushed about and made the most frantic movements at last it became quite quiet and after a time a flash like lightning pierced it the soldier was once more in the broad daylight and some one called out loudly a tin soldier the fish had been caught taken to market sold and brought into the kitchen where the cook cut it open with a large knife she took the soldier up by the waist with two fingers and carried him into the parlor where everyone wanted to see the wonderful man who had traveled about in the stomach of a fish but the tin soldier was not at all proud they set him up on the table and wonder of wonders he found himself in the very same room that he had been in before he saw the very same children and the toys were still standing on the table as well as the beautiful castle with the pretty little dancer she still stood on one leg and held the other up in the air you see she also was unbending the soldier was so much moved that he was ready to shed tears of tin but that would not have been fitting he looked at her and she looked at him but they said never a word at this moment one of the little boys took up the tin soldier and without rhyme or reason threw him into the fire no doubt the little goblin in the small box was to blame for that the tin soldier stood there lighted up by the flame and in the most horrible heat but whether it was the heat of the real fire or the warmth of his feelings he did not know he had lost all his gay color it might have been from his perilous journey or it might have been from grief who can tell he looked at the little maiden and she looked at him and he felt that he was melting away but he still managed to keep himself erect shouldering his gun bravely a door was suddenly opened the draught caught the little dancer and she fluttered like a sylph straight into the fire to the soldier blazed up and was gone by this time the soldier was reduced to a mere lump 
and when the maid took away the ashes next morning she found him in the shape of a small tin heart all that was left of the dancer was her spangle and that was burnt as black as a coal end of section thirteen section fourteen of fairy tales from hans christian anderson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kanzaki soul fairy tales from hans christian anderson translated by mrs edgar lucas the angel every time a good child dies an angel of god comes down to earth takes the dead child in his arms spreads his great white wings, and flies with it to all the places the child had loved during his life. Then the angel plucks a handful of flowers which they carry with them up to God, there to bloom more brightly than ever upon earth. The good God presses all the flowers to his bosom, but those which he loves best he kisses, and in kissing gives them voices, so that they can join in the great song of everlasting praise. Now all this was told by an angel as he carried a dead child away to heaven, and the child listened as in a dream. Then they soared over all the places in its home where the little one used to play, and they passed through gardens full of flowers. Which one shall we take with us to plant in heaven? asked the angel. Close by stood a tall slender rosebush, but an evil hand had broken the stem, and all the branches, full of large, half-open buds, hung withering from it. That poor bush, said the child, take it so that it may bloom up there in God's garden. The angel took it and kissed the child for its thought, and the little one half opened its eyes. They also plucked some gorgeous flowers, but did not forget the despised marigolds and pansies. Now we have enough flowers, said the child, and the angel nodded, but still they did not rise to heaven. It was night and very still. They remained in the great town and hovered over one of the narrowest streets which was encumbered with heaps of straw, ash, and refuse of all kinds. It was just after quarter day, and there had been various removals in the street, and bits of broken crockery, rags, and old hats were scattered about in every direction. In fact, everything which was unpleasing to the eye. Among all the rubbish, the angel pointed to a broken flower pot, and a few lumps of earth only held together by the roots of a large, withered, wild flower. It was no use, and had therefore been thrown out of the window. We will take that with us, said the angel, and I will tell you about it as we fly along. So as they flew, the angel told this story. Down in that narrow street, in one of the dark cellars lived a poor, sick boy. He had been bedridden ever since he was quite small. When he was at his best, he could just hobble once or twice up and down the room on crutches. That was all. For a few days in summer, the sunbeams shone into the front room for half an hour or so. The little boy would sit here warming himself in the sunbeams, and looking at the red blood and his thin, transparent fingers when they held them up before his face. Then it was said, he has been out today. All he knew of the woods in the first freshness of spring was when a neighbor's son brought him home a few beech branches. These he held above his head, and dreamt that he was sitting under the beech trees where the sun shone and the birds sang. One day the boy also brought him some wild flowers, and among them, by chance, was one with a root. So it was planted in a pot and put in the window near his bed. The flower was planted by a loving hand, and it grew, put out new shoots, and for several years it bore fine flowers. It was a lovely garden to the sick boy, and his greatest treasure on earth. He watered and tended it, and saw that it got every sunbeam it could as long as a ray could reach the low window. It grew into his dreams, it flowered for him. For him, it spread around its fragrance and gladdened his eyes. Towards it, he turned in death when his heavenly father called him. He has had his place in the presence of God now for a year, and for a year the flower has stood forgotten in the window where it withered, and in the removal was thrown on the rubbish heap in the street. It is that poor withered flower which we have added to our bouquet, for it has given more pleasure than any flower in the queen's garden. 
But how do you know all this? asked the child in the angel's arms. Because I was myself the little sick boy who used to hobble on crutches. I know my own flower, you may be sure. The child opened its eyes wide and looked into the angel's beautiful, happy face. And at this moment, they found themselves in God's heaven, where all was joy and gladness. The Heavenly Father pressed the dead child to his bosom, and it received wings like the other angel, and they flew hand in hand together. And God pressed all the flowers to his heart, but he kissed the poor withered wildflower, and it received the voice and joined the choir of angels who floated around the Almighty. Some were quite near, others again outside these in great circles extending to infinity, but all equally happy. They all sang the glad song, great and small, the good child and the poor wildflower, which had lain upon the rubbish heap in the dark narrow street. End of section 14. Section 15 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Butterfly. The Butterfly was looking out for a bride, and naturally he wished to select a nice one among the flowers. He looked at them sitting so quietly and discreetly upon their stems, as a damsel generally sits when she is not engaged. But there were so many to choose among that it became quite a difficult matter. The butterfly did not relish encountering difficulties, so in his perplexity he flew to the daisy. She is called in France Marguerite. He knew that she could spay, and that she did so often for lovers plucked leaf after leaf from her, and with each a question was asked respecting the beloved. Is it true love from the heart? Love that pines? Cold love? None at all, or some such questions. Everyone asked in his own language. The butterfly came too to put his questions. He did not, however, pluck off the leaves, but kissed them all one by one with a hope of getting a good answer. Sweet Marguerite Daisy, said he, you are the wisest wife among all the flowers. You know how to predict events. Tell me, shall I get this one or that? Or whom shall I get? When I know, I can fly straight to the fair one and commence wooing her. But Marguerite would scarcely answer him. She was vexed at his calling her wife. He asked a second time, and he asked a third time, but he could not get a word out of her, so he would not take the trouble to ask any more, but flew away without further ado on his matrimonial errand. It was in the early spring, and there were plenty of snowdrops and crocuses. They are very nice looking, said the butterfly, charming little things, but somewhat too juvenile. He, like most very young men, preferred elder girls. Thereupon he flew to the anemones, but they were rather too bashful for him. The violets were too enthusiastic. The tulips were too fond of show. The jonquils were too plebeian. The linden tree blossoms were too small, and they had too large a family connection. The apple blossoms were certainly as lovely as roses to look at, but they stood today and fell off tomorrow, as the wind blew. It would not be worth while to enter into wedlock for so short a time, he thought. The sweet pea was the one that pleased him most. She was pink and white. She was pure and delicate, and belonged to that class of notable girls who always looks well, yet can make themselves useful in the kitchen. He was on the point of making an offer to her when at that moment he observed a pea-pod hanging close by with a withered flower at the end of it. Who is that? he asked. My sister, replied the sweet pea. Indeed, then you will probably come to look like her by and by, screamed the butterfly as he flew on. The honeysuckles hung over the hedge. They were extremely ladylike. 
but they had long faces and yellow complexions. They were not to his taste. But who was to his taste? I. Ask him that. The spring had passed, the summer had passed, and autumn was passing too. The flowers were still clad in brilliant robes, but alas, the fresh fragrance of youth was gone. Fragrance was a great attraction to him, though no longer young himself, and there was none to be found amongst the dahlias and the hollyhocks. So the butterfly stooped down to the wild thyme. She has scarcely any blossom, but she is altogether a flower herself, and all fragrance. Every leaflet is full of it. I will take her. So he began to woo forthwith. But the wild thyme stood stiff and still, and at length she said, Friendship, but nothing more. I am old, and you are old. We may very well live for each other, but marry? No. Let us not make fools of ourselves in our old age. So the butterfly got no one. He had been too long on the lookout, and that one should not be. The butterfly became an old bachelor, as it is called. It was late in the autumn, and there was nothing but drizzling rain and pouring rain. The wind blew coldly on the old willow trees, till the leaves shivered, and the branches cracked. It was not pleasant to fly about in summer clothing. This is the time, it is said, when domestic love is most needed. But the butterfly flew about no more. He had accidentally gone within doors, where there was fire in the stove. Yes, real summer heat. He could live, but to live is not enough, said he. Sunshine, freedom, and a little flower one must have. And he flew against the window pane, was observed, admired, and stuck upon a needle in a case of curiosities. There they could not do for him. Now I am sitting on a stem, like the flowers, said the butterfly. Very pleasant it is not, however. It is almost like being married. One is tied so fast. And he tried to comfort himself with this reflection. That is poor comfort, exclaimed the plants and the flower pots in the room. But one can hardly believe a plant in a flower pot, thought the butterfly. They are too much among human beings. End of section 15. Section number 16 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Psyche. At the dawn of day, through the red atmosphere, shines a large star. Morning's clearest star. Its ray quivers upon the white wall, as if it would there inscribe what it had to relate, what in the course of a thousand years it has witnessed here and there on our revolving earth. Listen to one of its histories. Lately, it's lately is a century ago to us human beings. My rays watched a young artist. It was in the territory of the Pope, in the capital of the world, Rome. Much has changed there in the flight of years, but nothing so rapidly as the change which takes place in the human form between childhood and old age. The imperial city was then, as now, in ruins. Fig trees and laurels grew among the fallen marble pillars and over the shattered bath chambers with their gold enameled walls. The Colosseum was a ruin. The bells of the churches rang. Incense perfumed the air. Processions moved with lights and splendid canopies through the streets. The Holy Church ruled all, and art was patronized by it. At Rome lived the world's great painter, Raphael. There also lived the first sculptor of his age, Michelangelo. The Pope himself paid homage 
to these two artists and honored them by his visits art was appreciated admired and recompensed but even then not all that was great and worthy of praise was known and brought forward in a narrow little street stood an old house it had formerly been a temple and there dwelt a young artist he was poor and unknown however he had a few young friends artists like himself young in mind in hopes in thoughts they told him that he was rich in talents but that he was a fool since he never would believe in his own powers he always destroyed what he had formed in clay he was never satisfied with anything he did and never had anything finished so as to have it seen and known and it was necessary to have this in order to make money you are a dreamer they said and therein lies your misfortune but this arises from your never having lived yet not having tasted life enjoyed it in large exhilarating draughts as it ought to be enjoyed it is only in youth that one can do this look at the great master raphael whom the pope honors and the world admires he does not abstain from wine and good fare he dines with the baker's wife the charming fornarina said angelo one of the liveliest of the young group they all talked a great deal after the fashion of gay young men they insisted on carrying the youthful artist off with them to scenes of amusement and riot scenes of folly they might have been called and for a moment he felt inclined to accompany them his blood was warm his fancy powerful he could join in their jovial chat and laugh as loud as any of them yet what they called raphael's pleasant life vanished from his mind like a morning mist he thought only of the inspiration that was apparent in the great master's work if he stood in the vatican near the beautiful forms the master of a thousand years before had created out of marble blocks then his breast heaved he felt within himself something so elevated so holy so grand and good that he longed to chisel such statues from the marble blocks he wished to give a form to the glorious conceptions of his mind but how and what form the soft clay that was moulded into beautiful figures by his fingers one day was the next day as usual broken up once as he was passing one of the rich palaces of which there are so many at rome he stepped within the large open entrance court and saw arched corridors adorned with statues enclosing a little garden full of the most beautiful roses great white flowers with green juicy leaves shot up the marble basin where the clear waters splashed and near it glided a figure that of a young girl the daughter of the princely house so delicate so light so lovely he had never beheld so beautiful a woman yes painted by raphael painted as psyche in one of the palaces of rome yes there she stood as if living she also lived in his thoughts and heart and he hurried home to his humble apartment and formed a psyche of clay it was the rich the high-born young roman lady and for the first time he looked with satisfaction on his work it was life itself it was herself and his friends when they saw it were loud in their congratulations this work was a proof of his excellence in art that they had themselves already known and the world should now know it also clay may look fleshy and lifelike but it has not the whiteness of marble and does not last so long his psyche must be sculptured in marble and the expensive block of marble required he already possessed it had lain for many years a legacy from his parents in the courtyard broken bottles decayed vegetables and all manner of refuse had been heaped on it and soiled it but within it was white as the mountain snow psyche was to be chiseled from it one day it happened the clear star tells nothing of this for it did not see what passed but we know it a distinguished roman party came to the narrow humble street the carriage stopped near it the party had come to see the young artist's work of which they had heard by accident and who were these aristocratic visitors unfortunate young man all too happy young man he might also have been called the young girl herself stood there in his studio and with what a smile when her father exclaimed but it is you you yourself to the life that smile could not be copied that glance could not be imitated that speaking glance which she cast on the young artist 
It was a glance that fascinated, enchanted, and destroyed. The psyche must be finished in marble, said the rich nobleman, and that was a life-giving word to the inanimate clay, and to the heavy marble block, as it was a life-giving word to the young man. When the work is finished, I will purchase it, said the noble visitor. It seemed as if a new era had dawned on the humble studio. Joy and sprightliness enlivened it now, and ennui fled before constant employment. The bright morning star saw how quickly the work advanced. The clay itself became as if animated with a soul, for even in it stood forth, in perfect beauty, each now well-known feature. Now I know what life is, exclaimed the young artist joyfully. It is love. There is glory in the excellent, rapture in the beautiful. What my friends call life and enjoyment are corrupt and perishable. They are bubbles in the fermenting dregs, not the pure heavenly altar wine that consecrates life. The block of marble was raised. The chisel hewed large pieces from it. It was measured, pointed, and marked. The work proceeded, little by little. The stone assumed a form of beauty, psych, charming as God's creation in the young female. The heavy marble became lifelike, dancing, airy, and a graceful psych, with the bright smile so heavenly and innocent, such as had mirrored itself in the young sculptor's heart. The star of the rose-tinted morn saw it, and well understood what was stirring in the young man's heart, understood the changing color on his cheek, the fire in his eye, as he carved the likeness of what God had created. You are a master, such as those in the time of the Greeks, said his delighted friends. The whole world will soon admire your psyche. My psyche, he exclaimed, mine, yes, such she must be. I too am an artist like the great ones of bygone days. God has bestowed on me the gift of genius, which raises its possession to a level with the high-born. And he sank on his knees and wept his thanks to God, and forgot him, for her, for her image in the marble. The figure of Psyche stood there, as if formed of snow, blushing rosy red in the morning sun. In reality, he was to see her living, moving, her whose voice had sounded like the sweetest music. He was to go to the splendid palace to announce that the marble psyche was finished. He went thither, passed through the open court to where the water poured, splashing from dolphins into the marble basin, around which the white flowers clustered and the roses shed their fragrance. He entered the large lofty hall whose walls and roof were adorned with armorial bearings and heraldic designs. Well-dressed, pompous-looking servants strutted up and down, like sleigh horses with their jingling bells. Others of them, insolent-looking fellows, were stretched at their ease on handsomely carved wooden benches. They seemed the masters of the house. He told his errand, and was then conducted up the white marble stairs, which were covered with soft carpets. Statues were ranged on both sides. He passed through handsome rooms with pictures and bright mosaic floors. For a moment he felt oppressed by all this magnificence and splendor. It nearly took his breath away. But he speedily recovered himself, for the princely owner of the mansion received him kindly, almost cordially, and, after they had finished their conversation, requested him, when bidding him adieu, to go to the apartments of the young signora, who wished also to see him. Servants marshaled him through superb saloons and suites of rooms to the chamber where she sat elegantly dressed and radiant in beauty. She spoke to him. No, miserere, no tones of sacred music could have more melted the heart and elevated the soul. He seized her hand and carried it to his lips. Never was a rose so soft. But there issued a fire from that rose, a fire that penetrated through him and turned his head. Words poured forth from his lips, which he scarcely knew himself, like the crater pouring forth glowing lava. He told her of his love, she stood amazed, offended, insulted, with a haughty and scornful look, an expression which had been called forth instantaneously by his passionate avowal of his sentiments toward her. Her cheeks glowed, her lips became quite pale, her eyes flashed fire, and were yet as dark as ebon night. Madman, she exclaimed, be gone, away! And she turned angrily from him, while her beautiful countenance assumed the look of that petrified face of old with the serpent's clustering around it like hair. Like a sinking, lifeless thing, he descended into the street. Like a sleepwalker, he reached his home. 
but there he awoke to pain and fury he seized his hammer lifted it high in the air and was on the point of breaking the beautiful marble statue but in his distracted state of mind he had not observed that angelo was standing near him the latter caught his arm exclaiming have you gone mad what would you do they struggled with each other angelo was the stronger of the two and drawing a deep breath the young sculptor threw himself on a chair what has happened asked angelo be yourself and speak but what could he tell what could he say and when angelo found that he could get nothing out of him he gave up questioning him your blood thickens in this constant dreaming be a man like the rest of us and do not live only in the ideal you will go deranged at this rate take wine until you feel it get a little into your head that will make you sleep well let a pretty girl be your doctor a girl from the campagna is as charming as a princess in her marble palace both are the daughters of eve and not to be distinguished from each other in paradise follow your angelo let me be your angel the angel of life for you the time will come when you will be old and your limbs will be useless to you why on a fine sunny day when everything is laughing and joyous do you look like a withered straw that can grow no more i do not believe what the priests say that there is a life beyond the grave it is a pretty fancy a tale for children pleasant enough if one could put faith in it i however do not live in fancies only but in the world of realities come with me be a man and he drew him out with him it was easy to do so at that moment there was a heat in the young artist's blood a change in his feelings he longed to throw off all his old habits all that he was accustomed to to throw off his own former self and he consented to accompany angelo on the outskirts of rome was a hostelry much frequented by artists it was built amidst the ruins of an old bath chamber the large yellow lemons hung among their dark bright leaves and adorned the greatest part of the old reddish gilt walls the hostelry was a deep vault almost like a hole in the ruin a lamp burned within it before a picture of the madonna a large fire was blazing in the stove roasting boiling and frying were going on there on the outside under lemon and laurel trees stood two tables spread for refreshments kindly and joyously were the two artists welcomed by their friends none of them ate much but they all drank a great deal that caused hilarity they were singing and playing the guitar saltarello sounded and the merry dance began a couple of young roman girls models for the artists joined in the dance and took part in their mirth two charming bacantes they had not indeed the delicacy of psyche they were not graceful lovely roses but they were fresh ruddy hardy carnations how warm it was that day warm even after the sun had gone down heat in the blood heat in the air heat in every look the atmosphere seemed to be composed of gold and roses life itself was gold and roses now at last you are with us let yourself be borne on the stream around you and within you i never before felt so well and so joyous cried the young sculptor you are right you are all right i was a fool a visionary men should seek for realities and not wrap themselves up in fantasies amid songs and the tinkling of guitars the young men sallied forth from the hostelry and took their way in the clear starlit evening through the small streets the two ready carnations daughters of the campagna accompanied them in angelo's room amidst sketches and folios scattered about and glowing voluptuous paintings their voices sounded more subdued but not less full of passion on the floor lay many a drawing of the campagna's daughters in various attractive attitudes they were full of beauty yet the originals were still more beautiful the six branch chandeliers were burning and the light glared in the scene of sensual joy apollo jupiter into your heaven and happiness am i wafted it seems as if the flower of life has in this moment sprung up in my heart yes it sprang up but it broke and fell and a deadening hideous sensation seized upon him it dimmed his sight stupefied his mind perception failed and all became dark around him he gained his home and sat down on his bed and tried to collect his thoughts fie was the exclamation uttered by his own mouth from the bottom of his heart wretch be gone away 
and he breathed a sigh full of the deepest grief. Be gone! Away! These words of hers, the living Sykes' words, were re-echoed in his breast, re-echoed from his lips. He laid his head on his pillow, his thoughts became confused, and he slept. At the dawn of day he arose, and sat down to reflect. What had happened? Had he dreamt it all? Dreamt her words? Dreamt his visit to the hostelry? And the evening with the flaunting carnations of the Campagna? No, all was reality. A reality such as he had never before experienced. Through the purplish haze of the early morning shone the clear star. Its rays fell upon him and upon the marble psyche. He trembled as he gazed on the imperishable image. He felt that there was impurity in his look, and he threw a covering over it. Once only he removed the veil to touch the statue, but he could not bear to see his own work. Quiet, gloomy, absorbed in his own thoughts, he sat the live-long day. He noticed nothing, knew nothing of what was going on about him, and no one knew what was going on within his heart. Days, weeks passed. The nights were the longest. The glittering star saw him one morning, pale, shaking with fever, arise from his couch, go to the marble figure, lift the veil from it, gaze for a moment with an expression of deep devotion and sorrow on his work, and then, almost sinking under its weight, he dragged the statue out into the garden. In it there is a dried-up, dilapidated, disused well, which could only be called a deep hole. He sank this psyche in it, threw an earth over it, and covered the new-made grave with brushwood and nettles. Be gone! Away! was the short funeral service. The star witnessed this through the rose-tinted atmosphere, and its ray quivered on two large tears upon the corpse-like cheeks of the young, fever-stricken man. Death-stricken, they called him on his sickbed. The monk Ignatius came to see him as a friend and physician, came with religious comforting words, and spoke to him of the church's happiness and peace, of the sins of mankind, the grace and mercy of God. And his words fell like warm sunbeams on the damp, spongy ground. It steamed, and the misty vapors ascended from it, so that the thoughts and mental images which had received their shapes from realities were cleared, and he was enabled to take a more just view of man's life. The delusions of guilt abounded in it, and such there had been for him. Art was a sorceress that lured us to vanity and earthly lusts. We are false towards ourselves, false towards our friends, false towards our God. The serpent always repeats within us, eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. He seemed now for the first time to understand himself, and to have found the way to truth and rest. On the church shone light from on high. In the monk's cell dwelt that peace amidst which the human tree might grow to flourish in eternity. Brother Ignatius encouraged these sentiments, and the artist's resolution was taken. A child of the world became a servant of the church. The young sculptor bade adieu, to all his former pursuits, and went into a monastery. How kindly, how gladly, was he received by the brothers! What a Sunday fete was his initiation! The Almighty, it seemed to him, was in the sunshine that illumined the church. His glory beamed from the holy images and from the white cross. And when he now, at the hour of the setting sun, stood in his little cell, and opening the window, looked out over the ancient Rome, the ruined temples the magnificent but dead Colosseum. When he saw all this in the springtime, when the acacias were in bloom, the evergreens were fresh, roses bursting from their buds, citron and orange trees shining, palms waving. He felt himself tranquilized and cheered as he had never been before. The quiet open Campagna extended towards the misty snow-decked hills, which seemed painted in the air. All blended together, breathed of peace, of beauty, so soothingly, so dreamily, a dream the whole. Yes, the world was a dream here. A dream may continue for an hour, and come again at another hour. But life in a cloister is a life of years, long and many. He might have attested the truth of this saying, that from within comes much which taints mankind. What was that fire that sometimes blazed throughout him? What was the source from which evil, against his will, was always welling forth? He scourged his body, but from within came the evil yet again. What was that spirit within him, which, with the pliancy of a serpent coiled itself up, and crept into his conscience under the cloak of universal love, and comforted him? The saints pray for us, the Holy Mother prays for us, 
Jesus himself has shed his blood for us. Was it weakness of mind or the volatile feelings of youth that caused him sometimes to think himself received into grace, and made him fancy himself exalted by that, exalted over so many? For he had not cast from him the vanities of the world? Was he not a son of the church? One day, after the lapse of many years, he met Angelo, who recognized him. Man! exclaimed Angelo. Yes, surely it is yourself. Are you happy now? You have sinned against God, for you have thrown away his gracious gift, and abandoned your mission in the world, read the parable of the confided talent. The master who related it spoke the truth. What have you won or found? Have you not allotted to yourself a life of dreams? To your religion, not a mere coinage of the brain? What if all be but a dream? Pretty yet fantastic thoughts. Away from me, Satan, cried the monk, as he fled from Angelo. There is a devil, a personified devil. I saw him today, groaned the monk. I only held out a finger to him, and he seized my whole hand. Ah, no, he sighed. In myself there is sin, and in that man there is sin. But he is not crushed by it. He goes with brow erect and lives in happiness. I seek my happiness in the consolations of religion. If only they were consolations. If all here, as in the world I left, were but pleasing thoughts. They are delusions, like the crimson skies of evening, like the beautiful sea-blue tint on the distant hills. Close by, these look very different. Eternity, thou art like the wide, interminable, calm-looking ocean. It beckons, calls us, fills us with forebodings, and if we venture on it, we sink, we disappear, die, cease to exist, delusioned, be gone, away! And tearless, lost in his own thoughts, he sat upon his hard pallet. Then he knelt. Before whom? The stone cross that stood on the wall? No, habit alone made him kneel there, and the deeper he looked into himself, the darker became his thoughts. Nothing within, nothing without. A lifetime wasted. And that cold snowball of thoughts rolled on, grew larger, crushed him, destroyed him. To none dare I speak of the gnawing worm within me. My secret is my prisoner. Yet if I could get rid of it, I would be thine, O God. And a spirit of piety awoke and struggled within him. Lord, Lord, he exclaimed in his despair. Be merciful, grant me faith. I despised and abandoned thy gracious gift, my mission into this world. I was wanting in strength. Thou hadst not bestowed that on me. A mortal fame, psyche, still lingers in my heart. Be gone, away. Thee shall be buried like yonder psyche, the brightest gem of my life. That shall never ascend from its dark grave. The star in the rose-tinted morn shone brightly, the star that assuredly shall be extinguished and annihilated, while the spirits of mankind live amidst celestial light. Its trembling rays fell upon the white wall, but it inscribed no memorial there of the blessed trust in God, of the grace of the holy love, that dwell in the believer's heart. Psyche within me can never die. It will live in my consciousness. Can what is inconceivable be? Yes, yes, for I myself am inconceivable. Thou art inconceivable, O Lord. The whole of thy universe is inconceivable, a work of power, of excellence, of love. His eyes beamed with the brightest radiance for a moment, and then he became dim and corpse-like. The church bells rang their funeral peal over him, the dead, and he was buried in earth, brought from Jerusalem, and mingled with the ashes of departed saints. Some years afterwards, the skeleton was taken up, as had been the skeletons of the dead monks before him. It was attired in the brown cowl, with a rosary in its hand, and it was placed in a niche among the human bones, which were found in the burying ground of the monastery. And the sun shone outside, and incense perfumed the air within and masses were said years again went by the bones of the skeleton had fallen from each other and become mixed together the skulls were gathered and set up they formed quite an outer wall to the church there stood also his skull in the burning sunshine there were so many many death's heads that no one knew now the names they had borne nor his and see in the sunshine there moved something living within the two eye sockets what could that be? 
a motley-colored lizard had sprung into the interior of the skull and was passing out and in through the large empty sockets of the eye there was life now within that head where once grand ideas bright dreams love of art and excellence had dwelt from whence hot tears had rolled and where had lived the hopes of immortality the lizard sprang forth and vanished the skull mouldered away and became dust in dust it was a century from that time the clear star shone unchanged as brightly and beautifully as a thousand years before the dawn of day was red fresh and blushing as a rosebud where once had been a narrow street with the ruins of an ancient temple stood now a convent a grave was to be dug in the garden for a young nun had died at an early hour in the morning she was to be buried in digging the grave the spade knocked against a stone dazzling white it appeared the pure marble became visible a round shoulder first presented itself the spade was used more cautiously and a female head was soon discovered and then the wings of a butterfly from the grave in which the young nun was to be laid they raised in the red morning light a beautiful statue psyche carved in the finest marble how charming it is how perfect an exquisite work from the most glorious period of art it was said who could have been the sculptor no one knew that none knew him except the clear star that had shone for a thousand years it knew his earthly career his trials his weakness but he was dead returned to the dust yet the result of his greatest effort the most admirable which proved his vast genius psyche that never can die that might outlive fame that was seen appreciated admired and loved the clear star in the rosy streaked morn seals its glittering ray upon psyche and upon the delighted countenances of the admiring beholders who saw a soul created in the marble block all that is earthly returns to earth and is forgotten only the star in the infinite vault of heaven bears it in remembrance what is heavenly retains renown from its own excellence and when even renown shall fade psyche shall still live end of section sixteen Section 17 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Snail and the Rosebush. Around a garden was a fence of hazel bushes, and beyond that were fields and meadows, with cows and sheep. But in the center of the garden stood a rose bush in full bloom. Under it lay a snail, who had a great deal in him, according to himself. Wait till my time comes, said he. I shall do a great deal more than to yield roses, or to bear nuts, or to give milk as cows do. I expect an immense deal from you, said the rosebush. May I ask when it is to come forth? I shall take my time, replied the snail. You are always in such a hurry with your work that curiosity about it is never excited. The following year the snail lay almost in the same spot as formerly in the sunshine under the rosebush. It was already in bud and the buds had begun to expand into full-blown flowers, always fresh, always new. And the snail crept half out, stretched forth its feelers, and then drew them in again. Everything looks just the same as last year. There is no progress to be seen anywhere. The rose bush is covered with roses. It will never get beyond that. The summer passed, the autumn passed. The rose bush had yielded roses and buds up to the time that the snow fell. The weather became wet and tempestuous. The rose bush bowed down towards the ground. The snail crept into the earth. A new year commenced. The rose bush revived, and the snail came forth again. You are now only an old stick of a rose bush, said he. You must expect to wither away soon. You have given the world all that was in you. Whether that were worth much or not is a question I have not time to take into consideration. But this is certain, 
that you have not done the least for your own improvement, else something very different might have been produced by you. Can you deny this? You will soon become only a bare stick. Do you understand what I say? You alarm me, cried the rosebush. I never thought of this. No, you have never troubled yourself with thinking much. But have you not occasionally reflected why you blossomed? And in what way you blossomed? How in one way and not in another? No, answered the rosebush. I blossomed in gladness, for I could not do otherwise. The sun was so warm, the air so refreshing. I drank of the clear dew and the heavy rain. I breathed, I lived. There came up from the ground a strength to me. There came a strength from above. I experienced a degree of pleasure, always new, always great, and I was obliged to blossom. It was my life. I could not do otherwise. You have had a very easy life, remarked the snail. To be sure, much has been granted to me, said the rosebush, but no more will be bestowed on me now. You have one of those meditative, deeply thinking minds, one so endowed that you will astonish the world. I have by no means any such design, said the snail. The world is nothing to me. What have I to do with the world? I have enough to do with myself, and enough in myself. But should we not in this earth all give our best assistance to others, contribute what we can? Yes, I have only been able to give roses, but you, you who have got so much, what have you given to the world? What will you give it? What have I given? What will I give? I spit upon it. It is good for nothing. I have no interest in it. Produce your roses. You cannot do more than that. Let the hazel bushes bear nuts. Let the cows give milk. You have each of you your public. I have mine within myself. I am going into myself and shall remain there. The world is nothing to me. And so the snail withdrew into his house and closed it up. What a sad pity it is, exclaimed the rose bush. I cannot creep into shelter, however much I might wish it. I must always spring out, spring out into roses. The leaves fall off, and they fly away on the wind. But I saw one of the roses laid in a psalm book belonging to the mistress of the house. Another of my roses was placed on the breast of a young and beautiful girl, and another was kissed by a child's soft lips in an ecstasy of joy. I was so charmed at all this. It was a real happiness to me, one of the pleasant remembrances of my life. And the rosebush bloomed on in innocence, while the snail retired into his slimy house. The world was nothing to him. Years flew on. The snail had returned to earth. The rosebush had returned to earth. Also, the dried rose leaf in the psalm book had disappeared. But new rosebushes bloomed in the garden, and new snails were there. They crept into their houses, spitting. The world was nothing to them. Shall we read their history, too? It would not be different. End of section 17 Section 18 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cal Taylor. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Girl Who Trod on a Loaf. I dare say you have heard of the girl who stepped on a loaf so as not to soil her shoes, and all the misfortunes that befell her in consequence. At any rate, the story has been written and printed too. She was a poor child of a proud and arrogant nature and her disposition was bad from the beginning. When she was quite tiny, her greatest delight was to catch flies and pull their wings off to make creeping insects of them. Then she would catch chafers and beetles and stick them on a pin, after which she would push a leaf or a bit of paper close enough for them to seize with their feet for the pleasure of seeing them writhe and wriggle in her efforts to free themselves from the pins. The chafer is reading now, said little Inger. Look at it, turning over the page. She got worse rather than better as she grew older, but she was very pretty, and that, no doubt, was her misfortune. 
or she might have had many a beating which she never got. It will take a heavy blow to bend that head, said her own mother. As a child you have often trampled on my apron. I fear that when you are grown up you will trample on my heart. This she did with a vengeance. She was sent into service in the country with some rich people. They treated her as if she had been their own child, and dressed her in the same style. She grew pretty and prettier, but her pride grew too. When she had been with them a year, her employer said to her, You ought to go home to see your parents, little Inger. So she went, but she went to show herself only, so that they might see how grand she was. When she got to the town gates, and saw the young men and maids gossiping around the pond, and her mother sitting among them with a bundle of sticks he had picked up in the woods, Inger turned away. She was ashamed that one so fine as herself should have such a ragged old woman who picked up sticks for her mother. She was not a bit sorry that she had turned back, only angry. Another half year passed. Little Inger, you really ought to go and see your old parents, said her mistress. Here is a large loaf of wheat and bread you may take to them. They will be pleased to see you. Inger put on all her best clothes and her fine new shoes. She held up her skirts and picked her steps carefully as to keep her shoes nice and clean. Now no one could blame her for this, but when she came to the path through the marsh, a great part of it was wet and muddy and she threw the loaf into the mud for a stepping stone to get over it with dry shoes. As she stood there with one foot on the loaf and was lifting up the other for the next step, the loaf sank deeper and deeper with her until it entirely disappeared. Nothing was to be seen but a black bubbling pool. Now this is the story. But what had become of her? She went down to the marsh wife who has a brewery down there. The marsh wife, his own sister to the elf king, and aunt to the elf maidens who are well enough known. They have had verses written about them and pictures painted, but all that people know about the marsh wife is that when the mist rises over the meadows in the summer, she is at her brewing. It was into this brewery that little Inger fell, and no one can stand being there long. A scavenger's cart is sweet compared to the marsh wife's brewery. The smell from the barrels is enough to turn people faint, and the barrels are so close together that no one could pass between them. But wherever there is a little chink, it is filled with some noisy toads and slimy snakes. Little Inger fell among all this horrid loving filth. It was so icy cold that she shuddered from head to foot, and her limbs grew quite stiff. The loaf stuck to her feet, and it drew her down, just as an amber button draws a bit of straw. The marsh wife was at home. Old Bogey and his great-grandmother were paying her a visit. The great-grandmother is a very venomous old woman, and she is never idle. She never goes out without her work, and she had it with her today, too. She was busily making gad about leather to put into people's shoes, so that the wearer might have no rest. She embroidered lies and strung together all the idle words which fell to the ground to make mischief of them. Oh, yes! old great-grandmother can knit and embroider in a fine style as soon as she saw little inger she put up her eyeglass and looked at her through it that girl has got something in her she said i should like to have her as a remembrance of my visit she would make a very good statue in my great-grandson's outer corridor so inger was given to her and this is how she got to bogey land people don't always get there by such a direct route though it is easy enough to get there in more roundabout ways. What a never-ending corridor that was to be sure. It made one giddy to look either backwards or forward. Here stood an anonymous crew waiting for the door of mercy to be opened, but long might they wait. Great, fat, sprawling spiders spun webs of a thousand years round and round their feet, and these webs were like footscrews and held them in a vice or as throw bound with a copper chain besides there was such everlasting unrest in every soul the unrest of torment the miser had forgotten the key of his money chest he knew he had left it sticking in the lock but it would take far too long to enumerate all the various tortures here 
Inger experienced the torture of standing like a statue with a loaf tied to her feet. This is what comes of trying to keep one's feet clean, she said to herself. Look how they stare at me. They did indeed stare at her. All their evil passion shone out of their eyes and spoke without words from their lips. They were a terrible sight. It must be a pleasure to look at me, thought Inger, for I have a pretty face and nice clothes. And then she turned her eyes to look at them. Her neck was too stiff, but oh, how dirty she had got in the marsh wife's brewery. She had never thought of that. Her clothes were covered with slime. A snake had gotten among her hair and hung, dangling down her back. A toad looked out of every fold in her dress, croaking like an athletic pug dog. It was most unpleasant. But all the others down there looked frightful, too, was her consolation. Worse than anything was a terrible hunger she felt, and she could not stoop down to break a bit of bread off the loaf she was standing on. No, her back had stiffened, her arms and hands had stiffened, and her whole body was like a pillar of stone. She could only turn her eyes, but she could turn them right around so as to look backward, and what a horrid sight it was. And then came the flies. They crept upon her eyes, and however much she winked, they would not fly away. They could not, for she had pulled off their wings and made creeping insects of them. That was indeed a torment added to her gnawing hunger. She seemed at last to be absolutely empty. If this is to go on long, I shan't be able to bear it, she said. But it did go on, and bear it she must. Then a scalding tear fell upon her forehead. It trickled down her face and bosom, right down to the loaf. Then another fell, and another, till there was a perfect shower. Who is crying for little Inger? Had she not a mother on earth? Tears of torment shed by a mother will always reach it, but they do not bring healing. They burn and make the torment fifty times worse. Then this terrible hunger again, and she not able to get the bread under her feet. She felt at last as if she had been feeding upon herself, and had become a mere hollow reed, which conducts every sound. She distinctly heard everything that was said on earth about herself, and she heard nothing but hard words. Certainly her mother wept bitterly and sorrowfully, but at the same time she said, Pride goes before a fall. There was your misfortune, Inger. How you have grieved your mother! Her mother and everyone on earth knew all about her sin, how she had stepped upon the loaf and sunk down under the earth, and so was lost. The cowherd had told them so much. He had seen it himself from the hillock where he was standing. How you have grieved your mother, Inger, said the poor woman. But then I always said you would. Oh, that I had never been born, thought Inger then. I should have been much better off. My mother's tears are no good now. She heard the good people, her employers, who had been like parents to her, talking about her. She was a sinful child, they said. She did not value the gifts of God, but trod them under her foot. She will find it hard to open the door of mercy. They ought to have brought me up better, thought Inger. They should have knocked the nonsense out of me if it was there. She heard that a song had been written about her and sung all over the country. The arrogant girl who trod on a loaf to keep her shoes clean. That I should hear that old story so often and have to suffer so much for it, thought Inger. The others ought to be punished for their sins, too, said Inger. There would be plenty to punish. Oh, how I am being tormented, and her heart grew harder than her outer shell. Nobody will ever get any better in this company, and I won't be any better. Look how they are all staring at me. Her heart was full of anger and malice towards everyone. Now they have got something to talk about up there. Oh, this torture. She heard people telling her story to children, and little ones always called her wicked anger. And she was so naughty that she had to be tormented. She heard nothing but hard words from the children's mouths. But one day, when anger and hunger were gnawing at her hollow shell, she heard her name mentioned, and her story being told to an innocent child. A little girl and a little creature burst into tears at the story of proud, vain anger. But will she ever come up here again? asked the child. And the answer was, she will never come up again. 
but if she was to ask pardon and promise never to do it again she won't ask pardon i said but i want her to do it said the little girl who refused to be comforted i will give my doll's house if she may only come up again it is so dreadful for poor inger those words reached down into inger's heart and they seemed to do her good it was the first time that any one said poor inger without adding anything about her misdeeds a little innocent child was weeping and praying for her and it made her feel quite odd she would have liked to cry herself but she could not shed a tear and this was a further torment as the years passed above so they went on below without any change she seldomer heard sounds from above and she was less talked about but one day she was aware of a sigh anger anger what a grief you have been to me but i always knew you would it was her mother who was dying occasionally she heard her name mentioned by her old employers and the gentlest words her mistress used were shall i ever see you again anger one never knows whither one may go but anger knew very well that her good kindly mistress could never come to the place where she was again a long bitter period passed then anger again heard her name pronounced and she saw above her head what seemed to be two bright stars they were in fact two kind eyes which were closing on earth so many years had gone by since the little girl had cried so bitterly at the story of poor anger that the child had grown to be an old woman whom the lord was now calling to himself in the last hour when one's whole life comes back to one she remembered how as a little child she had wept bitter tears at the story of anger the impression was so clear to the old woman in the hour of death that she exclaimed aloud o oh lord may i not like anger have trodden on thy blessed gifts without thinking and may i not also have nourished pride in my heart but in thy mercy thou didst not let me fall forsake me not now in my last hour the old woman's eyes closed and the eyes of her soul were opened to see the hidden things and as inger had been so vividly present in her last thoughts she saw now how deep she had sank and at the sight she burst into tears then she stood in the kingdom of heaven as a child weeping for poor inger her tears and prayers echoed into the hollow empty shell which surrounded the imprisoned tortured soul and it was quite overwhelmed by all this unexpected love from above an angel of god weeping over her why was this vouchsafed to her the tortured soul recalled very earthly action it had ever performed and at last it melted into tears in a way inger had never done she was filled with grief for herself it seemed as though the gate of mercy could never be opened to her but as in humble contrition she acknowledged this a ray of light shone into the gulf of destruction the strength of the ray was far greater than that of the sunbeam which melts the snowman built up by the boys in the garden and sooner much sooner than a snowflake melts on the warm lips of a child did inger's stony form dissolve before it and a little bird with lightning speed winged its way to the upper world it was terribly shy and afraid of everything it was ashamed of itself and afraid to meet the eye of any living being so it hastily sought shelter in a chink in the wall there it cowered shuddering in every limb it could not utter a sound for it had no voice it sat for a long time before it could survey calmly all the wonders around yes they were wonders indeed the air was so sweet and fresh the moon shone on brightly the trees and bushes were so fragrant and then the comfort of it all its feathers were so clean and dainty how all creation spoke of love and beauty the bird would gladly have sung aloud all those thoughts stirring in its breast but it had not the power gladly would it have carolled as do the cuckoos and nightingales in the summer the good god who hears a voiceless hymn of praise even of a worm was also aware of the psalm of thanksgiving trembling in the breast of the bird as the psalms of david echoed in the heart before they shaped themselves into words and melody these thoughts and these voiceless songs grew and swelled for weeks they must have an outlet and at the first attempt at a good deed 
this would be found. Then came the holy Christmas feast. The peasants raised a pole against a wall and tied a sheaf of oats on to the top so that little birds might have a good meal on the happy Christmas day. The sun rose bright and shone upon the sheaf of oats, and a twittering bird surrounded the pole. Then from the chink in the wall came a feeble tweet tweet the swelling thoughts of the bird had found a voice and this faint twitter was its hymn of praise the thought of a good deed was awakened and the bird flew out of its hiding place in the kingdom of heaven this bird was well known it was a very hard winter and all the water had thick ice over it the birds and wild creatures had great difficulty in finding food the little bird flew along the highways, finding here and there in the tracks of the sledges a grain of corn. At the baiting places it also found a few morsels of bread, of which it would only eat a crumb, and gave the rest to other starving sparrows, which it called up. Then it flew into the town and peeped about. Wherever a loving hand had strewn bread crumbs for the birds, it only ate one crumb and gave the rest away. In the course of the winter the bird had collected it gave it away so many crumbs of bread that they equaled in weight the whole loaf which little inger had stepped upon to keep her shoes clean when the last crumbs were found and given away the bird's gray wings became white and spread themselves wide a tern is flying away over the sea said the children who saw the white bird now it dived into the sea and now it soared up into the bright sunshine it gleamed so brightly that it was not possible to see what became of it. They said it flew right into the sun. End of section 18. Recording by Cal Taylor. Section 19 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Nightingale In China, as you know, the emperor is a Chinaman, and all the people around him are Chinamen too. It is many years since the story I am going to tell you happened, but that is all the more reason for telling it, lest it should be forgotten the emperor's palace was the most beautiful thing in the world it was made entirely of the finest porcelain very costly but at the same time so fragile that it could only be touched with the very greatest care there were the most extraordinary flowers to be seen in the garden the most beautiful ones had little silver bells tied to them which tinkled perpetually so that one should not pass the flowers without looking at them Every little detail in the garden had been most carefully thought out, and it was so big that even the gardener himself did not know where it ended. If one went on walking, one came to beautiful woods with lofty trees and deep lakes. The wood extended to the sea, which was deep and blue, deep enough for large ships to sail right up under the branches of the trees. Among these trees lived a nightingale which sang so deliciously that even the poor fisherman who had plenty of other things to do lay still to listen to it when he was out at night drawing in his nets heavens how beautiful it is he said but then he had to attend to his business and forgot it the next night when he heard it again he would again exclaim heavens how beautiful it is Travelers came to the emperor's capital from every country in the world. They admired everything very much, especially the palace and the gardens. But when they heard the nightingale, they all said, This is better than anything. When they got home, they described it, and the learned ones wrote many books about the town, the palace, and the garden. But nobody forgot the nightingale. It was always put above everything else. Those among them who were poets wrote the most beautiful poems, all about the nightingale in the woods by the deep blue sea. These books went all over the world, and in course of time some of them reached the emperor. He sat in his golden chair, reading and reading, and nodding his head, well pleased to hear such beautiful descriptions of the town, the palace, and the garden. "'But the nightingale is the best of all,' 
he read. "'What is this?' said the emperor. "'The nightingale. Why, I know nothing about it. Is there such a bird in my kingdom and in my own garden into the bargain, and I've never heard of it? Imagine my having to discover this from a book.' Then he called his gentleman-in-waiting, who was so grand that when any one of a lower rank dared to speak to him or ask him a question, he only would answer, P, which means nothing at all. "'There is said to be a very wonderful bird called a nightingale here,' said the emperor. "'They say that it is better than anything else in all my great kingdom. Why have I never been told anything about it?' "'I've never heard it mentioned,' said the gentleman-in-waiting. "'It has never been presented at court.' "'I wish it to appear here this evening, to sing to me,' said the emperor. "'The whole world knows what I am possessed of, and I know nothing about it.' "'I have never heard it mentioned before,' said the gentleman-in-waiting. "'I will seek it. I will find it.' "'But where was it to be found?' The gentleman-in-waiting ran upstairs and downstairs and in and out of all the rooms and corridors. No one of all those he met had ever heard anything about the nightingale. So the gentleman-in-waiting ran back to the emperor and said that it must be a myth invented by the writers of the books. "'Your imperial majesty must not believe everything that is written. Books are often mere inventions, even if they do not belong to what we call the black art. "'But the book in which I read it is sent to me by the powerful emperor of Japan, so it can't be untrue. I will hear this nightingale. I insist upon it being here to-night. I extend my most gracious protection to it, and if it is not forthcoming—' I will have the whole court trampled upon after supper. Tsing pa, said the gentleman-in-waiting, and away he ran again, up and down all the stairs, in and out of all the rooms and corridors. Half the court ran with him, for they, none of them, wished to be trampled on. There was much questioning about this nightingale, which was known to all the outside world, but to no one at court. At last they found a poor little maid in the kitchen. She said, "'Oh, heavens, the nightingale! I know it very well. Yes, indeed, it can sing. Every evening I'm allowed to take broken meat to my poor sick mother. She lives down by the shore. On my way back, when I'm tired, I rest a while in the wood, and then I hear the nightingale. Its song brings the tears into my eyes. I feel as if my mother were kissing me.' "'Little kitchen maid,' said the gentleman-in-waiting, I will procure you a permanent position in the kitchen and permission to see the emperor dining, if you will take us to the nightingale. It is commanded to appear at court tonight. Then they all went out into the wood where the nightingale usually sang. Half the court was there. As they were going along at their best pace, a cow began to bellow. Oh, said a young courtier, there we have it. "'What wonderful power for such a little creature! "'I have certainly heard it before. "'No, those are the cows bellowing. "'We are a long way yet from the place.' "'Then the frogs began to croak in the marsh. "'Beautiful,' said the Chinese chaplain. "'It is just like the tinkling of the church bells.' "'No, those are the frogs,' said the kitchen maid. "'But I think we shall soon hear it now.' "'Then?' the nightingale began to sing. "'There it is,' said the little girl. "'Listen, listen, there it sits.' And she pointed to a little gray bird up among the branches. "'Is it possible?' said the gentleman-in-waiting. "'I should never have thought it was like that. "'How common it looks. "'Seeing so many grand people "'must have frightened all its colors away.' "'Little nightingale,' called the kitchen-maid quite loud. "'Our gracious emperor wishes you to sing to him.' "'With the greatest pleasure,' said the nightingale, "'warbling away in the most delightful fashion. "'It is just like crystal bells,' said the gentleman-in-waiting. "'Look at its little throat, how active it is. "'It's extraordinary that we have never heard it before. "'I'm sure it will be a great success at court.' "'Shall I sing again to the emperor?' said the nightingale, who thought he was present. "'My precious little nightingale,' 
said the gentleman in waiting, I have the honor to command your attendance at court festival tonight, where you will charm his gracious majesty, the emperor, with your fascinating singing. It sounds best among the trees, said the nightingale, but it went with them willingly when it heard that the emperor wished it. The palace had been brightened up for the occasion. The walls and the floors, which were all of china, shone by the light of many thousand golden lamps. The most beautiful flowers, all of the tinkling kind, were arranged in the corridors. There was hurrying to and fro, and a great draught, but this was just what made the bells ring. One's ears were full of the tinkling. In the middle of the large reception room where the emperor sat, a golden rod had been fixed, on which the nightingale was to perch. The whole court was assembled, and the little kitchen maid had been permitted to stand behind the door, as she now had the actual title of cook. They were all dressed in their best. Everybody's eyes were turned towards the little gray bird at which the emperor was nodding. The nightingale sang delightfully, and the tears came into the emperor's eyes. Nay, they rolled down his cheeks and then the nightingale sang more beautifully than ever. Its notes touched all hearts. The emperor was charmed, and said the nightingale should have his gold slipper to wear around its neck. But the nightingale declined with thanks. It had already been sufficiently rewarded. I have seen the tears in the eyes of the emperor. That is my richest reward, and tears of an emperor have a wonderful power. God knows I'm sufficiently recompensed. And then it burst into its sweet heavenly song. That is the most delightful coquetting I have ever seen, said the ladies, and they took some water into their mouths to try to make the same gurgling when anyone spoke to them, thinking so to equal the nightingale. Even the lackeys and the chambermaids announced that they were satisfied, and that is saying a great deal. They are always the most difficult people to please. Yes, indeed, the nightingale had made a sensation. It was to stay at court now, and to have its own cage, as well as liberty to walk out twice a day, and once in the night. It always had twelve footmen, with each one holding a ribbon which was tied around its leg. There was not much pleasure in an outing of that sort. The whole town talked about the marvelous bird, and if two people met, one said to the other, Night, and the other answered, Gale, and then they sighed, perfectly understanding each other. Eleven cheesemongers' children were called after it, but they had not got a voice among them. One day a large parcel came for the emperor. Outside was written the word, Nightingale. Here we have another new book about this celebrated bird, said the emperor. But it was no book. It was a little work of art in a box, an artificial nightingale, exactly like the living one, but it was studded all over with diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. When the bird was wound up, it could sing one of the songs the real one sang, and it wagged its tail which glittered with silver and gold. A ribbon was tied around its neck on which was written, The Emperor of Japan's nightingale is very poor compared to the Emperor of China's. Everybody said, Oh, how beautiful! And the person who brought the artificial bird immediately received the title of Imperial Nightingale Carrier-in-Chief. Now they must sing together. What a duet that will be! Then they had to sing together. But they did not get on very well, for the real nightingale sang in its own way, and the artificial one could only sing waltzes. "'There's no fault in that,' said the music master. "'It's perfectly in time and correct in every way.' Then the artificial bird had to sing alone. It was just as great a success as the real one, and then it was so much prettier to look at, it glittered like bracelets and breastpins. It sang the same tune three and thirty times over, and yet it was not tired. People would willingly have heard it from the beginning again, but the emperor said that the real one must have a turn now. But where was it? No one had noticed that it had flown out of the open window back to its own green woods. But what is the meaning of this? said the emperor. 
all the courtiers railed at it and said it was a most ungrateful bird we have got the best bird though said they and the artificial bird had to sing again and this was the thirty-fourth time that they heard the same tune but they did not know it thoroughly even yet because it was so difficult the music master praised the bird tremendously and insisted that it was much better than the real nightingale not only as regarded the outside with all the diamonds but the inside too because you see my ladies and gentlemen and the emperor before all in the real nightingale you never know what you will hear but in the artificial one everything is decided beforehand so it is and so it must remain it can't be otherwise you can account for things you can open it and show the human ingenuity in arranging the waltzes how they go and how one note follows upon another those are exactly my opinions they all said and the music master got leave to show the bird to the public next sunday they were also to hear it sing said the emperor so they heard it and all became as enthusiastic over it as if they had drunk themselves merry on tea because that is a thoroughly chinese habit then they all said oh and stuck their forefingers in the air and nodded their heads but the poor fisherman who had heard the real nightingale said it sounds very nice and it's very like the real one but there's something wanting we don't know what the real nightingale was banished from the kingdom the artificial bird had its place on a silken cushion close to the emperor's bed all the presents it had received of gold and precious jewels were scattered around it its title had risen to be chief imperial singer of the bedchamber in rank number one on the left side for the emperor reckoned that side the important one where the heart was seated and even an emperor's heart is on the left side the music master wrote five and twenty volumes about the artificial bird the treatise was very long and written in all the most difficult chinese characters everybody said they had read and understood it for otherwise they would have been reckoned stupid and then their bodies would have been trampled upon things went on in this way for a whole year the emperor the court and all the other chinamen knew every little gurgle in the song of the artificial bird by heart but they liked it all the better for this and they could all join in the song themselves even the street boys sang zee 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 and cluck 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 and the emperor sang it too but one evening when the bird was singing its best and the emperor was lying in bed listening to it something gave way inside the bird with a whizz then a spring burst whirr and all the wheels and the music stopped the emperor jumped out of bed and sent for his private physicians but what good could they do then they sent for the watchmaker and after a good deal of talk and examination he got the works to go again somehow but he said it would have to be saved as much as possible because it was so worn out and he could not renew the works so as to be sure of the tune this was a great blow they had only dared to let the artificial bird sing once a year and hardly that but then the music master made a little speech using all the most difficult words he said it was just as good as ever and his saying it made it so five years now passed and then a great grief came upon the nation for they were all very fond of their emperor and he was ill and could not live it was said a new emperor was already chosen and people stood about in the street and asked the gentleman in waiting how their emperor was going on p answered he shaking his head the emperor lay pale and cold in his gorgeous bed the courtiers thought he was dead and they all went off to pay their respects to their new emperor the lackeys ran off to talk matters over and the chambermaids gave a great coffee party cloth had been laid down in all the rooms and corridors so as to deaden the sound of footsteps so it was very very quiet but the emperor was not dead yet he lay stiff and pale in the gorgeous bed with its velvet hangings and heavy golden tassels there was an open window high above him 
and the moon streamed in upon the emperor and the artificial bird beside him the poor emperor could hardly breathe he seemed to have a weight on his chest he opened his eyes and then he saw that it was death sitting upon his chest wearing his golden crown in one hand he held the emperor's golden sword in the other his imperial banner round about from among the folds of the velvet hangings peered many curious faces some were hideous others gentle and pleasant they were all the emperor's good and bad deeds which now looked him in the face when death was weighing him down do you remember that whispered one after the other do you remember this and they told him so many things that the perspiration poured down his face i never knew that said the emperor music music sound the great chinese drums he cried that i may not hear what they are saying but they went on and on and death sat nodding his head just like a chinaman at everything that was said music music shrieked the emperor you precious little golden bird sing sing i have loaded you with precious stones and even hung my own golden slipper around your neck sing i tell you sing but the bird stood silent there was nobody to wind it up so of course it could not go death continued to fix the great empty sockets of its eyes upon him and all was silent so terribly silent suddenly close to the window there was a burst of lovely song it was the living nightingale perched on a branch outside it had heard of the emperor's need and had come to bring comfort and hope to him as it sang the faces round became fainter and fainter and the blood coursed with fresh vigor in the emperor's veins and through his feeble limbs even death himself listened to the song and said go on little nightingale go on yes if you give me the gorgeous golden sword yes if you give me the imperial banner yes if you give me the emperor's crown and death gave back each of these treasures for a song and the nightingale went on singing it sang about the quiet churchyard where the roses bloom where the elder flowers scents the air and where the fresh grass is ever moistened anew by the tears of the mourner this song brought to death a longing for his own garden and like a cold gray mist he passed out of the window thanks thanks said the emperor you heavenly little bird i know you i banished you from my kingdom and yet you have charmed the evil visions away from my bed by your song and even death away from my heart how can i ever repay you you have rewarded me said the nightingale i brought the tears to your eyes the very first time i ever sang to you and i shall never forget it those are the jewels which gladden the heart of a singer but sleep now and wake up fresh and strong i'll sing to you then it sang again and the emperor fell into a sweet refreshing sleep the sun shone in at his window when he woke refreshed and well none of his attendants had yet come back to him for they thought he was dead but the nightingale still sat there singing you must always stay with me said the emperor you shall only sing when you like and i will break the artificial bird into a thousand pieces don't do that said the nightingale it did all the good it could keep it as you have always done i can't build my nest and live in this palace but let me come whenever i like then i will sit on the branch in the evening and sing to you i will sing to cheer you and to make you thoughtful too I will sing to you of the happy ones and of those that suffer too i will sing about the good and the evil which are kept hidden from you the little singing bird flies far and wide to the poor fisherman and the peasant's home to numbers who are far from you and your court i love your heart more than your crown and yet there is an odor of sanctity around the crown too i will come and i will sing to you but you must promise me one thing 
"'Everything,' said the emperor, who stood there in his imperial robes which he had just put on, and he held the sword heavy with gold upon his heart. "'One thing I ask you. Tell no one that you have a little bird who tells you everything. It'll be better so.' Then the nightingale flew away. The attendants came in to see after their dead emperor, and there he stood, bidding them good morning. End of section 19。section 20 of fairy tales from Hans Christian Andersen。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Amelia Chesley。Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Storks A stork had built his nest on the roof of the last house in a little town. The mother stork was sitting on the nest with her little ones, who stuck out their little black beaks, which had not turned red yet. The father stork stood a little way off the ridge of the roof, erect and stiff, with one leg drawn up under him, so as at least to be at some trouble while standing sentry. One might have thought he was carved out of wood, he stood so still. It will look so grand for my wife to have a sentry on guard by the nest, he thought. People won't know that I am her husband. I dare say they think I have orders to stand there. It looks smart. And so he remained standing on one leg. A party of children were playing in the street, and when they saw the stork, one of the boldest boys, followed by the others, sang the old song about the storks but he sang it just as it came into his head. Oh, father stork, father stork, fly to your nest. Three featherless fledglings await your return. The first of your chicks shall be stuck through the breast, the second shall hang, and the third shall burn. Hark, what are the boys singing, said the little storks. They say we are to be hanged and burnt. Don't bother your heads about them, said the mother stork. Don't listen to them, and then it won't do you any harm. But the boys went on singing and pointing their fingers at the storks. Only one boy, whose name was Peter, said that it was a shame to make fun of the creatures, and he would not take part of it. The mother bird comforted her little one, saying, Do not trouble yourselves about it. Look at your father, how quietly he stands, and on one leg, too. But we are so frightened, said the young ones, burying their heads in their nest. The next day, when the children came back to play, and they saw the storks, they began their old song. The first of your chicks shall be stuck through the breast, the second shall hang, and the third shall burn. Are we to be hanged and burnt? asked the little storks. No, certainly not, said the mother. You are to learn to fly. See if I don't drill you. Then we will go into the fields and visit the frogs. They curtsy in the water to us and sing, Cox, cox, and then we gobble them up. That's a treat, if you like. And what next? asked the young ones. Oh, then all the storks in the country assemble for the autumn maneuvers, and you will have to fly your best, for the one who cannot fly will be run through the body by the general's beak, so you must take good care to learn something when the drills begin. After all, then, we may be staked, just as the boys said, and listen, they are singing it again now. Listen to me and not to them, said the mother stork. After the grand maneuvers, we shall fly away to the warm countries, ever such a way off, over the woods and mountains. We go to Egypt, where they have three-cornered houses, the points of which reach above the clouds. They are called pyramids, and they are older than any stork can imagine. Then there is a river which overflows its banks, and all the land round turns to mud. You walk about in mud, devouring frogs. Oh, said all the young ones. Yes, it is splendid. You do nothing but eat all day. While we are so well off there, there is not a leaf on the trees in this country, and it is so cold that the clouds freeze all to pieces and fall down in little bits. She meant snow, but did not know how to describe it any better. Do the naughty boys freeze to pieces? asked the young storks. No, they don't freeze to pieces, but they come very near to it, and have to sit moping in dark rooms. You, on the other hand, fly about in strange countries, in the warm sunshine among flowers. Some time passed, 
and the little ones were big enough to stand up in the nest and look about them. The father stork flew backwards and forwards every day, with nice frogs and little snakes and every kind of delicacy he could find. It was so funny to see the tricks he did to amuse them. He would turn his head right around onto his tail, and he would clatter with his beak as if it was a rattle. And then he told them all the stories he heard in the swamps. "'Well, now you must learn to fly,' said the mother stork one day, and all the young ones had to stand on the ridge of the roof. Oh, how they wobbled about trying to keep their balance with their wings, and how nearly they fell down. "'Now look at me,' said the mother. "'This is how you must hold your heads, and move your legs so. One, two, one, two, and this will all help you to get on in the world.' Then she flew a little way, and the young ones made a clumsy little hop, and down they came with a bump, for their bodies were too heavy. "'I don't want to fly,' said one of the young ones, creeping down into the nest again. "'I don't care about going to the warm countries.' "'Do you want to freeze to death here when the winter comes? Shall the boys come along and hang or burn or stake you? I will soon call them.' "'No, no,' said the young one, hopping up onto the roof again, just like the others. "'By the third day they could all fly fairly well. "'Then they thought they could hover in the air, too, and they tried it, but flop! "'They soon found they had to move their wings again. "'Then the boys began their song again. "'Oh, Father Stork, Father Stork, fly to your nest!' "'Shall we fly down and pick their eyes out?' asked the young ones. "'No, leave them alone,' said their mother. Only pay attention to me. That is much more important. One, two, three. Now we fly to the right. One, two, three. Now to the left. And round the chimney. That was good. That last stroke of the wings was so pretty, and the flap so well done that I will allow you to go to the swamp with me tomorrow. Several nice storks go there with their children. Now just let me see that mine are the nicest. Don't forget to carry your heads high. It looks well and gives you an air of importance. "'But are we not to have a revenge on the naughty boys?' asked the young storks. "'Let them scream as much as they like. "'You will fly away with the clouds to the land of the pyramids, "'while they will perhaps be freezing. "'There won't be a green leaf or a sweet apple here then.' "'But we will have our revenge,' they whispered to each other, "'and then they began their drilling again. "'Of all the boys in the street, not one was worse at making fun of the storks "'than he who first began the derisive song. "'He was a tiny little fellow, not more than six years old. "'It is true the young storks thought he was at least a hundred, "'for he was so much bigger than their father and mother, "'and they had no idea how old children and grown-up people could be. "'They reserved all their vengeance for the boy who first began to tease them, "'and who never would leave off.' The young storks were frightfully irritated by the teasing, and the older they grew, the less they would stand it. At last their mother was obliged to promise that they should have their revenge, but not till the last day before they left. "'We shall first have to see how you behave at the maneuvers. If you come to grief and the general has to run you through the breast with his beak, the boys will, after all, be right, at least in one way. Now let us see.' "'That you shall,' said the young ones, and didn't they take pains. "'They practiced every day till they could fly as lightly as any feather. "'It was quite a pleasure to watch them. "'Then came the autumn. "'All the storks began to assemble before they started on their flight to the warm countries, "'where they spend their winters. "'Those were indeed maneuvers. "'They had to fly over woods and towns to try their wings, "'because they had such a long journey before them.' The young storks did everything so well that they got no end of frogs and snakes as prizes. They had the best characters, and then they could eat the frogs and snakes afterwards, which you may be sure they did. Now we shall have our revenge, they said. Yes, certainly, said the mother stork. My plan is this, and I think it is the right one. I know the pond where all the little human babies lie, till the storks fetch them and give them to their parents. The pretty little creatures lie there asleep, dreaming sweet dreams, sweeter than any they ever dream afterwards. Every parent wishes for such a little baby, and every child wants a baby brother or sister. Now we fly to the pond, and fetch a little brother or sister for each of those children who did not join in singing that horrid song, or in making fun of the storks. But those who sang it shall not have one. "'But what about that bad wicked boy who first began the song?' shrieked the young storks. 
what is to be done to him? In the pond, there is a little dead baby. It has dreamed itself to death. We will take it to him, and then he will cry, because we have brought him a little dead brother. But you have surely not forgotten the good boy who said it is a shame to make fun of the creatures. We will take both a brother and a sister to him, and because his name is Peter, you shall all be called Peter too. It happened just as she said, and all storks are called Peter to this day. End of section 20「Section 21 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas, The Little Match Girl. It was late on a bitterly cold, snowy New Year's Eve. A poor little girl was wandering in the dark, cold streets. She was bareheaded and barefooted. She certainly had had slippers on when she left home, but they were not much good, for they were so huge. They had last been worn by her mother, and they fell off the poor little girl's feet when she was running across the street to avoid two carriages that were rolling rapidly by. One of the shoes could not be found at all and the other was picked up by a boy who ran off with it, saying that it would do for a cradle when he had children of his own. So the poor little girl had to go on with her little bare feet, which were red and blue with the cold. She carried a quantity of matches in her old apron, and held a packet of them in her hand. Nobody had bought any of her during the long day. Nobody had even given her a copper. The poor little creature was hungry and perishing with cold, and she looked the picture of misery. The snowflakes fell upon her long yellow hair, which curled so prettily around her face. But she paid no attention to that. Lights were shining from every window, and there was a most delicious odor of roast goose in the streets, for it was New Year's Eve. She could not forget that. She found a corner where one house projected a little beyond the next one, and here she crouched, drawing up her feet under her. But she was colder than ever. She did not dare go home, for she had not sold any matches, and had not earned a single penny. Her father would beat her. Besides, it was almost as cold at home as it was here. They only had the roof over them, and the wind whistled through it, although they stuffed up the biggest cracks with rags and straw. Her little hands were almost dead with cold. Oh, one little match would do some good. Dared she pull one out of the bundle and strike it on the wall to warm her fingers. She pulled one out. Rish! How it sputtered. How it blazed. It burnt with a bright, clear flame, just like a little candle when she held her hand around it. It was a very curious candle, too. The little girl fancied that she was sitting in front of a big brass stove with polished brass feet and handles. There was a splendid fire blazing in it and warming her so beautifully. But what happened? Just as she was stretching out her feet to warm them, the blaze went out, the stove vanished, and she was left sitting with the end of the burned-out match in her hand. She struck a new one. It burnt, it blazed up, and where the light fell upon the wall, it became transparent like gauze, and she could see right through it into the room. The table was spread with a snowy cloth and pretty china. A roast goose stuffed with apples and prunes was steaming on it, and what was even better, the goose hopped from the dish with the carving knife and fork sticking in its back, and it waddled across the floor. It came right up to the poor child, and then the match went out, and there was nothing to be seen but the thick black wall. Again she lit another. This time she was sitting under a lovely Christmas tree. It was much bigger and more beautifully decorated than the one she had seen when she peeped through the glass doors at the rich merchant's house this very last Christmas. Thousands of lighted candles gleamed upon its branches, such as she had seen in the shop windows looked down to her. The little girl stretched out both her hands towards them, then out went the match. All the Christmas candles rose higher and higher, till she saw that they were only the twinkling stars. One of them fell and made a bright streak of light across the sky. Someone is dying, thought the little girl, for her old grandmother. The only person who had ever been kind to her used to say, When a star falls, a soul is going up to God. 
Now she struck another match against the wall, and this time it was her grandmother who appeared in the circle of the flame. She saw her quite clearly and distinctly, looking so gentle and happy. Grandmother, cried the little creature, oh, do take me with you. I know you will vanish when the match goes out. You will vanish like the warm stove, the delicious goose, and the beautiful Christmas tree. She hastily struck a whole bundle of matches, because she did so long to keep her grandma with her. The light of the matches made it as bright as day. Grandmother had never before looked so big or so beautiful. She lifted the little girl up in her arms, and they soared in a halo of light and joy, far, far above the earth, where there was no more cold, no hunger, no pain, for they were with God. In the morning light, the poor little girl sat there, in the corner between the houses, with rosy cheeks and a smile on her face, dead, frozen to death on the last night of the old year. New Year's Day broke on the little body still sitting with the ends of the burnt-out matches in her hands. She must have tried to warm herself, they said. Nobody knew what beautiful visions she had seen, nor in what a halo she had entered with her grandmother upon the glories of the new year. End of section 21. Recording by Cal Taylor. Section 22 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Calvin Kloss Taylor. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Great Klaus and Little Klaus. In a village there once lived two men of the self-same name. They were both called Klaus, but one of them had four horses, and the other had only one. So to distinguish them, people called the owner of the four horses Great Klaus, and he who had only one Little Klaus. Now I should tell you what happened to them, for this is a true story. Throughout the week, Little Klaus was obligated to plow for Great Klaus, and to lend him his one horse. But once a week, on Sunday, Great Klaus lent him all his four horses. Hurrah! How little Klaus would smack his whip over all five, for they were as good as his own on that one day. The sun shone brightly, and the church bells rang merrily, as the people passed by dressed in their best, with their prayer books under their arms. They were going to hear the parson preach. They looked at little Klaus plowing with his five horses, and he was so proud that he smacked his whip and said, Get up, my five horses. You mustn't say that, said Great Klaus, for only one of them is yours. But Little Klaus soon forgot what he ought not to say, and when anyone passed, he would call out, Giddy up, my five horses. I must really beg you not to say that again, said Great Klaus, for if you do, I shall hit your horse on the head so that he will drop down dead on the spot, and there will be an end of him. I promise you I will not say it again, said the other. But as soon as any one came by nodding to him and wishing him good day, he was so pleased and thought how grand it was to have five horses plowing in his field that he cried out again, Giddy up, all my horses. Oh, giddy up your horses for you, said Great Klaus, and seizing the tethering mallet, he struck little Klaus's one horse on the head and it fell down dead. Oh, now I have no horse at all, said Little Klaus, weeping. But after a while he flayed the dead horse and hung up the skin in the wind to dry. Then he put the dried skin in a bag and, hanging it over his shoulder, went off to the next town to sell it. But he had a long way to go and had to pass through a dark and gloomy forest. Presently a storm arose and he lost his way. And before he discovered the right path, the evening was drawing on. And it was still a long way to the town and too far to return home before nightfall. Near the road stood a large farmhouse. The shutters outside the windows were closed, but lights shone through the crevices and at the top. They might let me stay here for the night, thought Little Klaus. So he went up to the door and knocked. The farmer's wife opened the door, but when she heard what he wanted, she told him to go away. Her husband was not at home, and she could not let any strangers in. Then I shall have to lie out here, said Little Klaus to himself as the farmer's wife shut the door in his face. 
Close to the farmhouse stood a large haystack, and between it and the house there was a small shed with a thatched roof. I can he up here, said Little Claus, as he saw the roof. It will make a famous bed, but I hope the stork won't fly down and bite my legs. A live stork was standing up there who had his nest on the roof. So Little Claus climbed on to the roof of the shed, and as he turned about to make himself more comfortable, he discovered that the wooden shutters did not reach to the top of the windows, so that he could see into the room, in which he saw a large table was laid out, with wine, roast meat, and a splendid fish. The farmer's wife and the sexton were sitting at table together. Nobody else was there. She was filling his glass and helping him plentifully to the fish, which appeared to be his favorite dish. If only I could have some too, thought Little Klaus. And then, as he stretched out his neck towards the window, he spied a beautiful large cake. Indeed, they had a glorious feast before them. At that moment, he heard someone riding down the road towards a farm. It was a farmer coming home. He was a good man, but he had one very strange prejudice. He could not bear the sight of a sexton. If he happened to see one, he would get into a terrible rage. In consequence of this dislike, the sexton had gone to visit the farmer's wife during her husband's absence from home, and the good woman had put before him the best of everything she had in a house to eat. When they heard the farmer, they were dreadfully frightened, and the woman made the sexton creep into the large chest which stood in the corner. He went at once, for he was well aware of the poor man's aversion to the sight of a sexton. The woman then quickly hid all the nice things and the wine in the oven, because if her husband had seen it, he would have asked why it was provided. Oh dear, sighed little Klaus on the roof when he saw the food disappearing. Is there anyone up there? asked the farmer, peering up at little Klaus. What are you doing up there? You had better come into the house. Then little Klaus told him how he had lost his way and asked if he might have some shelter for the night. Certainly, said the farmer, but the first thing is to have something to eat. The woman received them both very kindly, laid the table, and gave them a large bowl of porridge. The farmer was hungry and ate it with a good appetite, but little Klaus could not help thinking of the good roast meat, the fish, and the cake, which he knew were hidden in the oven. He had put his sack with the hide in it under the table by his feet, for, as we remember, he was on his way to the town to sell it. He did not fancy the porridge, so he trod on a sack and made the dried hide squeak quite loudly. Hush, said little Klaus to his sack, at the same time treading on it again, so that it squeaked louder than ever. What on earth have you got in your sack? asked the farmer again. Oh, it's a goblin, said little Klaus. He says we needn't eat the porridge, for he has charmed the oven full of roast meat and fish and cake. What do you say? said the farmer, opening the oven door with all speed, and seeing the nice things the woman had hidden but which her husband thought the goblin had produced for their special benefit. The woman dared not say anything, but put the food before them, and then they both made a hearty meal of the fish, the meat, and the cake. Then little Klaus trod on the skin and made it squeak again. What does he say now? asked the farmer. He says, answered little Klaus, that he has also charmed three bottles of wine in the oven for us. So the woman had to bring out the wine, too, and the farmer drank it and became very merry. Wouldn't he like to have a goblin, like the one in little Klaus's sack for himself? Can he charm out the devil? asked the farmer. I shouldn't mind seeing him, now that I am in such a merry mood. Oh, yes, said little Klaus. My goblin can do everything that we ask him. Can't you? he asked, trampling on the sack till it squeaked louder than ever. Do you hear what I say? But the devil is so ugly. You'd better not see him. Oh, I'm not a bit frightened. Whatever does he look like? Well, he will have to show himself in the image of a sexton. Oh, dear, said the farmer. That's bad. I must tell you that I can't bear to see a sexton. However, it doesn't matter. I shall know it's only the devil, and then I shan't mind so much. Now my courage is up, but he mustn't come too close. I'll ask my goblin about it, said little Klaus, treading on the bag and putting his ear close to it. What does he say? He says you can go along and open the chest in the corner, and there you'll see the devil moping in the dark. But hold the lid tight so that he doesn't get out. 
Will you help me to hold it? asked the farmer, going along to the chest where the woman had hidden a real sexton, who was shivering with fright. The farmer lifted up the lid a wee little bit and peeped in. Ha ha! he shrieked and shrank back. Yes, I saw him, and he looked exactly like our sexton. It was a horrible sight. They had to have a drink after this, and there they sat, drinking till far into the night. You must sell me that goblin, said the farmer. You may ask what you like for him. I'll give you a bushel of money for him. No, I, I can't do that, said Little Claus. You must remember how useful my goblin is to me. Oh, but I should so like to have him, said the farmer, and he went on begging for him. Well, said Little Claus at last, as you have been so kind to me, I shall have to give him up. You shall have my goblin for a bushel of money, but I must have it full to the brim. You shall have it, said the farmer. But you must take that chest away with you. I won't have it in the house for another hour. You never know whether he's there or not. So Little Klaus gave his sack with a dried hide in it to the farmer, and received in return a bushel of money for it, and the measure was full to the brim. The farmer also gave him a large wheelbarrow to take the money in the chest away in. Goodbye, said Little Klaus, and off he went with his money, and the big chest with a sexton in it. There was a wide and deep river on the other side of the wood. The stream was so strong that it was almost impossible to swim against it. A large new bridge had been built across it, and when they got into the very middle of it, Little Klaus said quite loud so that Sexton could hear him, What am I supposed to do with this stupid old chest? It might be full of paving stones. It's so heavy. I am quite tired of wheeling it along. I'll just throw it into the river. If it floats down the river to my house, well and good. And if it doesn't, I shan't care. Then he took hold of the chest and raised it up a bit, as if he was about to throw it into the river. No, no, let it be, shouted the sexton. Let me out. Let me get out. Hello, said little Klaus, pretending to be frightened. Why, he's still inside it. Then I must heave it into the river to drown him. Oh, no, oh, no, shouted the sexton. I'll give you a bushel full of money if you'll let me out. Oh, that's another matter, said Little Klaus, opening the chest. The sexton crept out at once and pushed the empty chest into the water and then went home and gave Little Klaus a whole bushel full of money. He had already had one from the farmer, you know, so now his wheelbarrow was quite full of money. I got a pretty fair price for that horse, I must admit, he said to himself when he got home to his own room and then turned the money out of the wheelbarrow into a heap on the floor. What a rage great Klaus will be in when he discovers how rich I have become through my one horse, but I won't tell him straight out about it. So he sent a boy to great Klaus to borrow a bushel measure. What does he want that for, thought great Klaus, and he rubbed some tallow on the bottom so that a little of whatever was to be measured might stick to it. So it did, for when the measure came back, three new silver threepenny bits were sticking to it. What's this? said Great Klaus, and he ran straight along to Little Klaus. Where on earth did you get all that money? Oh, that was for my horse's hide, which I sold last night. That was well paid indeed, said Great Klaus, and he ran home, took an axe, and hit all his four horses on the head. He then flayed them and went off to the town with the hides. Skins! Skins! Who will buy skins? He shouted up and down the streets. All the shoemakers and tanners in the town came running up and asked him how much he wanted for them. A bushel of money for each, said Great Klaus. Are you mad? they all said. Do you imagine we have money by the bushel? Skins! Skins! Who will buy skins? he shouted again. And the shoemakers took up their measures and the tanners their leather aprons and beat great klaus through the town skins skins they mocked him yes we'll give you a raw hide out of the town with him they shouted and great klaus had to hurry off as fast as ever he could go he never had such a beating in his life little klaus shall pay for this he said when he got home i'll kill him for it little klaus's old grandmother had just died in his house she certainly had been very cross and unkind to him but now she was dead he felt quite sorry about it he took the dead woman and put her into his warm bed to see if he could bring her to life again he meant her to stay there all night and he could sit on a chair in the corner he had slept like that before 
As he sat there in the night, the door opened, and in came Great Claus with his axe. He knew where Little Claus's bed stood, and he went straight up to it and hit the dead grandmother a blow to the forehead, thinking that it was Little Claus. Just see if you'll cheat me again after that, he said, and then he went home again. What a bad, wicked man he is, said Little Claus. He was going to kill me there. What a good thing that poor old granny was dead already, or else he would have killed her. He now dressed his old grandmother in her best Sunday clothes, borrowed a horse of his neighbor, harnessed it to a cart, and set his grandmother on the back seat so that she could not fall out when the cart moved. Then he started off through the wood. When the sun rose, he was just outside a big inn, and little Klaus drew up his horse and went in to get something to eat. The landlord was a very, very rich man and a very good man, but he was fiery-tempered, as if he were made of pepper and tobacco. "'Good morning,' said he to little Klaus. "'You've got your best clothes on very early this morning.' "'Yes,' said little Klaus. "'I'm going to town with my old grandmother. "'She's sitting out there in the cart. "'I can't get her to come in. "'Won't you take her out a glass of mead? "'You'll have to shout at her. "'She's very hard of hearing.' "'Yes, she shall have it,' said the innkeeper. "'And he poured out a large glass of mead, "'which he took out to the dead grandmother in the cart. "'Here is a glass of mead your son has sent,' said the innkeeper. But the dead woman sat quite still and never said a word. "'Don't you hear?' shouted the innkeeper as loud as ever he could. "'Here is a glass of mead from your son!' Again he shouted, and then again as loud as ever. But as she did not stir, he got angry and threw the glass of mead in her face, so that the mead ran all over her, and she fell backwards out of the cart, for she was only stuck up and not tied in. Now, shouted little Klaus, as he rushed out of the inn and seized the landlord by the neck, you have killed my grandmother. Just look, there's a great hole in her forehead. Oh, what a misfortune, exclaimed the innkeeper, clasping his hands. That's a consequence of my fiery temper. Good little Klaus, I will give you a bushel of money and bury your grandmother as if she had been my own, if you will only say nothing about it or else they will chop my head off, and that is so nasty. So little Klaus had a whole bushel of money, and the innkeeper buried the old grandmother just as if she was his own. When little Klaus got home again with all his money, he immediately sent over his boy to great Klaus to borrow his measure. What? said great Klaus. Is he not dead? I shall have to go see about it myself. So he took the measure over to see little Klaus himself. I say, wherever did you get all that money? asked he, his eyes round with amazement at what he saw. It was my grandmother you killed instead of me, said little Klaus. I have sold her and got a bushel of money for her. That was good pay indeed, said great Klaus, and he hurried home, took an axe, and killed his old grandmother. He then put her in a cart and drove off to town with her where the apothecary lived and asked if anyone would buy a dead body. "'Who is it, and where did the body come from?' asked the apothecary. "'It's my grandmother, and I have killed her for a bushel of money,' said Great Klaus. "'Heaven preserve us!' said the apothecary. "'You are talking like a madman. Pray don't say such things. You might lose your head.' And he pointed out to him what a horribly wicked thing he had done, and what a bad man he was who deserved punishment. Great Klaus was so frightened that he rushed straight out of the shop, jumped into the cart, whipped up his horse, and galloped home. The apothecary and everyone else thought he was mad, and so they let him drive off. You shall be paid for this, said Great Klaus, when he got out on the high road. You shall pay for this, little Klaus. As soon as he got home, he took the biggest sack he could find, went over to the little Klaus, and said, you have deceived me again. First I killed my horses, and then my old grandmother. It's all your fault, but you shan't have a chance of cheating me again. Then he took little Klaus by the waist and put him into the sack, and put it on his back and shouted to him, I'm going to drown you now. It was a long way to go before he came to the river, and little Klaus was not so light to carry. The road passed close by the church in which the organ was playing, 
and the people were singing beautifully. Great Klaus put down the sack with Little Klaus in it close by the church door and thought he would like to go and hear a psalm before he went any further. Little Klaus could not get out of the bag, and all the people were in the church, so he went in too. Oh dear, oh dear, sighed Little Klaus in the sack. He turned and twisted, but it was impossible to undo the cord. Just then an old cattle drover with white hair and a tall stick in his hand came along. He had a whole drove of cows and bulls before him. They ran against the sack Little Klaus was in and upset it. Oh dear, sighed Little Klaus, I am so young to be going to the kingdom of heaven. And I, said the cattle drover, and so old and can I get there yet. Open the sack, shouted Little Klaus. Get in in place of me and you will get to heaven directly. Well, that will suit me, said the cattle drover, undoing the sack for Little Klaus, who immediately sprang out. You must look after the cattle now, said the old man as he crept into the sack. Little Klaus tied it up and walked off, driving the cattle before him. A little while after Great Klaus came out of the church, he took up the sack again on his back, and certainly thought it had grown lighter, for the old cattle drover was not more than half the weight of Little Klaus. How light he seems to have got! That must be because I have been to church and said my prayers. Then he went to the river, which was both wide and deep, and threw the sack with the old cattle drover in it into the water, shouting as he did so, for he thought it was Little Klaus. Now you won't cheat me again. Then he went homewards, but when he reached the crossroads, he met Little Klaus with his herd of cattle. What's the meaning of this? exclaimed Great Klaus. Didn't I drown you? Yes, said Little Klaus. It's just about half an hour since you threw me into the river. But where did you get all those splendid beasts? asked Great Klaus. They are sea cattle, said Little Klaus. I will tell you the whole story. And indeed, I thank you heartily for drowning me. I'm at the top of the tree now and a very rich man, I can tell you. I was so frightened when I was in the sack. The wind whistled in my ears, and when you threw me over the bridge into the cold water, I immediately sank to the bottom. But I was not hurt, for the grass is beautifully soft down there. The sack was opened at once by a beautiful maiden in snow-white clothes with a green wreath on her wet hair. She took my hand and said, Are you there, little Klaus? Here are some cattle for you, and a mile further up the road you will come upon another herd which I will give you too. Then I saw that the river was a great highway for the sea folk. Down at the bottom of it they walked and drove about from the sea right up to the end of the river. The flowers were lovely and the grass was so fresh. The fishes which swam about glided close to me as just like birds in the air. How nice the people were, and what a lot of cattle strolling about in the ditches. But why did you come straight up here again then? asked Great Klaus. I shouldn't have done that if it was so fine down there. Oh, said Little Klaus, that's just my cunning. You remember I told you that the mermaid said that a mile further up the road, and by the road she means the river, for she can't go anywhere else, I should find another herd of cattle waiting for me. Well, I know how many bends there are in the river, and what a roundabout way it would be. It's ever so much shorter if you can come up on dry land and take the shortcuts. You save a couple of miles by it and get the cattle much sooner. Oh, you are a fortunate man, said Great Klaus. Do you think I should get some sea cattle if I were to drown at the bottom of the river? Oh, I'm sure you would, said Little Klaus. But I can't carry you in a sack to the river. You're too heavy for me. If you like to walk there and then get in the sack, I'll throw you into the river with the greatest pleasure in the world. Thank you, said Great Klaus. But if I don't get any sea cattle when I get down there, see if I don't give you a sound threshing. Oh, don't be so hard on me. They then walked off to the river. As soon as the cattle saw the water, they rushed down to drink, for they were very thirsty. See what a hurry they're in, said Little Klaus. They want to get down to the bottom again. Now help me first, said Great Klaus, or else I'll thrash you. He then crept into the big sack, which had been lying across the back of one of the cows. Put a big stone in it, or I'm afraid I shan't sink, said Great Klaus. Oh, that'll be all right, said Little Klaus. But he put a big stone into the sack and gave it a push. Plump went to sack, and Great Klaus was in the river, where he sank to the bottom at once. 
I'm afraid he won't find any cattle, said Little Klaus as he drove his herd home. End of section 22「ファイリータイルズ・フォン・ハンズ・クリスチャン・アンダーソン」「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America「ファイリータイルズ・フォン・ハンズ・クリスチャン・アンダーソン」Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas Garden of Paradise. There was once a king's son. Nobody had so many or such beautiful books as he had. He could read about everything which had ever happened in this world, and see it all represented in the most beautiful pictures. He could get information about every nation and every country. But as to where the Garden of Paradise was to be found, not a word could he discover, and this was the very thing he thought most about. His grandmother had told him when he was quite a little fellow and was about to begin his school life that every flower in the Garden of Paradise was a delicious cake and that the pistols were full of wine. In one flower history was written, in another geography or tables. You had only to eat the cake and you knew the lesson. The more you ate, the more history, geography, and tables you knew. All this he believed then, but as he grew older and wiser and learnt more, he easily perceived that the delights of the Garden of Paradise must be far beyond all this. Oh, why did Eve take of the Tree of Knowledge? Why did Adam eat the forbidden fruit? If it had only been I, it would not have happened. Never would sin have entered the world. This is what he said then, and he still said it when he was seventeen. His thoughts were full of the Garden of Paradise. He walked into the wood one day. He was alone, for that was his greatest pleasure. Evening came on, the clouds drew up, and it rained as if the whole heaven had become a sluice from which the water poured in sheets. It was as dark as it was otherwise in the deepest well. Now he slipped on the wet grass, and then he fell on the bare stones, which jutted out of the rocky ground. Everything was dripping, and at last the poor prince hadn't got a dry thread on him. He had to climb over huge rocks where the water oozed out of the thick moss. He was almost fainting. Just then he heard a curious murmuring and saw in front of him a big lighted cave. A fire was burning in the middle, big enough to roast a stag, which was in fact being done. A splendid stag with its huge antlers was stuck on a spit, being slowly turned around between the hewn trunks of two fir trees. An oldish woman, tall and strong enough to be a man, dressed up, sat by the fire throwing on logs from time to time. Come in by all means, she said. Sit down by the fire so that your clothes may dry. There is a shocking draught here, said the prince as he sat down on the ground. It will be worse than this when my sons come home, said the woman. You are in the cavern of the winds. My sons are the four winds of the world. Do you understand? Who are your sons? asked the prince. Well, that's not so easy to answer when the question is stupidly put, said the woman. My sons do as they like. They are playing rounders now with the clouds up there in the great hall, and she pointed up into the sky. Oh, indeed, said the prince. You seem to speak very harshly, and you are not so gentle as the woman I generally see about me. Oh, I dare say, they have nothing else to do. I have to be harsh if I am to keep my boys under control. But I can do it, although they are a stiff-necked lot. Do you see those four sacks hanging on the wall? They are just as frightened of them as you used to be of the cane behind the looking glass. I can double the boys up, I can tell you, and then they have to go into the bag. We don't stand upon ceremony, and there they have to stay. They can't get out to play their tricks till it suits me to let them. But here we have one of them. It was the north wind who came in with an icy blast. Great hailstones peppered about the floor and snowflakes drifted in. He was dressed in bearskin trousers and jacket, and he had a sealskin cap drawn over his ears. Long icicles were hanging from his beard, and one hailstone after another dropped down from the collar of his jacket. Don't go straight to the fire, said the prince. You might easily get chillblains. Chillblains, 
said the north wind with a loud laugh chilblains they are my greatest delight what sort of a feeble creature are you how did you get into the cave of the winds he is my guest said the old woman and if you are not pleased with that explanation you may go into the bag now you know my opinion this had its effect and the north wind told them where he came from and where he had been for the last month i came from the arctic seas he said i have been on bering island with the russian walrus hunters i sat at the helm and slept when they sailed from the north cape and when i woke now and then the stormy petrels were flying about my legs they are queer birds they give a brisk flap with their wings and then keep them stretched out and motionless even when they don't have enough speed pray don't be too long-winded said the mother of the winds so at last you got to bering island it's perfectly splendid there you have a floor to dance upon as flat as a pancake half thawed snow with moss there were bones of whales and polar bears lying about they looked like the legs and arms of giants covered with green mold one would think that the sun had never shone on them i gave a little puff to the fog so that one could see the shed it was a house built of wreckage and covered with the skins of whales the flesh side was turned outwards it was all red and green a living polar bear sat on the roof growling i went to the shore and looked at the birds nests looked at the unfledged young ones screaming and gaping then i blew down thousands of their throats and they learnt to shut their mouths lower down the walruses were rolling about like monster maggots with pigs heads and teeth a yard long you're a good storyteller my boy said his mother it makes my mouth water to hear you then there was a hunt the harpoons were plunged into the walruses breasts and the steaming blood spurted out of them like fountains over the ice then i remembered my part of the game i blew up and made my ships the mountain high icebergs nipped the boats whew how they whistled and how they screamed but i whistled louder they were obliged to throw the dead walruses chests and ropes out upon the ice i shook the snowflakes over them and let them drift southwards to taste the salt water they will never come back to bering island then you've been doing evil said the mother of the winds what good i did the others may tell you said he but here we have my brother from the west i like him best of all he smells of the sea and brings a splendid cool breeze with him is that little zephyr asked the prince yes certainly it is zephyr but he is not so little as all that he used to be a pretty boy once but that's gone by he looked like a wild man of the woods but he had a padded hat on so as to not come to any harm he carried a mahogany club cut in the american mahogany forest it could not be anything less than that where did you come from asked his mother from the forest wilderness he said where the thorny creepers make a fence between every tree where the water snake lies in the wet grass and where human beings seem to be superfluous what did you do there i looked at the mighty river saw where it dashed over the rocks in dust and flew with the clouds to carry the rainbow i saw the wild buffalo swimming in the river but the stream carried him away he floated with the wild duck which soared into the sky at the rapids but the buffalo was carried over the water i liked that and blew a storm so that the primeval trees had to sail too and they were whirled along like shavings and have you done nothing else asked the old woman i have been doing somersaults in the savannas patting the wild horse and shaking down coconuts oh yes i have plenty of stories to tell but one need not tell everything you know that very well old woman and then he kissed his mother so heartily that she nearly fell backwards he was indeed a wild boy the south wind appeared now in a turban and a flowing bedouin's cloak it is fearfully cold in here he said throwing wood on the fire it is easy to see that the north wind got here first it is hot enough to roast a polar bear said the north wind you are a polar bear yourself said the south wind do you want to go into the bag asked the old woman sit down on that stone and tell us where you have been in africa mother he answered i've been chasing the line with the hottentots in kafirland what grass there is on those plains as green as an olive the gnu was dancing about and the ostriches ran races with me but i am still the fastest i went to the desert with its yellow sand it looks like the bottom of the sea i met a caravan 
They were killing their last camel to get water to drink, but it wasn't much they got. The sun was blazing above and the sand burning below. There were no limits to the outstretched desert. Then I burrowed into the fine loose sand and whirled it up in great columns. That was a dance. You should have seen how despondently the dromedary stood, and the merchant drew his captain over his head. He threw himself down before me as if I had been Allah, his god. Now they are buried, and there is a pyramid of sand over them all. When I blow it away, sometimes the sun will bleach their bones, and then travelers will see that people have been there before. Otherwise, you would hardly believe it in the desert. Then you have only been doing harm, said the mother. Into the bag you go. And before he knew where he was, she had the south wind by the waist and in the bag. It rolled about on the ground, but she sat upon it, and then it had to be quiet. Your sons are lively fellows, said the prince. Yes, indeed, she said, but I can master them. Here comes the fourth. It was the east wind, and he was dressed like a Chinaman. Oh, have you come from that quarter? said the mother. I thought you had been in the garden of paradise. I am only going there tomorrow, said the east wind. It will be a hundred years tomorrow since I have been there. I have just come from China, where I danced round the porcelain tower till all the bells jingled. The officials were flogged in the streets, the bamboo canes were broken over their shoulders, and they were all people ranging from the first to the ninth rank. They shrieked, Many thanks, father and benefactor. But they didn't mean what they said, and I went on ringing the bells and singing. Sing, sing, so. You're quite uproarious about it, said the old woman. It's a good thing you're going to the Garden of Paradise tomorrow. It always has a good effect on your behavior. Mind you drink deep at the well of wisdom, and bring a little bottle full home for me. That I will, said the east wind. But why have you put my brother from the south into the bag? Out with him. He must tell me about the phoenix. The princess always wants to hear about that bird when I call every hundred years. Open the bag. Then you'll be my sweetest mother, and I'll give you two pockets full of tea as green and fresh as when I picked it. Well, for the sake of the tea, and because you are my darling, I will open the bag. She did open it, and the south wind crept out, but he was quite crestfallen, because the strange prince had seen his disgrace. Here is a palm leaf for the princess, said the south wind. The old phoenix, the only one in the world, gave it to me. He has scratched his whole history on it with his bill, for the hundred years of his life, and she can read it for herself. I saw how the phoenix set fire to his nest himself and sat on it while it burnt, like the widow of a Hindu. Oh, how the dry branches crackled, how it smoked, and what a smell there was. At last it all burst into flame. The old bird was burnt to ashes, but his egg lay glowing in the fire. It broke with a loud bang, and the young one flew out. Now it rules over all the birds, and it is the only phoenix in the world. He bit a hole in the leaf I gave you. That is his greeting to the princess. Let us have something to eat now, said the mother of the winds and they all sat down to eat the roast stag, and the prince sat by the side of the east wind, so they soon became good friends. I say, said the prince, just tell me who is this princess, and where is the garden of paradise? Oh, ho, said the east wind, if that is where you want to go, you must fly with me tomorrow. But I may as well tell you that no human being has been there since Adam and Eve's time. You know all about them, I suppose, from your Bible stories? Of course, said the prince. When they were driven away, the Garden of Eden sank into the ground. But it kept its warm sunshine, its mild air, and all its charms. The Queen of the Fairies lives there, the island of bliss, where death never enters, and where living as a delight is there. Get on my back tomorrow, and I will take you with me. I think I can manage it. But you mustn't talk now. I want to go to sleep. When the prince woke up in the early morning, he was not a little surprised to find that he was already high above the clouds. He was sitting on the back of the east wind, who was holding him carefully. They were so high up that woods and fields, rivers and lakes looked like a large colored map. Good morning, said the east wind. You may as well sleep a little longer, for there is not much to be seen in this flat country below us, unless you want to count the churches. They look like chalk dots on the green board. He called the fields and meadows the green board. It was very rude of me to leave without saying goodbye to your mother and brothers, said the prince. One is excused when one is asleep. 
said the east wind and they flew on faster than ever you could mark their flight by the rustling of the trees as they passed over the woods and whenever they crossed a lake or the sea the waves rose and the great ships dipped low down in the water like floating swans towards evening the large towns were amusing as it grew dark with all their lights twinkling now here now there just as when one burns a piece of paper and sees all the little sparks like children coming home from school the prince clapped his hands but the east wind told him he had better leave off and hold tight or he might fall and find himself hanging on to a church steeple the eagle in the great forest flew swiftly but the east wind flew more swiftly still the cossack on his little horse sped fast over the plains but the prince sped faster still now you can see the himalayas said the east wind they are the highest mountains in asia we shall soon reach the garden of paradise they took a more southerly direction and the air became scented with spices and flowers figs and pomegranates grew wild and the wild vines were covered with blue and green grapes they both descended here and stretched themselves on the soft grass where the flowers nodded to the wind as much as to say welcome back are we in the garden of paradise now asked the prince no certainly not answered the east wind but we shall soon be there do you see that wall of rock and the great cavern where the wild vine hangs like a big curtain we have to go through there wrap yourself up in your cloak the sun is burning here but a step further on it is icy cold the bird which flies past the cavern has one wing out here in the heat of summer and the other is there in the cold of winter so that is the way to the garden of paradise said the prince now they entered the cavern oh how icily cold it was but it did not last long the east wind spread his wings and they shone like the brightest flame but what a cave it was large blocks of stone from which the water dripped hung over them in the most extraordinary shapes at one moment it was so low and narrow that they had to crawl on hands and knees the next it was as wide and lofty as if they were in the open air it looked like a chapel of the dead with mute organs pipes and petrified banners we seem to be journeying along death's road to the garden of paradise said the prince but the east wind never answered a word he only pointed before them where a beautiful blue light was shining the blocks of stone above them grew dimmer and dimmer and at last they became as transparent as a white cloud in the moonshine the air was also deliciously soft as fresh as on the mountain tops and as scented as down among the roses in the valley a river ran there as clear as the air itself and the fish in it were like gold and silver purple eels which gave out blue sparks with every curve gambled about in the water and the broad leaves of the water lilies were tinged with the hues of the rainbow while the flower itself was like a fiery orange flame nourished by the water just as oil keeps a lamp constantly burning a firm bridge of marble as delicately and skillfully carved as if it were lace and glass beads led over the water to the island of bliss where the garden of paradise bloomed the east wind took the prince in his arms and bore him over the flowers and leaves there sang all the beautiful old songs of his childhood but sang them more wonderfully than any human voice could sing them were these palm trees or giant water plants growing here the prince had never seen such rich and mighty trees the most wonderful climbing plants hung in wreaths such as only to be found in gold and colors on the margins of old books of the saints were entwined among their initial letters it was the most extraordinary combination of birds flowers and scrolls close by on the grass stood a flock of peacocks with their brilliant tails outspread yes indeed it seemed so but when the prince touched them he saw that they were not birds but plants they were big dock leaves which shone like peacocks tails lions and tigers sprang like agile cats among the green hedges which were scented with the blossom of the olive and the lion and the tiger were tame the wild dove glistening like a pearl beat the lion's mane with his wings and the antelope otherwise so shy stood by nodding just as if he wanted to join the game the fairy of the garden now advanced to meet them her garments shone like the sun and her face beamed like that of a happy mother rejoicing over her child she was young and very beautiful and was surrounded by a band of lovely girls each with a gleaming star in her hair when the east wind gave her the inscribed leaf from the phoenix 
her eyes sparkled with delight she took the prince's hand and led him into her palace where the walls were the color of the brightest tulips in the sunlight the ceiling was one great shining flower and the longer one gazed into it the deeper the calyx seemed the prince went to the window and looking through one of the panes saw the tree of knowledge with the serpent and adam and eve standing by are they not driven out he asked and the fairy smiled and explained that time had burned a picture into each pane but not of the kind one usually sees they were alive the leaves moved and people came and went like the reflections in a mirror then he looked through another pane and he saw jacob's dream with the ladder going straight up into heaven and angels with great wings were fluttering up and down all that had ever happened in this world lived and moved on these window panes only time could imprint such wonderful pictures the fairy smiled and led him into a large lofty room the walls of which were like transparent paintings of faces one more beautiful than the other these were millions of the blessed who smiled and sang and all their songs melted into one perfect melody the highest ones were so tiny that they seemed smaller than the very smallest rosebud no bigger than a pinpoint in a drawing in the middle of the room stood a large tree with handsome drooping branches the golden apples hung like oranges among its green leaves it was the tree of knowledge of whose fruit adam and eve had eaten from every leaf hung a shining red drop of dew it was as if the tree wept tears of blood now let us get into the boat said the fairy we shall find refreshment on the swelling waters the boat rocks but it does not move from the spot all the countries of the world will pass before our eyes it was a curious sight to see the whole coast move here came lofty snow-clad alps with their clouds and dark fir trees the horn echoed sadly among them and the shepherd yodeled sweetly in the valleys then banyan trees bent their long drooping branches over the boat black swans floated on the water and the strangest animals and flowers appeared on the shore this was new holland the fifth portion of the world which glided past them with a view of its blue mountains they heard the song of priests and saw the dances of the savages to the sound of drums and pipes of bone the pyramids of egypt reaching to the clouds with fallen columns and sphinxes half buried in sand next sailed past them then came the aurora borealis blazing over the peaks of the north they were fireworks which could not be imitated the prince was so happy and he saw a hundred times more than we have described can i stay here always he asked that depends on yourself answered the fairy if you do not like adam allow yourself to be tempted to do what is forbidden you can stay here always i will not touch the apples on the tree of knowledge said the prince there are thousands of other fruits here as beautiful test yourself and if you are not strong enough go back with the east wind who brought you he is going away now and will not come back for a hundred years the time will fly in this place like a hundred hours but that is a long time for temptation and sin every evening when i leave you i must say come with me and i must beckon to you but stay behind do not come with me for with every step you take your longing will grow stronger you will reach the hall where grows the tree of knowledge i sleep beneath its fragrant drooping branches you will bend over me and i must smile but if you press a kiss upon my lips paradise will sink deeper down into the earth and it will be lost to you the sharp winds of the wilderness will whistle round you the cold rain will drop from your hair sorrow and labor will be your lot i will remain here said the prince and the east wind kissed him on the mouth and said be strong then we shall meet again in a hundred years farewell farewell and the east wind spread his great wings they shone like poppies at the harvest time or the northern lights in a cold winter good-bye good-bye whispered the flowers storks and pelicans flew in a line like waving ribbons conducting him to the boundaries of the garden now we begin our dancing said the fairy at the end when i dance with you as the sun goes down you will see me beckon to you and cry come with me but do not come i have to repeat it every night for a hundred years every time you resist you will grow stronger and at last you will not even think of following to-night is the first time remember my warning 
and the fairy led him into a large hall of white transparent lilies. The yellow stamens in each formed a little golden harp, which echoed the sound of strings and flutes. Lovely girls, slender and lissom, dressed in floating gauze which revealed their exquisite limbs, glided in dance and sang of the joy of living, that they would never die, and that the garden of paradise would bloom forever. The sun went down, and the sky was bathed in golden light, which gave the lilies the effect of roses. And the prince drank of the foaming wine handed to him by the maidens. He felt such joy as he had never known before. He saw the background of the hall opening where the tree of knowledge stood in a radiancy which blinded him. The song proceeding from it was soft and lovely, like his mother's voice. And she seemed to say, My child, my beloved child. Then the fairy beckoned to him and said so tenderly, Come with me, that he rushed towards her, forgetting his promise, forgetting everything on the first evening that she smiled and beckoned to him. The fragrance in the scented air grew stronger. The harp sounded sweeter than ever, and it seemed as if the millions of smiling heads in the hall where the tree grew nodded and sang, One must know everything. Man is lord of the earth. They were no longer tears of blood which fell from the tree. It seemed to him that they were red shining stars. Come with me, come with me, spoke those trembling tones, and at every step the prince's cheeks burnt hotter and hotter, and his blood coursed more rapidly. I must go, he said. It is no sin. I must see her asleep. Nothing will be lost if I do not kiss her, and that I will not do. My will is strong. The fairy dropped her shimmering garment, drew back the branches, and a moment after was hidden within their depths. I have not sinned yet, said the prince nor will i then he drew back the branches there she lay asleep already beautiful as only the fairy of the garden of paradise can be she smiled in her dreams he bent over her and saw the tears welling up under her eyelashes do you weep for me he whispered weep not beautiful maiden i only now understand the full bliss of paradise it surges through my blood and through my thoughts I feel the strength of the angels and of everlasting life in my mortal limbs. If it were to be everlasting night to me, a moment like this were worth it. And he kissed away the tears from her eyes. His mouth touched hers. Then came a sound like thunder, louder and more awful than any he had ever heard before. And everything around collapsed. The beautiful fairy, the flowery paradise, sank deeper and deeper. The prince saw it sink into the darkness of night, it shone far off like a tiny twinkling star. The chill of death crept over his limbs. He closed his eyes and lay long as if dead. The cold rain fell on his face and the sharp wind blew around his head. And at last his memory came back. What have I done? He sighed. I have sinned like Adam, sinned so heavily that paradise has sunk low beneath the earth. And he opened his eyes. He could still see the star, the faraway star, which twinkled like paradise. It was the morning star in the sky. He got up and found himself in the wood near the cave of the winds, and the mother of the winds sat by his side. She looked angry and raised her hand. So soon as the first evening, she said, I thought as much. If you were my boy, you should go into the bag. Ah, he shall soon go there, said Death. He was a strong old man, with a scythe in his hand, and great black wings. He shall be laid in a coffin, but not now. I only mark him and then leave him for a time to wander about on the earth to expiate his sin and to grow better. I will come some time soon, when he least expects me. I shall come back, lay him in a black coffin, put it on my head, and fly to the skies. The garden of paradise blooms there, too and if he is good and holy he shall enter into it but if his thoughts are wicked and his heart still full of sin he will sink deeper in his coffin than paradise sank and i shall only go once in every thousand years to see if he is to sink deeper or to rise to the stars the twinkling stars up there end of section number twenty three Section 24 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas Little Took Now there was Little Took. As a matter of fact, his name was not Took at all, but before he could speak properly, he called himself Took. He meant it for Carl, so it was just as well we should know that. He had to look after his sister Gustave, who was much smaller than he was, and then he had lessons to do, but these two things were rather difficult to manage at the same time. The poor boy sat with his little sister on his lap and sang all the songs he knew, at the same time glancing at his geography book, which was open in front of him. Before the next morning he had to know all the towns in the island of Zealand by heart, and everything there was to know about them. At last his mother came home, for she had been out, and then she took little Gustave, took round to the window and read as hard as ever he could, for it was getting dark, and mother could not afford to buy candles. There's the old washerwoman from the lane, said his mother, as she looked out of the window. She can hardly carry herself, and yet she has to carry the pail from the pump. Run down, little Took, and be a dear boy. Help the old woman. Took jumped up at once and ran to help her. But when he got home again, it was quite dark, and it was useless to talk about candles. He had to go to bed. He had an old turn-up bed, and he lay in it thinking about his geography lesson, the island of Zealand, and all that the teacher had told him. He ought to have been learning the lesson, but of course he could not do that now. He put the geography book under his pillow, because he had heard that this would help him considerably to remember his lesson, but that can't be depended upon. He lay there thinking and thinking, and then all at once it seemed just as if someone kissed him on his eyes and his mouth, and he fell asleep. Yet he was not quite asleep either. It seemed to him as if the old washerwoman was looking at him with her kind eyes and saying, It would be a great shame if you were not to know your lessons. You helped me, and now I will help you, and our Lord will always help you. And all at once the book under his head went, Cribble, crabble. Cluck, 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 and there stood a hen from the town of Kyog. I am a Kyog hen. And then it told him how many inhabitants there were, and about the battle which had taken place there which, after all, was not a very important one. Cribble, crabble, bang! Something plumped down. It was a wooden bird which now made its appearance, the popinjay from the shooting association in Presto. It told him that there were just as many inhabitants as it had nails in its body, and it was very proud of this. Torvaldson used to live close by my corner. The situation is beautiful. The little Took no longer lay in bed. He was on horseback. Gallop a gallop, he went. He was sitting in front of a splendidly dressed knight with a shining helmet and a waving plumage. They rode through the woods to the old town of Warningborg, and this was a big populous town. The castle towered over the royal city, and the light shone through the window. There was dancing and singing within and King Waldemar led out the stately young court ladies to the dance. Morning came, and as the sun rose, the town sank away, and the king's palace one tower after the other. At last only one tower remained on the hill where the castle had stood, and the town had become tiny and very poor. The schoolboys came along with their books under their arms, and they said, Two thousand inhabitants! But that was not true. There were not so many. Little Took was still lying in his bed. First he thought he was dreaming, and then he thought he was not dreaming. But there was somebody close to him, a sailor, a tiny little fellow, who might have been a cadet, but he was not a cadet, was saying to him, Little Took, Little Took, I am to greet you warmly from Corsa, which is a rising town. It is a flourishing town which has steamers and coaches. At one time it used to be called a tiresome town. But that was an old-fashioned opinion. I lie close to the sea, says Corsa. I have good high roads and pleasure gardens. I have given birth to a poet who is amusing, and that is more than they all are. I wanted to send a ship round the world. I did not do it, but I might have done it. 
then there is the most delicious scent about me, because there are beautiful rose gardens close by the gates. Little Took saw them, the green and red flowering branches passed before his eyes, and then they vanished and changed into wooded heights, sloping to the clear waters of the field. A stately old church towered over the field with its twin spires. Springs of water flowed from the cliff and rushed down in rapid bubbling streams. Close by them sat an old king with a golden crown round his flowing locks. This was King Roar of the Springs and Wuskiel. Roar Springs is now the name of the town. Down over the slopes and past the springs walked hand in hand all Denmark's kings and queens wearing their crowns. On and on they went into the old church to the pealing music of the organ and the rippling of the springs. Don't forget the estates of the realm, said King Roar. All at once everything vanished. Where were they? Now an old peasant woman stood before Took. She was a weeding woman and came from Saw, where the grass grows on the marketplace. She had put her grey linen apron over her head and shoulders. It was soaking wet. There must have been rain. Yes, indeed, it has been raining, she said. She knew some of the comic parts of Holberg's plays, and she knew all about Valdemar and Absalom. Just as she was going to tell him these stories, she shrank up and wagged her head. It looked as if she was about to take a leap. Coax, she said. It is wet, it is wet, it is dull as ditch water in good old saw. She had become a frog. Coax. And then once more she was the old woman. One must dress according to the weather, said she. It is wet, it is wet. My town is like a bottle. You get in by the neck, and you have to come out the same way again. I used to have beautiful fish there once. Now I have rosy-cheeked boys down at the bottom of the bottle. They get a great deal of wisdom there. Greek, Greek, Hebrew, coax. It was just like the croaking of frogs or the creaking of fishing boots when you walk in a swamp. It was always the same sound. So tiresome, so tiresome that little Took fell into a deep sleep which was the best thing for him. But even in this sound sleep he had a dream, or something of the sort. His little sister, Gustava, with the blue eyes and golden curly hair, had all at once become a lovely grown-up girl, and without having wings she could fly. They flew together right across Zealand over the green woods and deep blue waters. Do you hear the cock crowing, little Took? Cock-a-doodle-doo! Hens come flying from Kew Town. You shall have such a big, big chicken yard. You will be a rich and happy man. Your house shall hold up its head like King Valdemar's towers, and it shall be richly built up with marble statues like those in Prastu. You understand me? I suppose your name will spread round the world with praise like the ship which was to have sailed from Corsa. It will be known in Roskiel Town. Remember the estates of the realm, said King Roar. You shall speak well and wisely in Parliament, little Took, and when you are in your grave you shall sleep as quietly as... As if I were in sorrow, said little Took, and then he woke up. It was bright daylight, and he remembered nothing about his dream, but that was as it should be. One must not look into the future. He sprang out of bed and read his book till he knew his lesson, which he did almost at once. The old washerwoman put her head in at the door, nodded to him and said, Many thanks for your help yesterday, you dear child. May the Lord fulfil the dream of your heart. Little Took did not know a bit what he had dreamt. One above knew all about it. End of section 24 Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas Recording by Pat Mathewson of England Section 25 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Snow Queen, Part 1. A Tale in Seven Stories. First Story. Deals with a Mirror and Its Fragments. Now we are about to begin and you must attend, and when we get to the end of the story you will know more than you do now about a very wicked hobgoblin. 
He was one of the worst kind. In fact, he was a real demon. One day, he was in a high state of delight because he had invented a mirror with this particularity, that every good and pretty thing reflected in it shrank away to almost nothing. On the other hand, every bad and good-for-nothing thing stood out and looked its worst. The most beautiful landscapes reflected in it looked like boiled spinach, and the best people became hideous, or else they were upside down and had no bodies. Their faces were distorted beyond recognition, and if they had even one freckle, it appeared to spread all over the nose and mouth. The demon thought this immensely amusing. If a good thought passed through anyone's mind, it turned into a grin in the mirror, and this caused real delight to the demon. All the scholars of the demon's school, for he kept a school, reported that a miracle had taken place. Now for the first time, it had become possible to see what the world and mankind were really like. They ran about all over with the mirror, till at last there was not a country or a person which had not been seen in this distorting mirror. They even wanted to fly up to heaven with it to mock the angels. But the higher they flew, the more it grinned, so much so that they could hardly hold it, and at last it slipped out of their hands and fell to the earth, shivered into hundreds of millions and billions of bits. Even then, it did more harm than ever. Some of these bits were not as big as a grain of sand, and these flew about all over the world, getting into people's eyes, and once in, they stuck there, and distorted everything they looked at, or made them see everything that was amiss. Each tiniest grain of glass kept the same power as that possessed by the whole mirror. Some people even got a bit of the glass into their hearts, and that was terrible, for the heart became like a lump of ice. Some of the fragments were so big that they were used for window panes, but it was not advisable to look at one's friends through these panes. Other bits were made into spectacles, and it was a bad business when people put on these spectacles, meaning to be just. The bad demon laughed till he split his sides. It tickled him to see the mischief he had done. But some of these fragments were still left floating about the world, and you shall hear what happened to them. Second story about a little boy and a little girl. In a big town crowded with houses and people, where there is no room for gardens, people have to be content with flowers and pots instead. In one of these towns lived two children, who managed to have something bigger than a flower pot for a garden. They were not brother and sister, but they were just as fond of each other as if they had been. Their parents lived opposite each other, in two attic rooms. The roof of one house just touched the roof of the next one, with only a rainwater gutter between them. They each had a little dormer window, and one only had to step over the gutter to get from one house to the other. Each of the parents had a large window box, in which they grew pot herbs and a little rose tree. There was one in each box, and they both grew splendidly. Then it occurred to the parents to put the boxes across the gutter from house to house, and they looked just like two banks of flowers. The pea vines hung down over the edges of the boxes, and the roses threw out long creepers, which twined around the windows. It was almost like a green, triumphal arch. The boxes were high, and the children knew they must not climb upon them, but they were often allowed to have their little stools out under the rose trees, and there they had delightful games. Of course, in the winter, there was an end to these amusements. The windows were often covered with hoarfrost. Then they would warm coppers on the stove and stick them in the frozen panes, where they made lovely peepholes as round as possible. Then a bright eye would peep through these holes, one from each window. The little boy's name was Kay, and the little girl's, Gerda. In the summer, they could reach each other with one bound, but in the winter, they had to go down all the stairs in one house, and up all the stairs in the other and outside there were snowdrifts. Look, the white bees are swarming, said the old grandmother. Have they a queen bee too? asked the little boy, for he knew that there was a queen among the real bees. Yes, indeed they have, said the grandmother. She flies where the swarm is thickest. She is the biggest of them all, and she never remains on the ground. She always flies up again to the sky. Many a winter's night she flies through the streets and peeps in at the windows 
and then the ice freezes on the panes into wonderful patterns like flowers. Oh, yes, we have seen that, said both children, and then they knew it was true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? asked the little girl. Just let her come, said the boy, and I will put her on the stove where she will melt. But the grandmother smoothed his hair and told him more stories. In the evening, when little Kay was at home and half undressed, he crept up onto the chair by the window and peeped out of the little hole. A few snowflakes were falling, and one of these, the biggest, remained on the edge of the window box. It grew bigger and bigger till it became the figure of a woman, dressed in the finest of white gauze, which appeared to be made of millions of starry flakes. She was delicately lovely, but all ice, glittering, dazzling ice. Still she was alive, her eyes shone like two bright stars, but there was no rest or peace in them. She nodded to the window and waved her hand. The little boy was frightened and jumped down off the chair, and then he fancied that a big bird flew past the window. The next day was bright and frosty, and then came the thaw, and after that the spring. The sun shone, green buds began to appear, the swallows built their nests, and people began to open their windows. The little children began to play in their garden on the roof again. The roses were in splendid bloom that summer. The little girl had learned a hymn, and there was something in it about roses, and that made her think of her own. She sang it to the little boy, and then he sang it with her. Where roses deck the flowery vale, their infant Jesus we thee hail. The children took each other by the hands, kissed the roses and rejoiced in God's bright sunshine, and spoke to it as if the child Jesus were there. What lovely summer days they were, and how delightful it was to sit out under the fresh rose trees, which seemed never tired of blooming. Kay and Gerda were looking at a picture book of birds and animals one day. It had just struck five by the church clock, when Kay said, Oh, something has struck my heart, and I have got something in my eye. The little girl put her arms around his neck. He blinked his eye. There was nothing to be seen. I believe it is gone, he said, but it was not gone. It was one of those very grains of glass from the mirror, the magic mirror. You remember that horrid mirror, in which all good and great things reflected in it became small and mean, while the bad things were magnified, and every flaw became very apparent. Poor Kay! A grain of it had gone straight to his heart, and would soon turn into a lump of ice. He did not feel it any more, but it was still there. Why do you cry? he asked. It makes you look ugly. There's nothing the matter with me. How horrid! He suddenly cried. There's a worm in that rose, and that one is quite crooked. After all, they are nasty roses, and so are the boxes they are growing in. He kicked the box and broke off two of the roses. What are you doing, Kay? cried the little girl. When he saw her alarm, he broke off another rose, and then ran it by his own window, and left dear little Gerda alone. When she next got out the picture book, he said it was the only fit for babies in long clothes. When his grandmother told them stories, he always had a butt, and if he could manage it, he liked to get behind her chair, put on her spectacles, and imitate her. He did it very well, and people laughed at him. He was soon able to imitate every one in the street. He could make fun of all their peculiarities and failings. He will turn out a clever fellow, said people, but it was all that bit of glass in his heart, that bit of glass in his eye, and it made him tease little Gerda, who was so devoted to him. He played quite different games now. He seemed to have grown older. One winter's day, when the snow was falling fast, he brought in a big magnifying glass. He held out the tail of his blue coat and let the snowflakes fall upon it. Now look through the glass, Gerda, he said. Every snowflake was magnified and looked like a lovely flower or a sharply pointed star. Do you see how cleverly they are made? said Kay. Much more interesting than looking at real flowers, and there is not a single flaw in them. They are perfect, if only they would not melt. Shortly after, he appeared in his thick gloves with his sledge on his back. He shouted right into Gerda's ear, I have got leave to drive in the big square where the other boys play, and away he went. In the big square, the bolder boys used to tie their little sledges to the farm carts and go a long way in this fashion. They had no end of fun over it. Just in the middle of their games, a big sledge came along. It was painted white, and the occupant wore a white fur coat and cap. 
The sledge drove twice round the square, and Kay quickly tied the sledge on behind. Then off they went, faster and faster, into the next street. The driver turned round and nodded to Kay in the most friendly way, just as if they knew each other. Every time Kay wanted to lose his sledge, the person nodded again, and Kay stayed where he was, and they drove right out through the town gates. Then the snow began to fall so heavily that the little boy could not see a hand before him as they rushed along. He undid the cords and tried to get away from the big sledge, but it was no use. His little sledge stuck fast, and on they rushed, faster than the wind. He shouted aloud, but nobody heard him, and the sledge tore on through the snowdrifts. Every now and then it gave a bound, as if they were jumping over hedges and ditches. He was very frightened, and he wanted to say his prayers, but he could only remember the multiplication tables. The snowflakes grew bigger and bigger, till at last they looked like big white chickens. All at once they sprang on one side, the big sledge stopped, and the person who drove got up, coat and cap smothered in snow. It was a tall and upright lady, all shining white, the Snow Queen herself. We have come along at a good pace, she said, but it's cold enough to kill one. Creep inside my bearskin coat. She took him into the sledge by her, wrapped him in her furs, and he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? she asked, and she kissed him on the forehead. Ugh, it was colder than ice. It went to his very heart, which was already more than half of ice. He felt as if he were dying, but only for a moment, and then it seemed to have done him good. He no longer felt the cold. My sledge! Don't forget my sledge! He only remembered it now. It was tied to one of the white chickens which flew along behind them. The Snow Queen kissed Kay again, and then he forgot all about little Gerda, Grandmother, and all the others at home. Now I mustn't kiss you any more, she said, or I should kiss you to death. Kay looked at her. She was so pretty. A cleverer, more beautiful face could hardly be imagined. She did not seem to be made of ice now, as she was outside the window when she waved her hand to him. In his eyes she was quite perfect, and he was not a bit afraid of her. He told her that he could do mental arithmetic as far as fractions, and that he knew the number of square miles and the number of inhabitants of the country. She always smiled at him, and he then thought that he surely did not know enough, and he looked up into the wide expanse of heaven into which they rose higher and higher as she flew with him on a dark cloud, while the storm surged around them, the wind ringing in their ears like well-known old songs. They flew over woods and lakes, over oceans and islands. The cold wind whistled down below them, the wolves howled, the black crows flew screaming over the sparkling snow, but up above the moon shone bright and clear, and Kay looked at it all the long, long winter nights. In the day, he slept at the Snow Queen's feet. Story 3. The Garden of the Woman Learned in Magic But how was little Gerda getting on all this long time since Kay left her? Where could he be? Nobody knew. Nobody could say anything about him. All that the other boys knew was that they had seen him tie his little sledge to a splendid big one which drove away down the street and out of the town gates. Nobody knew where he was and many tears were shed. Little Gerda cried long and bitterly. At last, people said he was dead. He must have fallen into the river, which ran close by the town. Oh, what long, dark winter nights those were. At last, the spring came in the sunshine. Kate is dead and gone, said little Gerda. I don't believe it, said the sunshine. He is dead and gone, she said to the swallows. We don't believe it, said the swallows. And at last, Little Gerda did not believe it either. I will put on my new red shoes, she said one morning. Those Kay never saw, and then I will go down to the river and ask it about him. It was very early in the morning. She kissed the old grandmother, who was still asleep, put on the red shoes and went quite alone out by the gate to the river. Is it true that you have taken my little playfellow? I will give you my red shoes if you will bring him back to me again. She thought the little ripples nodded in such a curious way. So she took off her red shoes, her most cherished possessions, and threw them into the river. They fell close by the shore, and were carried straight back to her, 
by the little wavelets. It seemed as if the river would not accept her offering, as it had not taken little Kay. She only thought she had not thrown them far enough, so she climbed into a boat which lay among the rushes. Then she went right out to the further end of it and threw the shoes into the water again. But the boat was loose, and her movements started it off, and it floated away from the shore. She felt it moving and tried to get out, but before she reached the other end, the boat was more than a yard from the shore, and was floating away quite quickly. Little Gerda was terribly frightened. She began to cry, but nobody heard her except the sparrows, and they could not carry her ashore. But they flew alongside, twittering as if to cheer her. We are here, we are here. The boat floated rapidly away with the current. Little Gerda sat quite still with only her stockings on. Her little red shoes floated behind, but they could not catch up the boat, which drifted away faster and faster. The banks on both sides were very pretty, with beautiful flowers, fine old trees, and slopes dotted with sheep and cattle, but not a single person. Perhaps the river is taking me to little Kay, thought Gerda, and that cheered her. She sat up and looked at the beautiful green banks for hours. Then they came to a big cherry garden. There was a little house in it with curious blue and red windows. It had a thatched roof, and two wooden soldiers stood outside, who presented arms as she sailed past. Gerda called out to them. She thought they were alive, but of course they did not answer. She was quite close to them, for the current drove the boat close to the bank. Gerda called out again, louder than before, and then an old, old woman came out of the house. She was leaning upon a big, hooked stick and she wore a big sun hat, which was covered with beautiful painted flowers. You poor little child, said the old woman, however were you driven out on this big, strong river into the wide, wide world alone? Then she walked right into the water, and caught hold of the boat with her hooked stick. She drew it ashore, and lifted little Gerda out. Gerda was delighted to be on dry land again, but she was a little bit frightened of the strange old woman. Come, tell me who you are, and how you got here said she. When Gerda had told her the whole story, and asked her if she had seen Kay, the woman said she had not seen him, but that she expected him. Gerda must not be sad. She was to come and taste her cherries and see her flowers, which were more beautiful than any picture book. Each one had a story to tell. Then she took Gerda by the hand. They went into the little house, and the old woman locked the door. The windows were very high up, and they were red blue and yellow. They threw a very curious light into the room. On the table were quantities of the most delicious cherries, of which Gerda had leave to eat as many as ever she liked. While she was eating, the old woman combed her hair with a golden comb, so that her hair curled and shone like gold round the pretty little face, which was as sweet as a rose. I have long wanted a little girl like you, said the old woman, you will see how well we shall get on together. While she combed her hair, Gerda had forgotten all about Kay, for the old woman was learned in the magic art. But she was not a bad witch. She only cast spells over people for a little amusement, and she wanted to keep Gerda. She, therefore, went into the garden and waved her hooked stick over all the rose bushes, and however beautifully they were flowering, all sank down into the rich black earth without leaving a trace behind them. The old woman was afraid that if Gerda saw the roses she would be reminded of Kay, and would want to run away. Then she took Gerda into the flower garden. What a delicious scent there was, and every imaginable flower, for every season was in that lovely garden. No picture book could be brighter or more beautiful. Gerda jumped for joy, and played till the sun went down behind the tall cherry trees. Then she was put into a lovely bed, with rose-colored silken coverings, stuffed with violets, she slept and dreamt as lovely dreams as any queen on her wedding day. The next day she played with the flowers in the garden again, and many days passed in the same way. Gerda knew every flower, but however many there were, she always thought there was one missing, but which it was she did not know. One day she was sitting looking at the old woman's sun hat with its painted flowers, and the very prettiest one of them all was a rose. The old woman had forgotten her hat, when she charmed the others away. This is the consequence of being absent-minded. What? said Gerda. Are there no roses here? 
and she sprang in among the flower beds and sought but in vain her hot tears fell on the very places where the roses used to be when the warm drops moistened the earth the rose trees shot up again just as full of bloom as when they sank gerda embraced the roses and kissed them and then she thought of the lovely roses at home and this brought the thought of little kay oh how i have been delayed said the little girl i ought to have been looking for kay don't you know where he is she asked the roses do you think he is dead and gone he is not dead said the roses for we have been down underground you know and all the dead people are there but kay is not among them oh thank you said little gerda and then she went to the other flowers and looked into their cups and said do you know where kay is but each flower stood in the sun and dreamt its own dreams little gerda heard many of these but never anything about kay and what said the tiger lilies do you hear the drum rub-a-dub it has only two notes rub-a-dub always the same the wailing of women and the cry of the preacher the hindu woman in her long red garment stands on the pile while the flames surround her and her dead husband but the woman is only thinking of the living man in the circle round whose eyes burn with a fiercer fire than that of the flames which consume the body do the flames of the heart die in the fire i understand nothing about that said little gerda that is my story said the tiger lily what does the convolvus say an old castle is perched high over a narrow mountain path it is closely covered with ivy almost hiding the old red walls and creeping up leaf upon leaf right round the balcony where stands a beautiful maiden she bends over the bolstrade and looks eagerly upon the road no rose on its stem is fresher than she no apple blossom wafted by the wind moves more lightly her silken robes rustle softly as she bends over and says will he ever come is it kay you mean asked gerda i am only talking about my own story my dream answered the convolvus what said the little snowdrop between two trees a rope with a board is hanging it is a swing two pretty little girls in snowy frocks and green ribbons fluttering on their hats are seated on it their brother who is bigger than they are stands up behind them he has his arms around the ropes for support and holds in one hand a little bowl and in the other a clay pipe he is blowing soap bubbles as the swing moves the bubbles fly upward and all their changing colors the last one still hangs from the pipe swayed by the wind and the swing goes on a little black dog runs up he is almost as light as the bubbles he stands up on his hind legs and wants to be taken into the swing but it does not stop the little dog falls with an angry bark they jeer at it the bubble bursts a swinging plank a fluttering foam picture that is my story i dare say what you tell me is very pretty but you speak so sadly and you never mention little kay what says the hyacinth they were three beautiful sisters all most delicate and quite transparent one wore a crimson robe the other a blue and the third was pure white these three danced hand in hand by the edge of the lake in the moonlight they were human beings not fairies of the wood the fragrant air attracted them and they vanished into the wood here the fragrance was stronger still three coffins glide out of the wood towards the lake and in them lie the maidens the fireflies flutter lightly around them with the little flickering torches do these dancing maidens sleep or are they dead the scent of the flowers says they are corpses the evening bell tolls their knell you make me quite sad said little gerda your perfume is so strong it makes me think of those dead maidens oh is little kay really dead the roses have been down underground and they say no ding dong told the hyacinth bells we are not tolling for little kay we know nothing about him we sing our song the only one we know and gerda went on to the buttercups shining among their dark green leaves you are a bright little sun said gerda tell me if you know where i shall find my playfellow the buttercup shone brightly and returned gerda's glance what song could the buttercup sing it would not be about kay god's bright sun shone into a little court on the first day of spring 
the sunbeam stole down the neighboring white wall, close to which bloomed the first yellow flower of the season. It shone like burnished gold in the sun. An old woman had brought her armchair out into the sun. Her granddaughter, a poor and pretty little maidservant, had come to pay her a short visit and kissed her. There was gold, heart's gold, in the kiss. Gold on the lips, gold on the ground, and gold above, in the early morning beams. No, that is my little story, said the buttercup. Oh, my poor old grandmother, sighed Gerda. She will be longing to see me, and grieving about me, as she did about Kay. But I shall soon go home again, and take Kay with me. It is useless for me to ask the flowers about him. They only know their own stories, and have no information to give me. Then she tucked up her little dress, so that she might run the faster. But the narcissus blossoms struck her on the legs as she jumped over them. So she stopped and said, Perhaps you can tell me something. She stooped down close to the flower and listened. What did it say? I can see myself, I can see myself, said the narcissus. Oh, how sweet is my scent! Up there in an attic window stands a little dancing girl half-dressed. First she stands on one leg, then on the other, and looks as if she would tread the whole world under her feet. She has only a delusion. She pours some water out of a teapot onto a bit of stuff that she is holding. It is her bodice. Cleanliness is a good thing, she says. Her white dress hangs on a peg. It has been washed in the teapot, too, and dried on the roof. She puts it on and wraps a saffron-colored scarf round her neck, which makes the dress look whiter. See how high she carries her head, and all upon one stem. I see myself, I see myself. I don't care a bit about all that, said Gerda. It is no use telling me such stuff. And then she ran to the end of the garden. The door was fastened, but she pressed the rusty latch, and it gave way. The door sprang open, and little Gerda ran out with bare feet into the wide world. She looked back three times, but nobody came after her. At last she could run no further, and she sat down on a big stone. When she looked round, she saw that the summer was over. It was quite late autumn. She would never have known it inside the beautiful garden, where the sun always shone, and the flowers of every season were always in bloom. Oh, how I have wasted my time, said little Gerda. It is autumn. I must not rest any longer. And she got up to go on. Oh, how weary and sore were her little feet, and everything round looked so cold and dreary. The long willow leaves were quite yellow. The damp mist fell off the trees like rain. One leaf dropped after another from the trees, and only the slow thorn still bore its fruit. But the sloes were sour and set one's teeth on edge. Oh, how gray and sad it looked out in the wide world. End of section 25